What is up guys? I'm gonna make this intro very short and sweet as to not add any more length to this incredibly long video, but I just wanted to tell you what exactly this is in case you have no idea whatsoever. So some of the first Berserk videos I ever made for this channel was called the Berserk Manga Analysis, where when I was reading the story and I was getting very hyper fixated on it and I was super invested, I was buying a new volume every paycheck and I couldn't wait to finish the series. Well, I started basically just trying to break it down and analyze it the best that I could, kind of like cutting it up into segments, kind of making each arc basically like episodes of Black Swordsman, Golden Age, Conviction, all the way to the Hawk of the Millennium Empire or Falcon of the Millennium Empire, however you want to translate it. And that was sort of the first big Berserk series that I did on the channel that started to get my channel a little bit noticed. And I'm very, very appreciative of all of these old videos. Now, the super old videos, I have basically made them members only on the channel. Reason being is I just don't feel like the quality of those videos is a good representation of the channel. And so if you want to see those super old videos, uh, you are more than welcome to. They're for channel members. So whatever you want to, if you want to become a channel member at whatever level, any level, you can see them. Um, but basically, when I first started creating the series, I wasn't trying to make great quality, amazing YouTube videos. I was really just trying to vent my thoughts about Berserk and I didn't have anybody to talk to about it. So I just decided to upload it on my YouTube channel. That's really where it came from. But as it progressed, I feel like I got better and better. I understood the story more. I got better with my editing. And so things kind of progressed over time. So the Hawk of the Millennium Empire arc, that arc of Berserk, is still up for you guys to see with the Berserk manga analysis series. I'm even looking here. The very first video I posted, I don't think you can see it on the screen, but it's July 8th. 2019 is when I started this arc. So, wow, we're getting, uh, we're almost to four years ago, man. That's crazy. Um, wow. Anyways, uh, I, uh, I like these videos and I think that this is the arc where I started to really come into my own as far as the Berserk manga analysis goes. I think I really got into the flow, into the style. I think my scripting got better and slowly, very, very, very slowly, my editing got better as well. And so uh, these are still up. I have this one and the Fantasia arc. I've covered the entire series up until the most recent chapters, and then I switched to just doing chapter reviews after that. Uh, but as you can see, this video here is blocked. Uh, this video here is blocked. I'm up to, I think, four videos that are blocked everywhere, which means you cannot watch them anymore and uh, ineligible for monetization. This one, I got this one unblocked, but it's still ineligible for monetization. So basically what happened is in all of these videos, I made like a 30 to 40 second intro, just kind of showing a lot of different manga panels, kind of getting you ready, kind of like the intro song to an episode of a series, kind of getting you ready for this episode of the analysis series. And uh, Berserk soundtrack is what I used. I used the OST from the 97 soundtrack and it has all been basically copyright flagged at this point. So it didn't have a problem before, but it went up on Spotify and Apple at the end of last year. So now it's slowly doing its checks. And the way this happened before, because this happened with all my golden age videos also, is that it doesn't happen all at once. They'll flag one video one day, two days later, they'll flag another video, another one, and it'll just kind of continuously keep going until every single video is blocked. So I'm at a bit of a crossroads and I decided that this is how I'm going to answer this problem. That instead of re-uploading 21 different videos, because I don't want to clog up your subscription feed with 21 videos that you've seen before of me taking out the intro and just re-uploading them, I feel like that would be a pain in the ass for you. Also, it just, I don't know, that just seems like something I don't want to do. So I decided what I will do is I will compile all of these videos into one massive video uh, and it was all on a playlist before anyway so a lot of people have already watched it in the binge format so a lot of people say that they already like the videos in that binge format so I took out all the intros no berserk music intro instead it's just all in one massive video I don't even know how long this is going to be I'm recording this before I render the video so I don't know how long it's going to be so these are of course videos that you've seen before if you've been a fan of my channel but a lot of you were not subscribed in 2019, so there's a chance that a lot of you have not seen these videos. Um, I will say a disclaimer, these are not up to par and up to the quality of my current videos, if you consider my current videos to have any quality whatsoever. Uh, the editing is bad, the uh, the recording is not done from this mic, it's done from my really, really old webcam, so it sounds horrendous. Uh, however, 
you know what? I still have a lot of value and appreciation for these videos because this is how I discovered the Berserk series. This is how I got into it. This is how I got my thoughts out. This is where it all came from. So uh, I want you guys to enjoy, appreciate it. I just wanted to let you know what these vi what this video is. It's not anything new. It's the videos that have been on my channel for four, three, four years now almost. Um, but it's just compiled into one big video for you guys to enjoy. So uh, that's really it, man. That's my intro, so that already went on too long. So anyways, enjoy the video, guys. Entering into the Hawk of the Millennium Empire arc. Also, I will be doing the same thing for the Fantasia arc, so expect that video probably next week. I'll probably release these videos a week apart. So I'm going to give you all of the Millennium Empire videos and all of the Fantasia videos in one big video. And like I said, if you do want to see those older, older, older videos, which are not good, <laughs> not good at all, but they're there if you want to become a channel member. So, all right, guys. Thanks uh, thanks a lot, and uh, enjoy, man. Enjoy. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of my Berserk Manga Analysis, where I go through the story of Berserk bit by bit and praise and criticize and theorize everything and anything. If you've watched my previous videos, then thank you very much. And if you haven't and like this one, feel free to go back and check them out. Well, we've come a long way so far, and we're just about halfway through of what's been released so far of which author Kentaro Miura has said is maybe about 70% complete. So there's a ways to go. And Berserk is about to go in a lot of wild different directions that you may have never expected it to go. In some ways, this could make Berserk even better than it has been before. In other ways, this might be too drastic a shift and may make it fall away from the reasons why you liked it to begin with. Heading into this next arc, Guts will have an entirely new objective and journey to go on. A bigger cast will be cemented as main characters, both heroes and villains. A war will begin between nations. And there's the introduction of magic. Not that magical things haven't happened thus far, but it's taken into a new enhanced level that will be impossible to ignore and will require a ton of exposition. But all that being said, the core of the story will be, as it's always been, the relationship between Guts, Casca, and Griffith, and the internal and external struggles Guts must face on a daily and nightly basis. But before we get into it all, we need to discuss the title of this arc real quick. Not only is this the longest arc in the entire manga, stretching about 13 volumes, but it also has the longest title of any arc. The actual title is The Falcon of the Millennium Empire Arc, but I will be referring to it and titling my videos, as you've seen, The Hawk of the Millennium Empire Arc. Here's the thing. I discussed this in one of my Golden Age Arc videos when the Band of the Hawk was first introduced, but in case you don't know, the word hawk is kind of sort of a mistranslation. In Japanese, they use the word taka as the name of Griffith's mercenary band. And it's the general word that could certainly mean hawk, but is more accurately meant to mean falcon. See, the word itself can be taken either way, and there's no real distinction between the animals. And they do appear very similar. Here's some cute pics to show you what I mean. And the representation they're meant to imply is a common bird rising up to greatness. There's really nothing symbolic about a falcon that couldn't also be represented by a hawk. It is only now that we get into a Millennium Empire, which will lead to something called Falconia. Falconia, Falcon, yeah, you get it. Also, Millennium Empire combined with Falcon is often seen as a reference to the Millennium Falcon from Star Wars, of which Miura was a fan of. So that's a little fun reference that works in a couple multiple ways, I guess. However, accuracy be damned. Band of the Falcon doesn't roll off the tongue nearly as well as Band of the Hawk. The Berserk manga has always been translated in English as Hawk. It was used in both the dub of the 1997 anime series and the 2012 movies as Hawk. The PS2 video game is translated as Berserk and the Band of the Hawk. 
I've been using Hawk since I began these videos. It's engraved into my head as Hawk, and since there's no actual significance between a Hawk and a Falcon when it comes to the symbology of what it represents, other than a few puns like Millennium Falcon and Falconia, I see no point in suddenly switching now and saying Falcon. So I hope that explains it. And any uber weebs out there that want to correct me, feel free to do so. But I declare these videos in the name of the Band of the Hawk, and I will not sacrifice it. Unless, you know, I've been tortured for a year and have no dick, of course. We start this arc with a group of children running through a forest. One of them cites that he had just seen a fairy. Something like that shouldn't be common in the world of man. And by fairy, does he actually mean an elf? as most readers would mistake Puck for a traditional look of what we think a fairy to be, but Miura has always played with the designs of his mythological creatures. We don't know what the child actually saw, but the boys talk about how this forest, that they've been in many, many times, has suddenly begun to look a little different. And before being able to dwell on it, a gush of wind passes by them, and overhead, Nosferatu Zod flies by, assumingly still carrying the newly resurrected Griffith in his palm. The children gasp at seeing the demon, and the narration implies that this is only the beginning, since the incarnation ceremony at the Tower of Conviction, which no longer stands, the world we know is undergoing a change. Worlds are overlapping, and creatures and objects from another place called the Astral World are beginning to seep into ours. And I love this little prelude because it will all tie into a huge moment at the climax of this arc. Now we cut back to nearby Godot's cabin the loyal old blacksmith who had forged the dragon slayer that Guts currently wields. And I said Goto wouldn't be back, and that's because he passed away off-screen. I say off-screen even though it's a manga, but that's how it feels. It works as we just see his grave and Erica standing somberly by in front of it. We saw him sick before. His last act as a blacksmith was rebrandishing Guts' sword back to full strength and giving Guts his warning about abandoning what's precious and the dangers of falling into the solitude of rage. But I always liked his character, and I wish we got to spend a little more time with him. But that's what makes the impact of his death strong. We always wish we got a little bit more time, and in Berserk, death is final. Guts shows up behind her, bringing Casca back, who is very happy to see Erica, and vice versa. There's a little line Erica says to Guts about Godo not wanting Guts to see his face after he passed. It's a little line, but I like how it conveys how Goto understands how deeply Guts takes the deaths of the people he cares about. After that, Erica asks if Guts is going to stay with them now. The three of them and Ricker, all as a family. After that, there's a quick flash of Guts thinking about Griffith, and then just a single image of Guts' eye, and again, I don't know how Miura puts so much detail and emotion into just a character's eyes. Or in Guts' case, just one eye. Guts seriously thinks about this. He reflects on the last two years of his life, a life he spent separated, isolated, and depending only on rumors of his and his brand to lead him from demon to demon. Fighting those demons, and most likely he would be dead without Puck's healing abilities, and all for just a chance, a single sliver of a chance that he could find Griffith and kill him, with no guarantee that he's ever actually going to find him. Well, except that one time. But that's never really brought up again. Did you forget it, Miura? Come on. But now Guts definitively knows that Griffith is here on Earth, somewhere out there on our plane of existence where he could conceivably find him and try to kill him. But it would require leaving again. Everything he went through to try it again. But here, here's Casca. She's not the Casca he knew and fell in love with. But she's here, and she's safe, and with him around she can always be protected. Ricker and Erica are good, loyal companions as well. There's a chance to make a life, but it would mean giving up revenge. And as I said, this isn't the same Casca. She's lost her mind, and every time Guts looks at her, it's a constant reminder of the life that's been taken away from him and the literal lives of his comrades. But then Erica lets out an atom bomb of information. Someone else showed up at the Band of the Hawk gravesite to see Ricker. Someone with long silver hair. And it's not a fake out. Up on the hilltop, Ricker excitingly speaks with Griffith restating that he had no idea what happened the night of the eclipse other than nobody came back except for Guts and Casca, showing us that though Ricker is aware of their deaths, Guts never told him the whole story, never told Rickard of the Baelid and Griffith's sacrifice, his transformation into Femto, or the rape of Casca. You could say Guts hid this information for a few reasons. One would be not wanting to have to relive it through telling Rickard about it, 
Another could be he just didn't want to traumatize Ricker as he had been. And yet another was he knew how Rickard idolized Griffith. And Guts didn't want to destroy Rickard's hero. Guts arrives on the scene, seeing the two of them and Griffith standing with this expression on his face so simple, yet could be conveying a million different things. Guts flies into a rage upon seeing him, running forward to strike him down. Rickert, not understanding the situation, tries to hold Guts back, not knowing why he'd want to attack Griffith. Griffith finally speaks for the first time since the I Sacrifice line at the Eclipse. First insulting Guts, saying that he's the same way he was as they first met, and then insulting the Band of the Hawk by saying, at their graves it's like them reuniting. Now I say insulting, but that's from Guts's point of view. From Griffith's, both are meant to be endearing. See, here's the thing I've gathered about Griffith's personality. Griffith is such an arrogant narcissist that by saying the Band of the Hawk has reunited, he's saying it as if that's what the band would have always wanted. For him to come back and continue their ambition and get the kingdom he always wanted. He views the Band of the Hawk's dreams as his dream. He didn't know them like Guts did. He was always at a bit of a distance to maintain the illusion of his larger-than-life persona. Guts made friends with basically all the members, so Guts knows that each of those men had their own dreams and ambitions and were inspired by Griffith. They did fight and were willing to die for him, but his goal also served their own. Griffith doesn't see it that way. All he sees is the collective whole only wanting one thing, what he wants. Griffith had stated before that if he can do anything to honor those that died for him, it is to continue and keep winning. But who among the characters we knew in the Band of the Hawk would want him to win at this extent? Griffith states to Guts that he came to see him, to see if anything would shake this feeling. The one of him needing to fulfill his dream at any cost. He looks at Guts, saying that he feels free now. Remember that Guts was the only person to ever be put in front of Griffith's dream. Guts was the only one Griffith had bonded with to that extent. The only one he'd risk his life to save. The only one that caused him to panic and break down and make moves out of desperation rather than strategy. Griffith fell in love with Guts, whether you want to think that's romantically, platonically, like a sibling or like a child. Guts was put on a pedestal, and Griffith himself probably wouldn't even be able to tell you why. But he's here to see if that's still the case. And to Griffith's joy, it is not. But here's the question. How much of this Griffith is the Griffith we knew? Stick with me here. There's an argument to be made that you can't even say this is Griffith anymore. This is Femto, the fifth God Hand member wearing the appearance of his former self. I mean, come on, Griffith did not have these pretty long curly locks before. Remember? This is not what Griffith really looks like. Griffith is Femto now. What we see here on the Hill of Swords is like a mask. Just as the other apostles have their humanoid looking form and then transform into their true selves. So by being a god hand now, how much of the original Griffith still exists? The human Griffith, after he sacrificed his humanity for greater power. Well, to me, I kind of think about it like I think about vampires from the Buffy the Vampire Slayer series. Just stick with me here, and I'm sorry for this tangent, but just stay with me. See, I'm a huge Buffy fan, and in the Buffy universe, a person becomes a vampire, they lose their quote-unquote soul, but still remain aspects and the personality traits of who they were as humans. That basically means their humanity is gone. Their empathy, their feelings for remorse and sympathy, their capacity to love is diminished. Uh, attachment to personal things and people all but disappears. In some cases, these aspects can be a little stronger depending on who they were as a human. For example, Spike as a human was a very emotional and wimpy guy writing poetry and striking out with women. As a vampire, he was still evil, but still had the aspect of romanticism that he was able to be in a relationship with another vampire and even feel jealousy for losing her. Angel, on the other hand, was a reckless, unappreciative drunk before turning into a vampire, and thus when he did, it only amplified his negative tendencies and he had no regard or loyalty for anything. So what does that have to do with Berserk? Maybe nothing, but I get a similar vibe when it comes to Apostles. Rosine became evil and lost her man humanity, akin to your soul in the Buffy universe, but her bond with Jill was so strong beforehand that even as an apostle, she still wanted Jill to be around. It just became twisted as she wanted to turn Jill into one of her pseudo-apostle elves. So when it comes to the God Hand members, I think it's still similar, but even more amplified. 
Even more of your humanity is gone than a regular apostle. My theory anyway, none of this is canon. So Femto still has feelings for Guts. Otherwise, he never would have raped Casca. That was done from his point of view as a way to spite Guts for being the person he put first and causing his dream to fall. But now Femto has gotten his revenge. He did the worst thing imaginable to Guts, made him suffer, and now it's over. He has no reason to kill Guts. He's an all-powerful god and has bigger and better things to do. Guts to him now is like what he said in the forgotten Black Swordsman arc encounter, nothing but a squirming sacrificial offering. Griffith's humanity is gone. His, quote, soul is gone, if you will. He is what Angel would be in the Buffy series. His negative, narcissistic, power-hungry, holier-than-thou traits are amplified, and his ability to feel that human connection he once could is dimi diminished to practically nothing. This is Femto, a being with the darkest aspects of Griffith's personality amplified, and unlike Griffith almost did, Femto will not betray his dream. As Guts tries to swing his sword into Femto's stupid face, Zod appears, blocking it. And right as it starts, it already goes considerably better than the last time they'd fought. These years fighting Apostles has only increased Guts' skill, and he's able to stay toe-to-toe -to -toe with Zod in his human form. I also like this little touch of Rickert not knowing who Zod is. He's seen Zod before, but only in his Apostle form. It's only when Zod transforms, Rickert begins to grasp a hint of what Griffith is currently like. Guts only briefly stops the fight to tell Zod to move, and he doesn't care about fighting him and only wants to fight Griffith. But Zod states that words lack elegance and for Guts to force his way through him. Which I love, because Zod is a character who only respects strength and skill. Words mean literally nothing to him. You want Griffith? Come get him, but I'm going to try to stop you. That's all there is to it. They brutally attack each other, and Guts comments that every sword strike from Zod feels like it's shaking his whole body. Guts is fighting with everything he has for only one purpose. Zod tries to use one of the Grave Marker swords to sideswipe Guts, but Guts manages to get Zod first, kicking a sword into them. As they battle, Griffith thinks to himself, in a rare moment that we get inner dialogue from him, that he has a faint throbbing in his heart. Feelings for Guts as he's fighting, but not from him from the demon child. The child whose body he used to create this facade of his former human body. The child who should have been killed in this transference. But a piece of that child may still remain alive and intact and feeding its thoughts and feelings through Griffith's body. This will get a lot deeper and more in depth soon, but for now I'll leave it at that. And my first thoughts while reading this were they were Griffith's true feelings, but he was blaming it on the child, not wanting to admit his deep hidden feelings for, to himself. But if anyone else thinks this for some reason, nah, trust me, it's the kid. Zod commends Guts on matching him stride for stride in his human form, but now it's time to go full demon in this absolutely gorgeous two-page spread. You can just feel the energy and intensity of Zod's transformation and Guts holding strong. Now the fight gets a lot heavier, and Guts doesn't do quite as well. Zod barrels towards him and crashes into the cave where Guts and Casca had stayed inside of. Speaking of Casca, she comes running to them, Puck and Erica behind her. Her brand bleeds, and yet she's instinctively drawn to Griffith, unconsciously sensing her child as a part of him. Zod bursts out through the cave, causing the rocks and debris to fall everywhere, including right towards Casca. Guts can't get to her in time to save her, but Griffith does. Just seeing Casca in Griffith's arm again fuels Guts with burning fucking fire. But then Griffith lets her go and tells Zod it's time to leave. And again, this is left very ambiguous. But one could say Griffith saved Casca due to the demon child now being part of him. That the child's desire to protect its mother was so strong it overtook Griffith in this moment, and he saved her. But what a horrible weakness that would be for the newly incarnated God Hand. Could that be why Griffith immediately decides to leave after this incident? Is Griffith afraid that desire of the child would overtake him completely if he did stay? How ironic it would be that Guts was the one to sway him from his dream in the first place, and now it's Casca. But this is in no way implies that the child has any semblance of control of the mind and body. Griffith still calls the shots, and is still in 99% of control. But maybe you could also make an argument 
that Griffith himself didn't see any reason for Casca to die like that. She was a loyal member of his Band of the Hawk, and he has already achieved his god status and got his vengeance upon raping her. So, just like with Guts, there's no point to kill her. Sure, he could, easily, but he's ascended. He doesn't view them as a threat. He was only here to see how he'd feel seeing Guts, and to let Zod have a little fun. So Griffith hops back up on Zod's hand and tells Guts once again he will get his own kingdom, just as he had all those years ago. He also tells Rickert before he leaves, directly, that if Rickert learns the truth and still wants to be a part of his dream, Griffith will accept him back into the fold. On that note, Zod flies off. Guts tries to strike him with some crossbow bolts, but it's futile. Overall, this interaction between them I find to be incredible, intense, and all around an amazing prelude for this arc. But what makes me really sad is this is basically the last time Guts and Griffith interact, thus far in the story. Sorry if that's a little bit of a spoiler, but yeah. See, much of this arc is the Guts storyline and the Griffith storyline. And at times they overlap, but it's mostly separated. So as Rickert now demands to know the true story, Guts does tell him. For the first time, Guts talks about what happened with Ricker, Erica, and even Puck now hearing it for the first time. Upon this, and realizing Godu's cave is completely destroyed, Rickert wants to go with Guts to get revenge. Though I really wish he did, Guts, I guess, does the responsible thing and tells Rickert not to go with him. He doesn't believe Rickert could ever truly hate Griffith the way he does, also knowing Erica will need someone to watch over her. She runs off in tears upon hearing everything, and Rickert and Guts exchange looks knowing that he should go after her. And so Rickert will stay behind yet again. He will return to the story, but not for a long time. Way too long, if you ask me. But let's leave with remembering how he was the one to put the grave markers up. The Band of the Hawk meant everything to him, and he was its youngest member, and looked up to them all. And now, knowing the truth, Rickert will grow to be a changed man. Guts and Puck then discuss their next move as going after Griffith while having to look after Casca would be an impossible task. Also, with Guts and Casca both being branded, they can't stay in one place too long without hundreds of demonic spirits coming after them, as we saw at the Tower of Conviction. But then Puck gets an idea. To take Casca to his home. Supposedly, a beautiful paradise, hidden from the rest of the world. And so, a new quest begins, and we finish our setup for this arc. And so Guts says goodbye to Ricker and Erica, and as it starts to snow once more, Guts wraps his cloak around Casca, and he, her, and Puck begin to head off into the distance, Guts vowing that no matter what, that during this journey, he will not lose Casca. So after our last very intimate scene with Guts and Griffith, we gotta cut back now to see what's happening with the rest of the world. And as hinted at in little sprinkles throughout the Conviction arc, the Kushan Empire is embarking on a takeover of Midland now that the king is dead. And what a takeover it is. We see the gates being stormed and absolutely demolished. Men being beheaded in the streets, shot down with arrows, and women being forced to walk, roped and topless, walking back with them, assumingly, to be used for expanding the Kushan race bloodline, or as rumor has it, sacrifice to their god. One girl roped up with the rest seems to be much younger, probably around 13, and it's mentioned that she watched her parents burn to death. Whether that was by the Kushan invasion or a possible heretic burning, we're not sure. But this young girl proclaims with no discernible evidence that the Hawk of Light is coming to save them all. We're shown a Kushan leader who seems to have some importance leading this specific attack and wearing a bunch of fur all around him to look all fancy. Doing as most leaders do as well, sitting on his ass while his men do all the work. But who he's speaking to is Salat and his buff Bakiraka bodybuilder friends. And he's berating them very well. We learn here that the Bakiraka basically had the status of slaves under the Kushan rule and instead opted to side with the royal Midland family. Which makes more sense when we remember the first appearance of the Bakiraka was way back during the Rescue Griffith sequence from the dungeon where the king sent some Bakiraka members to stop the Band of the Hawk. Now the king is long gone, and the Bakiraka are attempting to prove their worth to the winning side of the war. And prove they do, saving the leader from an arrow to the face, and we see the bodybuilders go to work, beating down Midland warriors with just their bare fists. Nothing supernatural is at play here, they just happen to be that powerful. But just like every single time Salat is brought into the story, Someone immediately shows up to overshadow him. This guy really can't catch a break. 
See, Griffith just strolls up on his horse, looking elegant as ever, and without a second thought, stabs his sword into the Kushan leader's face, proclaiming his presence here. Kushans fire a bunch of arrows, but miraculously, they all seem to miss. And flanking the Kushans from the side comes Nosferatu Zad, who just annihilates dozens upon dozens of soldiers, just hacking them in half. But stopping for a second, I know what you might be thinking. Griffith is a God Hand member now. Can't he just wipe all of them out in an instant? Can't he just turn on that femto juice and just throw them all into a vortex of pain and misery? Well, yeah, most likely he could. Though the extent of any God Hand's abilities aren't clearly defined, we know well enough that it's beyond any mortal power that we could possibly conceive. Griffith is back on Earth and wants to fulfill his dream of getting his own kingdom, so couldn't he just wipe out any opposing force and tell everyone who's left to bow before him? He could do this, but that's not Griffith's style in the slightest. We spent the entire Golden Age arc getting to know who Griffith was as the man, and this arc will give us glimpses at Griffith, the God Hand. But what we know for sure is simply ruling over someone isn't what Griffith is all about. He wants to be adored, respected, looked up to, and worshipped. He needs to be looked at as a legend. He would never rule by fear. He rules by admiration. He doesn't force people to follow him, except for guts, of course, but instead makes himself seem so appealing that people do it by choice. And if you can get the people in mass to support and rally behind you, then you have a massive advantage than someone who wants to conquer as a dictator. And that's the major difference we will see between Griffith's forces and the Kushan. As for the Kushan themselves, we don't see their leader for a while, and I'll have a lot to say about him that won't particularly be positive, but the whole idea of the Kushan invading to take over makes sense from a story point of view, as you need to give Griffith a solid segue into achieving his dream. Without an enemy to save the people from, he wouldn't have a way to be seen as a hero. And it's in that fact that at times, I find the Kushan war to be a little contrived, Considering besides Salat, we don't really know any Kushan characters, and like I said, when we see their leader, he's very much a meh character to me. But that being said, the war does give a nice backdrop to the arc, and it's something going on and ever-changing in the world as Guts goes on his journey, and he will intertwine with this war here and there. Don't get me wrong, there's so many things to like here, but we see so many nameless, faceless Kushans die, and never once does it feel like they actually stand a fraction of a chance against Griffith, minus maybe one final moment. But even then, I'd say it's safe to assume during this entire arc that Griffith is going to win. I don't think that's a spoiler. Anyway, the cool thing about this moment is, it's new character time. Griffith is back, but we have a whole slew of new villains to meet, so let's meet them, shall we? First, there is a knight with a long lance who introduces himself as Locus and immediately pledges his loyalty to the Hawk of Light. Next, as the Bakiraka bodybuilders try to attack, they are knocked back by a shrouded man wearing a mask, looking like his whole body is just a flowing cape. He's recognized by the Bakiraka as a Kushan himself, but in exile. His name is Raxus, and after admiring Griffith's looks, yeah, he tells Griffith he'd like to kill him, but until then, he'll make sure that no harm comes to him. Whether or not Raxus is serious in his intent is yet to be known, but he fights for Griffith in this moment, moving and contorting his body as if he were just a cloak in the wind. Next is a man that looks like a giant, decked out with full body armor shaped like a dragon, and wielding a flame-throwing shield, he bursts onto the battlefield. This is Grunveld, the Flame Dragon Knight. And yes, all of these men are apostles. With their combined efforts, they easily wipe out all of this section of the Kushans, except for Salat and his bodybuilders, who once again manage to escape thanks to plot armor. Meanwhile, during all this, the young girl from earlier, who knew in her heart that the Hawk of Light was coming, begins to recognize Griffith from the years prior, when the Band of the Hawk were celebrated in Midland. She rushes to and gazes upon him as her hero, just as Griffith had intended. But watching from above is a small bird who then flies off into the hands of another young girl roughly the same age. She's dressed as a witch and has an elf sitting on her hat. What appears to be a spirit of sorts comes out of the bird and into her as she regains consciousness. Or what looks like a spirit will be referred to by her as a luminous body. 
From just this page alone, we don't know who she is or what her intentions are, but if I may say up front, this is one of my favorite characters in the entire manga. I love her so much, and I can't wait to talk about her. But this is all she shows up for here. Just a small tease slash introduction of what's to come. But she mentions knowing that Griffith is the Hawk of Darkness, not the Hawk of Light. Master of the Sinful Black Sheep, I believe translates to Apostles, and King of the Blind White Sheep, which I believe is referring to humanity as a whole. The last arc was all about how religion can blind and corrupt, and if it weren't bad enough, wait until it's combined with Griffith. Now it's time to check in on Farnese and Serpico. How having fully resigned from the Holy Iron Chain Knights, Farnese has decided to try and follow the Black Swordsman, and he's been her link to the world beyond what she's known and beyond what she's been told her whole life. For the first time, Farnese isn't trying to please anybody but herself. And Serpico, he's just kind of along for the ride. Farnese asks him to get closer to the fire, and he tries to refuse, but eventually she commands him to, and he obliges. Up until this point, we've seen clearly how loyal Serpico is to Farnese, but other than just being his leader in the Holy Iron Chain Knight hierarchy, we haven't gotten a real glimpse as to why. Well, it's backstory time. I'm sure Miura was waiting until the right moment to get into the background of these characters. There wasn't really a moment to cram it in during the Conviction arc, though we did learn a little bit of Farnese's fucked up childhood. But here, as we have a nice break and we're building to what this arc is going to be all about, it's a good time to finally let us in on their upbringing and see what it was like. Now, only if we could get a backstory for this guy, too. Serpico recounts his childhood, being poor and bullied by other kids, though not without learning how to fight back. Which, I love this image of little Serpico slamming a rock into a bully's face. Beautiful. Beyond that, he mentions growing up in the Holy City, which we will get to see by the end of this arc. But as heavy religions go, in this city, all is about and offered to God. Bad things are just prayed away, and anything can be scoffed off as God's will. Serpico also took care of his bedridden sick mother, who constantly reminded him he was truly an aristocrat. See, in her younger days, she worked as a maid for a nobleman, and a night of passion created Serpico. Or so she says. After another day of being beaten by bullies, little Serpico couldn't even stand. But that day, somebody found him. A decked-out, prissy, noble girl named Farnese. She decided she wanted to take Serpico with her, and he states like someone finding a wounded dog to take care of was what it was like. And Farnese coming from an extremely wealthy family, her servants wouldn't refuse. So Serpico got taken to her mansion, and she attempted to take care of him. I also love this image of her just throwing the wet cloth on his face, Farnese clearly not having the slightest clue how to help a sick person. Farnese wanted to keep Serpico around basically just to boss him around. He was her servant, but because of this, he could earn a living and provide a caretaker for his mother. So he did everything little Farnese wanted, basically torturing himself in the process. But as he learned more about her and her family, the Van Mians, more became clear as to why Farnese acted so spoiled and in charge. Her father, having some of the highest clout in the entire nation, was often away on business. Her mother also gone most of the time. So Farnese was left to fend for herself in a giant mansion. And as we saw in a flashback during the Conviction arc, Farnese took to burning heretics as a way to get attention directed at her from adults in a positive way. As she did this, people would rejoice, and so she delved into that outlet of an aspect of modern religion at the time that was devastating. To her, it became play. Serpico recounts a time that she took him behind the mansion, and she would burn animals in front of a Holy See religious symbol, which is a hawk. And she would burn these animals for being, as she would call them, bad ones. And another time where her father briefly returned home and told her to get rid of one of her stuffed animals, and so she burned that as well. And in this beautiful page, Serpico explains Farnese well. She is afraid, so she injures them. She is afraid, so she estranges them. Serpico is the only person to understand Farnese, to sympathize with her, and even if she doesn't reciprocate it, the fact that Serpico got this close and had this much understanding at such a young age explains at least in part why his loyalty is so strong for her. Everyone else would see her as a bratty rich kid. Serpico saw a girl with no relationship with her parents. Someone desperate to control something, desperate for acceptance, and desperate to do what she was expected to do. And we then get this little twist. 
On a day where Serpico met and talked with Farnese's father, he recognized a locket Serpico's mother had given to him. Turns out, Farnese's father was the aristocrat she was talking about. Serpico and Farnese are half-siblings. So, I kind of think this wasn't necessary, and it would be a hell of a lot easier to ship these two if they weren't. <laughs> but alas, here we are. I don't think it harms the story or anything. Sometimes in stories, when everyone is related, it makes the world feel smaller. I don't think that really does in this instance. I mean, they are from the same city, they both have blonde hair, noblemen often had affairs, so it's not inconceivable. But anyway, Serpico makes a promise to keep this information a secret for Mr. Van de Meen. So yeah, Serpico knows they're related, but Farnese does not. We see them older now in flashback still, and how Farnese has had many men after her affection, but presumably just so that they could marry into the wealthiest family around. But she time and time again chose Serpico, even forcing him to fight to defend his own honor. In the mind of Farnese, you see how that works. Farnese even whips and scolds Serpico for losing or drawing in fights. I guess this contributes to how skilled he is. And like I said, if they weren't siblings, Farnese with this whip right here would give me many different feelings. As at age 16, her father arranged a marriage for Farnese. She first attempted to get out of it by asking Serpico to be with him, and so the two of them could run away. But knowing the truth of their relation, Serpico turned her down. Feeling humiliated and trapped, again not knowing who she even is as a person, Farnese attempted to burn down the mansion, during which Serpico saved her. And her father, having not spent any actual time raising her, and wanting her to marry someone she doesn't even know, then decides she's too unstable and she needs divine intervention. Thus, we have Farnese being shipped off to the monastery where her transition into a holy iron chain knight began. As tradition, their leader is always a woman, and the church was very happy to have the daughter of their prestigious Van de Meen family as their spokesperson. Then sending the Holy See Knights on missions to round up heretics to be burned, cemented in Farnese's mind what she was doing was the right thing. Being accepted, and those days of joining in the burnings as a child, had a place as she was getting older. As Serpico said, she is afraid, so she is desperate to be the one that is feared. All continued as such until one day, mixed in with the captured heretics, was Serpico's mother. She was for all intents and purposes gone, in a mind that was so demented and eroded she barely knew who she was. She represents someone Serpico left alone, and now he sees her here as perhaps a punishment for him doing so. He calls her mother aloud, and Farnese hands him a torch to prove that this is not really his mother. And after all, someone in the Holy Iron Chain Knights can't be related to a heretic. And so, as we don't see it happen, it is heavily implied that Serpico did indeed burn his mother, symbolically committing himself to Farnese in a way he never had been before. And this is why I believe he will obey her and follow every step that she takes towards the Black Swordsman, even though it's not what he wants. He made a commitment that day, a turning point choice, perhaps similar to a choice Griffith made, a sacrifice to move forward into another life. All ties to Serpico's common birth were severed. Now, I'm not saying Serpico is on Griffith's level of dickishness. To be fair, his mother was already long gone anyways, and it's not like they had any kind of care that could have been given to her during the Middle Ages. But she didn't have to die at the stake. It's something Serpico doesn't take lightly, which we know because we saw him save the little boy at the Tower of Conviction, who was related to a heretic that was burning there. So Serpico is actively trying to not recreate this moment in any fashion. All I'm saying is it's that action and a symbolic commitment to Farnese at any cost that could potentially end up being very dangerous for the main cast of our characters. Or maybe that's just my theory. Berserk has come a long way at this point, giving us our introduction to Guts as the kick-ass now and ask questions never black swordsman, and then taking us back to the golden age where Guts found meaning and purpose in the band of the Hawk and falling in love with Casca. Having that stripped away, and then following his crusade of vengeance to his realization that Casca was the flame that kept the darkness away from him, she was the last remaining link to his humanity. And when I say humanity, I mean it figuratively, not in the literal sense as Griffith gave up his humanity to become an all-powerful demon god. You know, there's always that. 
Guts losing its humanity is an, in a much more symbolic sense. But now Guts has been reunited with Casca. But with that, you have two people who have been branded who are going to constantly be in the same location, which means fighting, fighting, and more fighting. With Casca not able to defend herself in her current state, Guts is dealing with nightly demon attacks as he had been, but now doubled. It's like taking care of a child, except that child is the size of a grown adult, and one that used to be able to handle their own fairly well, and one you have a history with. This little moment of Guts trying to keep Casca warm by the fire, his gaze is briefly drawn to her chest before he forces himself to look away. And what we are going to be talking about in this video will deal heavily with this. Guts is a man like any other, and call it what you will, the male eyes are always drawn towards an attractive female body. We like legs, skinny and fit stomachs, long hair, and we stare at tits. It's an innate impulse. It's not controllable. This is normal and natural. It's how our species survives and procreates. Women have the attractive features that are meant to draw men to them, and then they select their mate, in the most straightforward way I can put it. So picture guts here. A man with a sex drive, who hasn't been touched by a woman in years. In fact, pretty much the only woman he's ever been intimate with is this woman here, Casca, who is practically naked and looks very close to how she did before. It's not a shock that Guts would have a natural impulse of sexual desire, but this woman no longer has her sense of ration or ability to choose. She's lost her mind and regressed to the state of a child who can't speak. Guts feels immediate shame, which is why he looks away. But the sad fact is, this isn't some random woman. This is the woman he loves. This is the woman who loved him. They are both adults, and they should be able to be intimate. But what happened happened, and they can't. And let's not forget to mention what happened to Casca just before she lost her mind. Sexual assault. Rape. And let's not forget Guts himself was raped when he was a child. And now this lover is childlike. I can't imagine how difficult that conflicting visual stimulation and memory of intimacy must be combined with the shame of knowing what brutally came from being taken advantage of, and to think just for one second that you want her in that way. In a way, it would make him feel just like Griffith, the one who did lose his humanity. In Guts' dream that night, he envisions his beast of darkness, that which represents his loss of humanity. The beast questions why he's not going to kill Griffith anymore, and why he keeps this husk of a person around with him. The beast brings up feeling so lost and deep in Guts' mind, yet still exist, that Casca is only here as a representation of what Griffith did to him, and that she is useless beyond that point. And maybe he should just put her out of her misery. Guts wakes up in a panic, killing one of the nightmare demon squids that attaches themselves to you as you sleep. And then we get this little bit of humor seeing one of the squids attacking Puck as he was supposed to be keeping watch. I always thought this was really funny. The next night, while Guts is fighting, Casca, scared and panicking, gets in the way, and Guts almost hits her with her sword swing. In frustration with her getting in the way and constantly keeping an eye on her, combined with a demon spirit briefly attaching itself to him, Guts reaches out and grabs Casca by the throat. It's only for an instant before Guts forces the demon out of him and falls to his knees. But an instant was long enough. Casca not being able to comprehend much around her, like a feral animal, has experienced Guts attack her now, and now she fears him. He tries to get close, but she squirms and runs. Puck tries to console him a bit, assuring him that it wasn't his fault, and it was only because he was briefly possessed by a demon. But Guts isn't so sure. And so, to keep her close, Guts is forced to tie a rope around her hands and forcibly bring her with him all the while still needing to fight nightly, still needing to not only protect her, but remain alive and intact himself because she's defenseless without him, while also having her constantly try to escape, slowly becoming more and more afraid of him and hating him. Casca does manage to free herself from the rope at one point, forcing Guts and Puck to rush after her tracks. Casca finds herself stumbling upon a group of bandits and getting into their food. And the men waste no time in seeing this defenseless woman, and they decide they want to have some fun with her. And I know there's a lot of people out there that say that there's too much rape or attempted rape in Berserk, and trust me, I get where you're coming from. But most of it has a purpose, and I believe a deeper meaning behind its inclusion. Berserk definitely focuses on the darker side of humanity as a whole. 
It suggests the idea that most of mankind is inherently evil, or that it's human nature to fall into the darker side of ourselves than it is to the light. And our protagonist, Guts, is the perfect example of that. So Casca, as she's about to be assaulted, has a triggering flashback to the events of the Eclipse, and it somehow forces her to tap into a piece of her former self. She manages to grab a sword, and remember she was the best swordsman of the Band of the Hawk besides Guts and Griffith, and she slices up all three bandits before they can even get to their weapons. Just then, Guts stumbles upon the scene, Casca covered in blood, shaking and holding a sword. She strikes at Guts, viewing him as an enemy as well. Guts manages to disarm her and get her to the ground, and then he forces a kiss on her. So what the hell is happening in this moment? Well, I think it goes back to what I was saying before. Casca is this naked, beautiful woman who is the only real person Guts has been intimate with. He's constantly seeing her and wanting to touch her and be with her as a man and a woman, knowing that he can't. He wants her to be how she was before. He wants her to remember him and love him as she once did. He wants to not have to take care of her doing every little thing, feed her, wash her clothes, drag her from place to place. He can't even talk to her. Guts was also away for two years, unable to face the reality about what she had become. Adding to those two years, Guts diving deeper and deeper into a place of darkness, separating him from any kind of meaningful human connection losing himself in a quest of madness. To think he could get Casca by his side and have all that magically disappear was a grave mistake on his part. All the decisions you make in life play into who you are in the here and now. Guts has done some horrible and violent things in his quest for revenge, and he's not the same man he was, even if he believes himself to be. A dark part of him wants Casca gone, so that he can be completely engulfed in his beast of darkness, lose what's left of his human side, and be on a murderous rampage until he's dead. The Beast of Darkness tells him to rip her to shreds, to sever all ties with her. When she's gone, the Beast can completely take over. But Guts, seeing the reaction of what he's doing to his love, snaps out of it and backs off, only to look down to see a bite mark on Casca's breast. Guts is horrified at his actions. He didn't go all the way, but this is still sexual assault. In a moment of anger, frustration, and weakness, he let his Beast of Darkness win. He was for a moment just like Griffith, taking back what he believes is his with a violent sexual act. A symbolic act of losing your humanity. For anyone that commits rape has no business calling themselves a man or a woman. Guts no doubt saw Griffith in himself, and also once again saw Casca as the young version of him. Just as he had when they made love consensually, an innocent victim being sold out. To break the mood, we see Puck also looking for Casca, but instead stumbles upon Isidro who is running with a pack of food he just stole. A tree branch is thrown at him, knocking him over, thrown by Serpico, who apparently Isidro stole the food from. Farnese is not far behind him as well. Puck comically flies up to her face, asking if she can see him now that she is less blinded by the Holy See's influence. Puck takes the three of them to find Guts, who is now sitting against a tree, Casca tied up to his side. All three of them are here to meet with Guts again. Isidro wants Guts to own up to his deal and to train him, to which Guts just ignores him. But Puck will agree to train him in his elf dimension style, which is a joke that was funny here and will soon get very old, but even by the end of this volume. Farnese kneels to Guts and commands Serpico to do as well. Reluctantly, he obliges. Farnese tells him that she has disowned her religion and that she wishes to learn the truth of what's beyond it alongside the Black Swordsman. Farnese then cuts off some of her hair to symbolize her commitment to change. In most cultures, lopping off hair does signify a separation from past actions. As well, in Japanese history specifically, it's meant to show stepping away or down from a position. And I know this takes place in a medieval Europe-style location, but the author is Japanese, so having that addition might add some meaning as well. Guts just tells her to stop being so dramatic and do whatever she wants. That he doesn't need payback for being enemies at the Tower of Conviction or anything. He lets them know that going with him will mean no restful nights and many enemies to face. But they all agree. This is the first time since setting off after the Eclipse that Guts has so readily accepted traveling companions. And had it not been for the incident with Casca just beforehand, he would not have been so readily accepting. 
Guts is scared of himself. He's scared of ever letting that happen again. And with other people around, perhaps it will keep him and keep the beast within him at bay, or at the very least, away from Casca. Not to mention, fighting by himself every night to defeat a double amount of demons than he's used to is getting too taxing. At least Serpico is a decent fighter out of the three. But Guts admitting to himself that he has a problem is a great stepping stone to becoming better. Guts accepting party members is another grand step into his development. Remember how long it took him to let Puck stick around? Now he let three new people join, not to mention two of them have tried to kill him. But if anything, this segment of the story has shown us is that Guts has a long way to go, but also that he's trying to fight the darker impulses inside of him. He doesn't want them to win, and at the end of the day, he wants Casca to be safe and to one day see her smile again. Now, wanting those things doesn't excuse what he did. He attacked her, if only for a moment, unpossessed. But this is why Guts is such a great protagonist for us to follow. He's not heroic in the general sense. He's not one-dimensional, even if he presents himself to be at times. He's not someone who has everything figured out. He's doing the best he can with what he has, and sometimes... Oftentimes, he fails and he falls. Here we saw him at one of his darkest points. And Berserk deals much with trauma, PTSD, and how the past affects us in the here and now. And for Guts, he won't let what happened leave his head ever again. And it will serve as yet another horrible memory that he is forced to carry. We are taken back to an area of land belonging to the Midland Kingdom. One of which is steadily being invaded and taken over by the Kushan Empire. A new character is introduced named Mule. He's a teenage boy of some noble lineage, and he's hiding out and looks to be in charge of a group of Midland warriors watching the Kushan from a distance. He mentions that his father and brothers were killed defending Midland, and seeing his resolve in hating the invading nation, we can understand his frustration and place during these events. Wanting to go down and attack, but steadily being asked not to by his soldiers, as they believe they'll just be defeated. Also to note, during this time, is rumors of Griffith's return have also been circulating. His legend grows as people believe they are going to be saved by the man that ended the Hundred Years' War once upon a time. I have a personal theory that rumors that are spreading about Griffith add to his strength, and as I stated many times, I believe that connected consciousness plays a huge role in the story. And also, I believe that the same could be said about rumors and stories of the Black Swordsman. Mule does decide to lead the charge down towards the Kushan to save some of the Midland people who have been surrounded. Upon entering the battlefield, we learn of a tactic used by the Kushan where they take captive enemies from Midland and force them to fight for them. If they refuse, they are executed by the archers. They're called war slaves, and basically forces Mule and his men to murder the very people that they're trying to save. It's a brutal and effective strategy that was certainly used throughout history. And I like this moment because it does call back to some of the battles during the Golden Age arc. And as much as I love the big demon fights, I also enjoy epic human-on-human -human wars using strategy and technique more than demonic powers. However, that won't last long as we get the introduction of yet another apostle follower of Griffith. From the distance, shooting numerous arrows at once from a bow that kind of reminds me of Soul Edge from the Soul Calibur games. You know what I'm talking about, right? Also, Nightmare reminds me of something that would be in Berserk, but uh, I digress. This character's name is Irvine, and he is Griffith's archer. And besides Zod himself, Irvine is definitely my favorite character in Griffith's new Band of the Hawk. Flanking them from all sides, we see the Band of the Hawk charging into the battlefield, Zod leading the charge along with some familiar faces we were introduced to before, including the giant Grunbeld, and of course, Griffith himself. Mule and the others realize the rumors were true and go to fight alongside them, but Mule hears something in his head telling him to stay back, and he just narrowly misses being hit by some arrows. It cuts to a young girl the same one we had seen in the area of Midland that Griffith showed up and saved, the one who predicted Griffith's arrival there in the first place. She's apparently using some kind of telepathy and mapping out areas of the battlefield to assist the Band of the Hawk. How she came into this ability and her others is uncertain, though she does appear to be a human after all. But whatever the case, she is serving it now as Griffith's medium, being able to briefly sense the future and send out telepathic messages. Though, with Griffith's abilities, I doubt it's needed very much. 
He kills the commander of the Kushan with ease. And again, as I've said before, when you're fighting enemies like Griffith and his apostles, the Kushan constantly fail to seem like a threat at all. After the battle at a campsite near a lake, Mule looks around at everybody working, comfortable, and happy. And it harkens back heavily to early in the Golden Age when Guts first woke up in a campsite of the Band of the Hawk and saw the comfortability of everyone there. Mule is having almost the same experience now. He's greeted by the medium, Sonya, who wants to take him to meet with Griffith. On the way, Mule sees the Band of the Hawks equivalent to the Kushan's war slaves. Essentially the same at first, captured Kushan are forced to fight on the side of the Band of the Hawk. The major difference here being that after three battles, they are given the choice to die or to become an actual member. Choosing to join the band officially means that they get the same privileges and can even move up in rank. This is an interesting concept and one that I think hits the fine line between cruelty and unification that Griffith is so good at. Yeah, it's mostly a manipulation tactic, but framed in a way that makes it appealing to the captured and a benefit to join their side. It's not the uncompromising slavery, which is what the Kushan offer for their captured, but Mule refuses to accept the idea of it, as it's being explained by the Lancer Apostle Locus. But upon realizing who the Lancer is, a legend in his own right, stories have been told about his heroism and being an undefeated warrior. And once again, leaning into stories and legend, adding a collective idea of who a person is. Thus, in my theory, aiding to their power. Sonia then leads Mule through a shortcut where Mule has an overwhelming sense of dread. There seems to be dozens of Apostle soldiers hanging out and eating flesh, and Mule is horrified. But the stranger occurrence here is that Sonia is completely unaffected. In fact, she seems comfortable and at ease. Even when she's picked up and teased by one of them, she is unafraid. And what it really comes down to is her complete and utter faith in Griffith and whatever he's doing. She doesn't see these creatures as monsters or demons to be feared. She sees them as pieces of the puzzle Griffith is putting together. And Griffith is the savior, the light, the Holy Spirit, and whatever he deems necessary is necessary. Grunbeld, shown here without his giant-ass helmet, makes the apostle let go of Sonya. And Irvine the Archer makes another one let go of Mule, signifying that these guys are the real deal and commanders in their own right ahead of the other apostles. Upon learning Grunbeld's name, Mule is reminded of yet another legend concerning him, how he defended his land from Shooter with only 3,000 soldiers. And it's clear to Mule now that Griffith is taking all of these warriors from legend and assembling them all into one spot for a common goal. I'm sure the power behind a collective understanding and multiple legendary men is and will lead to the earth-shattering results towards the end of this arc. Sonya continues to lead Mule out through the shortcut to an open area, immediately running into Zod, who remains silent. Mule isn't told who Zod is, but we already know from much earlier in the story that Zod himself is a legendary warrior as well, and is known as Nosferatu Zod the Immortal, and that there are many that revere and fear him. On the hilltop, Mule sees Griffith sitting on some kind of tree trunk made to look like a throne, surrounded by glowing white orbs. Sonya tells Mule that the orbs are the souls of those that died today in battle, and bowing before Griffith are men and women related to the deceased. They're there in order to say a final goodbye before they pass on to the next world. A spirit comes to its wife and son before disappearing into the air. Now, imagine if you are Mule at this point whose perspective this portion of the story takes place from. You aren't aware of anything supernatural in the world truly existing. Then today, you see men perform otherworldly physical feats in battle. You meet various legends one after the other. You see demon-looking soldiers feasting on a corpse, and then what looks like literal souls floating in the air. All this combined could be more than a normal person could take, but the awe and thrall of it all has taken Mule over. He's speechless unable to comprehend all that he is seeing. And I just love how we just met this character, but he is immediately relatable in this way. And we are also seeing Griffith through brand new eyes. We the reader know everything that Griffith has been through and done to get to where he is now. But what's it like just for a random newcomer to see this messiah-like figure offering souls of the dead one last goodbye? Truly, this is someone you'd look to as a god. But also, as the reader, one has to wonder, are these really the souls of the dead? 
Or is this just another manipulation technique of the god hand Femto? Sonya rushes to Griffith to give him a big hug, mentioning that her power is stronger with him around. So whatever telepathic abilities or ability to see into the future that she has is amplified in the presence of him. Mule asks where the souls went, and Griffith just states that they went to become one. He could maybe be talking about the astral world, or some kind of afterlife, or just talking out of his ass. It's ambiguous. Mule just, in the presence of Griffith, bows to him, thanking him for his rescue today, and then, as if being taken over by the power of his presence, takes his sword out and vows his loyalty to Griffith. All the while, getting welled up, teary-eyed, and his heart racing. It's as if his mind, body, and spirit instantly submit themselves to Griffith without any rational thought. He even thinks to himself that it's destiny. And it makes me think of the berserk quote that began every episode of the anime series. In this world, is the destiny of mankind controlled by some transcendental entity or law? Is it like the hand of God hovering above? At least it is true that man has no control, even over his own will. And so Griffith finds himself yet another ally in the form of this young nobleman, Mule. And as we've seen, Mule is an effective leader and a pretty damn good fighter for his age. Mule, Sonia, and Griffith look out and up towards the stars, believing that whatever the result of this war with the Kushan, it will go down as the reputation of many there in legend. Oh, and yeah, there is this brief page of some Kushan trying to execute Griffith with arrows from afar, but the Apostle Raxus shows up and quickly shuts them down. And as he says, we mustn't spoil the moment. When we cut back to Guts's group, we see that Guts is actually giving Isidro some sword training lessons. And as much as I don't care for Isidro, as I've said before, his involvement does show plenty of growth for Guts' character. The man who pushed everything away, now taking the time to sort of train a boy in swordsmanship, is nothing short of impressive. He even ends up giving him some solid advice to not use overhand strikes against someone taller than you. And as a short guy myself who practiced a bit of martial arts when I was younger, that's some pretty keen word of advice. Focusing on Farnese a bit, we get here the humble beginnings of her new character direction. After giving up her faith and place in the Holy See and choosing not to return home to her noble family in an attempt to follow Guts around and learn about the truth of the world. The main truth she's actually realizing is she's kind of useless. Remember, all her life she's been doing things to appease others and try to win the affection and attention of those with authority. But now, without that, she's left without any status. She can't cook, she can't clean, she can't fight, and she feels immense regret for almost getting Casca killed. She apologizes to Casca, but in her current state of mind, it mostly falls on deaf ears. She is tasked with watching Casca while the others cook and train, and lo and behold, she loses her. Thankfully, this will not be another half an arc to find her, but for Fernice, this is one of those you had one job kind of moments, and she failed. She didn't even remember the way back to the campsite and nest herself in the base of a tree all night until the others wind up finding her in the morning after having already found Casca first. Serpico offers to head back to the holy city with her, but she declines, still bent on discovering herself. Then our characters get a little bit of info of what's been going on with Midland when they run into a farmer asking for directions. The group needs to get to the sea in order to get to Puck's Elf Island. And boy, that will not be a quick trip, but we'll save all that for later. The man describes the city by the sea, called Vertanus, as having a gathering of many nations that follow the Holy See, preparing for an all-out war with the Kushan Empire. He also lets our characters know that the Midland King is dead, which we as the audience have known for some time now, but he also explains that the princess, Charlotte, is missing. The only heir to the throne, and the one who inadvertently caused everything to go down with the Band of the Hawk when Griffith had his way with her. She's been absent for the story for some time now, but that at least implies that she is not confirmed dead. Oh, and the man also warns the group not to run into trolls. And as someone that makes videos on the internet, I completely understand this advice. Continuing to train Isidro, Guts is impressed with his improvement of using a second concealed weapon, but also mentions Isidro needs to develop his own style, and explains how different fighting on an actual battlefield is. And this is where we get a lot of my annoyance with Isidro. It's where a lot of it comes in. I feel like he's never actually in danger, and things have been relatively safe for him. He feels very out of place compared to the rest of the characters. 
but enough about that. What's cool here is at least the nature of which Guts delivers this information to him. Because we've seen his battles in the Band of the Hawk, we can sympathize and understand with what he's saying, and also see Isidro's naivety with the context. And Puck sees it too. And then in a small moment that I love, and I theorize will come into play someday. So Serpico takes Guts aside to talk with him, and Guts assumes he wants to fight with him to settle the score from their previous fight. And Guts is actually all gung-ho and ready to do it. Serpico declines, though, but does admit that he wishes Guts was dead. He's not used to seeing Farnese be so lost and defenseless. He's seeing a side of her he's not used to, and he knows following Guts will continuously put her in danger, and as we've discussed, she can't even fight. Though she did defeat Guts once. Har har. So Serpico tells Guts he will continue to accompany Farnese on whatever this journey is, but if she were to die, nothing would stop him from coming after Guts. If you haven't seen my video on my Serpico and the Bailet theory, give it a watch. I won't go into all of it here, but basically all I'm saying is that if something happened to Farnese, I could see Serpico making a sacrifice to get more power and face Guts as an apostle. Maybe I'm wrong, and I hope I am, but if anyone would do it in the party, it would be Serpico. Just my theory. Meanwhile, Farnese and Casca are alone and jumped by a furry creature. No, no not a furry, but a, a troll that they were warned about. These things are straight up nasty, and Miura puts a very specific touch on his fantastical creatures and beasts, and the troll is no different here. The two girls scream, and the first one to hear it is Isidro. And here is a moment for him. After claiming to want to be a strong swordsman, he's forced to start a fight without Guts or Serpico here for backup. And, okay, here's the thing. This is my issue with Isidro. And I was going to save this for an upcoming video, but here is a perfect example, and I really just can't help myself. Isidro is facing off against a troll. A monster. Not an apostle, sure, but still a monster in the berserk world. And what should be terrifying... What should be like the moment when Guts met Zod for the first time, seeing an otherworldly creature, facing it alone, and being scared shitless. Instead, Isidro is bouncing and jumping around with comedic expressions on his face, and it takes away any bit of tension that could have been in the scene. Basically what I'm saying is, it never feels like Isidro is in any actual danger. He feels so outside the rest of the world and the verisimilitude of it all. He feels like a cartoon character in a dark, serious world. And unlike Puck, who is already a fantastical creature and established as a comic relief, Isidro is human and meant to be one of the new main characters. This is a series where characters can die. They get physically mutilated, they can be pulled to hell or sexually assaulted. But Isidro feels free from any of that. He feels like he's absolutely safe from any danger, and I hate that. It takes any drama out of the scene that could have possibly been there. When we saw the Band of the Hawk go into battle, or at the Eclipse, it was scary, because at any moment, it could have been their last. Could you even imagine or picture Isidro in the Eclipse? The two tones don't even make sense to each other. And okay, you want to have a comic relief character, but he keeps swaying back and forth from feeling like he has importance to the story, or to just being a joke. And think of the backstory we have for Guts, for Casca even, for Farnese and Serpico that we just got. All have complex lives and histories, but what is the Cedro? Oh, he just left home to be a swordsman. Like, what? And even now, as I'm currently caught up with the manga, and it's the, I'm in the latest chapters, my opinion on him hasn't changed. Sure, he has some fun moments here and there, and yes, the humor does work for me on occasion, but I can't help feel how out of place this is when every other character is in legitimate danger, and no matter what he goes up against, he's just exploding with comical plot armor. But whatever, moving on. To protect them from the trolls and the character I don't like comes a character I love. This mysterious little person dressed as a witch shows up and points out that they are surrounded by a group of trolls, not just the one. She draws a circle on the ground all around them, and Puck recognizes that this is a magical ritual. And to confirm this, pops another elf from the witch's hat, shocking the group. She manages to ward off the trolls with something she calls help from the fire ele elementals. And Farnese is particularly shocked by all this, but she was the one most deeply religious, so I can't imagine how satanic all this may seem, yet it's what saved her life. 
But even though I just talked about how much I don't like him, a legitimate comic moment does come from Isidro here. When the witch calls him out on his bad sword skills, he goes to grab her in frustration to suddenly realize it's a young girl and not an old hag. But since he grabbed her chest, she puts a spell on him to make him think he's a monkey. And yes, we are still reading Berserk here. The witch manages to leave, but watches the group from afar, first stating from the trolls that she wonders if another lair has invaded the world, and she feels a strange sensation from Guts and Casca, unaware it's the brand of sacrifice on them that she feels. But as Guts and Serpico reunite with the others, Casca is still afraid of getting near Guts, still remembering what he did to her. She clings onto Farnese, hiding from him but Guts just accepts that that's the way it has to be. Continuing their walk through the forest, the party stumbles upon an old man laying beaten in the grass. Puck heals him up, and he explains that his name is Morgan, and that his group was also attacked by the trolls, and he's the last left alive. He mentions his village has been consistently attacked by the trolls ever since earlier in the winter, when the world just seemed to change. Leading back into the prologue of this arc, where it was stated that Griffith's incarnation and things in the world aren't quite as they used to be and setting up further events, as he mentions the leaders of this village have gone to Vertanus because of the war with the Kushan. So with no help or belief that the trolls actually exist from authorities, he traveled here to the forest specifically to meet with, you guessed it, a witch. Legend has it that a witch lives here in this forest, but only children have seen where she lives. And I like that because it's the idea that children are open-minded enough to be able to see something like that. Whereas adults become more closed-minded with religion, as we've seen in the story, more things are there to blind you to being more susceptible to seeing fantastical things. And lo and behold, all of them together find it. Only took a couple of pages. Don't know what was so hard for this old dude to find it by himself, but there you go. It looks as if it's growing straight out of the trees, a very mystical setting. But as the group gets close to it, guardians spring to life to defend it from the intruders, in a form of golems. A golem, if you don't know, is from Jewish legend and is basically an entity made out of clay or something of the sort brought to life by magical means and usually obeys a master because it doesn't have any thought or soul of its own. They begin to battle against the golems, but being made out of the supposed clay, they are able to regenerate and feel no pain. But I love that it's actually Casca who finds a little totem inside one of the dismembered golems, and by taking it away, or destroying it, they no longer are able to regenerate. With that information, the team goes to work and annihilates the rest of the golems. The little witch girl who has been watching hears a voice in her head to stop watching and let the group in. She is also named by this voice as Shurike, and I believe I'm pronouncing that right, correct me if I'm not. According to the Berserk Wiki, it's a homonym of the name Circe from Greek mythology, who was a goddess of magic. Shirake comes to the door and lets them in. They see the magical items and herbs scattered about. Puck recognizes some of them, stating that there are plenty of magic users on his island. Shirake introduces herself, and the little female elf that hangs out on her hat introduces herself as Evalora. And honestly, I don't have much to say about this elf. She's just an elf that's friends with Shirake and has some back and forth with Puck on occasion but she's extremely forgettable and you could essentially take her out completely of the story and nothing would change. So forgive me if I kind of forget she's around sometimes because I do legitimately forget she's around. Shirke also states that she is just a witch in training and the real witch here is her mistress who wishes to see them. She takes them to the room and sitting in the middle is just what looks like a normal old woman. The old man with them, Morgan, recognizes her from when he was a child in the forest long ago. Apparently, she hasn't changed much. She remembers him as well. Adding to that, she senses immediately that Farnese feels guilt for all the heretics that she helped capture, which would include people like her, and assures Farnese that she has no ill will towards her. She also picks up and mentions that Guts and Casca are branded. Everyone is shocked at how much she knows, and she states that her name is Flora, and that she's been waiting for them to arrive. So, from here on out, just as the world is changing in Berserk, the story will take on several changes as well. We are getting into magic, and not like we haven't seen some magic before with Puck or the Bailets, and if you really want to count the Apostles as magical, but here we really get into the whole shebang of spells and rituals, telepathy, magical items, magical creatures, and more. Berserk is, after all, a dark fantasy, and we are about to dive headfirst into the fantasy genre for real now. So, I hope you guys are ready. Welcome, everyone, to the Exposition Dump Extravaganza. 
Yeah, in today's episode, we are going to be getting a lot of information and setup, and generally this is a good thing in stories. We spend some time getting the necessary information we need to understand the upcoming events, and then when they play out, we don't have to sit around wondering, wait, what's happening? But I do have to stress something, and that's that Berserk at this point had been running for about 13 years already. Kentaro Miura hadn't yet started his legendary hiatuses, but we've gotten a pretty good chunk of the story done, going through three major arcs so far. But in this one, he decides to shake things up a bit by really doubling down on the fantasy genre, introducing our new main character Shirake and the fact that she's a witch and will be doing plenty of magical spells to aid our protagonists on their journey. Adding as well more fantasy genre creatures like trolls, ogres, and much, much more, and delving deeper into the lore of everything happening behind the scenes of the human world and into the astral world. And this can be both good and bad depending on how you want to look at it. It can be good in that it means the world building and scale of Berserk is only going to increase. After all, our main antagonist has near unlimited godlike powers, so we have to at least give Guts and company a bit of a power up to deal with that. And we'll do so through magical items and powers. With expanding on the lore and world, we can also make much more sense of everything that's happened, such as with the Bailets and what the God Hand's ultimate objectives may or may not be. It also opens us up to potential storylines and encounters that wouldn't have been possible before. But playing devil's advocate just for a minute, how could all this be seen as a negative? Well, if we think back to the definitive story arc of the series, the Golden Age arc, something very special about that arc, other than letting us know Guts' history, is how grounded it was. The demons, magic, and the like are kept mostly in the background, only showing up when their presence can truly make an impact slowly building and leading us up to its climax when everything goes apeshit. It's the very build-up to that climax that makes the Eclipse work as well as it does. It teases us by feeding us little glimpses at what is behind the scenes of the world of man. Zod showing up momentarily and giving his warning, the Baylet hanging around Griffith's neck as a constant, mysterious wild card, and even Wild's appearance and how insane it felt compared to everything the Band of the Hawk had fought thus far. For the most part, it dealt with real people facing real people. I mean, obviously it's all still fiction, but I think it was the grounded nature of that arc that is what made it so easy to gravitate towards and what helps make the fantastical elements feel as powerful as they did. Even in the Conviction arc, which has its fair amount of fantastical elements, really has a crux of its conflict dealing with the darker nature of humanity when it puts too much faith into what it considers the greater good. How Mazgus, just as a human, can be more terrifying than any demon could be. And yes, he gets demony powers later on, but still. The world set up in Berserk is one that works as if it was just a medieval setting, and any demons that show up are either at night in highly negative energy areas that possess people, or apostles who for the most part conceal their identity. Any contact with something supernatural usually results in death, and so rumors of it are the only things that go on in the minds of the people. Then we have the fantastical creatures like Puck, an elf, who exists here in the human world, but most people can't see him because their minds are so closed off to even the very idea that he could exist. Puck's mere existence does hint that more things like him must be about. I'm not sure if Miura had the ideas he has now about the fantastical creatures in the astral world all the way back when he first introduced Puck, as in the early chapters it seemed as though just about anybody could see him. But anyway, the point is simply this. By expanding the world and making things much more magical and fantastical on an every day and every chapter basis, this far into the story, it may take away a bit of the flavor that you've come to love when it comes to Berserk, keeping it mostly grounded with the occasional demony thing happening, and usually just around guts. I don't know, let me know if you like this direction or if you feel it strays too far from the glory days of the Golden Age. As Guts and company look towards the witch Flora, she instead speaks with Morgan first, the old man who's here to get her assistance with the trolls attacking his village. She mentions humans shouldn't even see trolls, if not for rare occasions, let alone be attacked by them. But she feels her lifespan is growing short and so she doesn't wish to leave to help him. Instead, she says to take her pupil Shurike with him to aid him with this troll problem. Flora also asks Guts and his group to accompany her, and if they do, she will put a charm on the brand of sacrifice Guts and Casca both have that will dull its effects and even protect them from possession by the demonic spirits. 
And this is something Guts deals with nightly. He lights up at the prospect, but also feels it could be more protection against his own Beast of Darkness, if anything else, to keep him from harming Casca again. So that makes it all seem worth it. What I find really funny is that nobody with Guts' current party besides Puck even know what the brand on him did. Guts isn't the talkative type, and it's interesting to note that, again, besides Puck, nobody knows about Guts' past with the Band of the Hawk, the Eclipse, Griffith, or anything. And they won't for some time, and I always found that interesting. Flora tells them they can rest here for the night, the house is protected by talismans, and invites them all to stay for dinner, during which the first bit of heavy information is delivered. Guts, of course, wants to know how she knew that they were branded, or even how she knows what the brand is. She states she was told by somebody in the Astroworld that they would arrive here, and that she should help them. But before we reveal who that was, they ask what the hell the Astroworld is. And guess what? We've already been there. Well, to a part of it anyway, at the Eclipse where the Band of the Hawk were transported into a deep layer of the Astroworld. But the Astroworld is much more than that. And here's where we get to world build. All right, everybody, so let me give you a very detailed drawing of the three worlds that we learn exist in the Berserk universe. All right, so first we have our normal uh, human world right here. Uh, so that's a perfect circle. See, that's the human world, right? And then we also have the astral world right here. Okay, that looks like that. And then we got the world of idea that kind of looks like this. Comes over there. And then there's a lot of ideas that kind of shoot out this way. Um, so as you see, this is a very accurate representation of uh, the three worlds. And I know before I do this, I'm going to have some people that are like, you don't know what you're talking about, you're wrong, that's not how Berserk works, yada yada yada. But you know what? It's just a video for fun, man. Just, just doing this for fun. This is just for me. If you don't like how I interpret it, that's fine. You know, there's a bajillion other Berserk videos to watch. Most of them are better than mine, so just go, just go watch those. You know what are you, what are you doing here? If you don't like it, you don't, you don't like how we talk about it. What are you doing? Anyways, so we got the physical world, okay? Which I'll draw right there, okay? So the physical world is the simplest one to explain. It's just everything that we see and feel, and everything that would be experienced by a normal person. It's just the world as we know it. It's So, overlapping that and going into its own world is the astral world. And the astral world can contain many different things, and it's kind of separated into layers, if you will. It contains, like, the recently dead spirits that haven't moved on yet, so those are the ones that attack guts every night and uh, can possess people, have possess Varnies and things like that. It also controls like magical creatures like the trolls. Uh, just, I don't even know what I'm drawing. That's, that's a troll right there. So magical creatures and fantastical beasts and things like that. So even Puck in his like elf island uh, is somewhere in the astral world which is where the group and everybody is heading to currently, or at least was until they were detoured by this whole witch fiasco. And the area where the eclipse ceremony took place is in a very, very deep layer of the astral world as well. The astral world is more abstract than the physical world, containing, you know, mystical creatures here and dead spirits here, uh, you know, and other things here and there. So it's not all just one place, one thing, like a world like we would think a physical world would be. It has all these different kind of layers and facets to it. Where the astral world and physical world overlap is called the interstice right here. Interstice. And uh, this is where Guts and Casca reside because they're branded. They're always somewhere right in between worlds that are overlapping. So you got to think about it more abstractly. It's not like you just enter a portal into a world. It's like the worlds kind of, they coexist. They overlap with each other. Now to think even more abstractly, the world that overlaps the astral world is the world of idea. And uh, I've talked about this briefly before. Can you even see that? And the world of idea is basically a collective consciousness of all life. <laughs> it's how everything is connected as a whole. It's an endless void, no pun intended. And it's said that this place is the origin of all of existence. So just as where the physical world overlaps uh, with the astral world and creates the interstice, where the astral world overlaps with uh, the world of idea, this creates the vortex of souls. 
Um, and we've seen this before. This is where uh, the Count uh, was pulled to his death as long, along with Wild that we've seen. It's kind of just that whole swirling cycle vortex of souls. Uh, whether you want to call that hell or heaven, whatever that is, that would exist within this as well. And in the omitted uh, Idea of Evil chapter, we have Griffith, who was at the Eclipse Ceremony, who was pulled even deeper into the ideal world where he met with this Idea of Evil, which was basically just a personification of humanity's need for reason for all the horrible things that happen in their lives. So humanity, uh, or whatever else, willed it into existence because they all had this collective consciousness idea desire um, for this thing, and thus this thing was created. This thing started sort of manipulating history and time and uh, creating, you know, the God Hand themselves to do whatever it is that they do. So, in a way, humans created God, and God created the God Hand, and giving Griffith his power, literally pulling it from the collective desires that surrounded him. So Griffith is pulling all of these things you know, all of this desire probably for a savior for, you know, the, the scriptures that were written in the Holy See and things like that. Everyone knew the Hawk of Light, Hawk of Darkness, yada yada. All of that stuff exists in the consciousness of mankind. And I believe, my personal theory, is that that's how he gets his power. That's how he pulled his power from. It's just all this collected because he was floating in the world of idea, talking to the idea of evil. Now that chapter is not technically canon, uh, but we can at least infer that something like that did happen, and there's enough allusions to it where even if you want to say the idea of evil doesn't exist, the world of idea still does exist in the Berserk universe, and so um, that's my idea of how Griffith was able to like absorb his power into himself. And also the idea that it would be Griffith specifically to come back, who humanity already knows, and well, a, a section of humanity already, already knows and revere him, and that gives him his power, and it just, it fits so naturally with who Griffith is as a person, just that guy that uh, presents himself to be idolized and further evolves him into being a godlike being in the eyes of mankind. So once again, just physical world, that's where we all live, really easy to understand. Interstice is where the physical and astral world overlap, and that's where Guts and Casca reside, along with Puck's Elf Island and uh, Flora's Mansion and all that was within there. In Layers of the Astral World, which contains dead spirits, dead souls, contains mythological creatures that humans have, you know, thought up and whatnot. So dragons and trolls and all that exist in the astral world, and there's the Eclipse Ceremony. And the Vortex of Souls, which is the overlap of the astral world and the idea of evil, which is this constant like spiral of heaven, hell, whatever you want to call it. And then the world of idea itself, which was the beginning of creation, or wherever the idea of evil resides, and the collective consciousness of all mankind uh, all together as one thing, which I guess, in a way, you could call God as well. Like I said, this is my understanding of the world. This is not definitive. I am not Kentaro Miura. I wish I was, because then I would be an awesome artist instead of drawing stuff like this. But this is how I see it, this is how I view it, and this is what I'm going with until I read something that is uh, resonates with me enough for me to contradict it. So, hope you like it. Hope you like this little display and introduction into the video. Um, and if you didn't... So, back to the manga. Isidro offers a decent idea that if people stopped believing in fantastical creatures, that they would just go away. But Shurike says that the idea of them is so deeply engraved into humanity over many generations that it would be impossible for people to completely not believe. And this makes sense, too, going off the world of idea existing, in that so many people have these superstitions and fears of the unknown that creatures will forever be engraved into the minds of humanity. And think about it, dragons, monsters, demons, all of these things have been perpetuated in humanity all over the globe in hundreds of different cultures and areas. It's part of our genetics, part of our souls, to have ideas of the fantastical. Flora and Shirake also mention part of their witchy training involves allowing themselves to travel into the astral world. So one would exist in all three worlds simultaneously. Our physical body is obvious, it's just our bodies. In the astral world, we have what they call our ethereal selves, basically just made from our own energy, and world of idea is thought and consciousness. But travel into the astral world means taking control of our ethereal bodies and focusing on it to make it into the form of your physical body. This process is called making a luminous body. With a luminous body, which is essentially your astral form merged with your consciousness and appearance of your physical self, 
you can then explore at least part of the astral world. But as we said, the astral world has many, many layers, and some are too deep to ever return from, so performing and practicing this is very dangerous and requires concentration and willpower above the average person. Hope you're not too confused, because there's more! But before then, our ladies Farnese and Casca relax in a hot bath after dinner, and even though I can't show it, and I know she's a potato right now, but Casca's ass in this shot is just everything good in life. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. Anyways, moving on. Hey, Isidro tried to look too, so it's not just me. And God, now I'm comparing myself to Isidro. Since Flora seems to know all, Guts goes to her specifically to ask about the bailet he carries with him. Guts obviously knows what the bailet does, but he still doesn't know how it works. Flora sees the look in Guts' eyes and feels his energy knowing he wishes for revenge for the brand that they burned into him. She reveals that the bailet is useless except for the person that it is fated for. Something that governs human fate sends them to the physical world, and until the time is right, it will remain inactive. If the bailet isn't for Guts or anyone in his party, it will find its way away from them. And if it's lost, just like in Griffith's case, it will find its way back to its rightful owner. Flora, knowing the horrors of the bailet herself, wishes for it to leave Guts's hands. And this is why I love this bailet being such a wild card in the story. It could theoretically belong to anyone in Guts's party, or it might never come into play in the slightest. It's a complete and utter Joker card in the pack. Also, don't forget this bailet's name is Betchy, and Puck says its favorite food is cheese. Wait, bailets have mouths, but do they eat? I, I don't know, that's too much to ponder with everything going on right now. Guts also asks her what exactly the God Hand are, to which she doesn't fully know. Just that they were all once human, just as Griffith was, and that they carry out the will of something lurking deep in the abyss. We could conclude that this is the idea of evil, but once again, that's not officially canon. And even if it's not, we still get a semi-reveal here of the ultimate evil force controlling the God Hand, and that's pretty important information. Shirake, overhearing the conversation, questions Guts facing these entities that govern even the fates of mankind, and Guts just confirms that yes, he is. It's such a badass moment. As Guts walks away, Shirake confides in Flora that she finds him foolish. As she witnessed Griffith facing the Kushan when she watched from afar, that had nothing that could possibly rival the power of darkness giving off by that man. And he is truly the Hawk of Darkness foretold in the stories and revelations. It's the idea that fighting against fate is futile, which brings back the age-old themes of Berserk, which is fate versus free will. And how much control do we truly have over things that happen, that govern all of humanity? While Flora admits to Shuriki that the Hawk of Darkness she saw was the one who branded Guts and Casca, and that even with all that they know, that sometimes they can be blind to things as well. Guts is branded and fated for death, but yet he has survived to this point, to the point of meeting the two of them here and now. And Flora says she believes that God may bestow fate upon them, but it is up to them to choose it. And this is a very powerful thing considering the very idea of the Bailet apostle-making process. There is always a choice. So all of this is happening with Griffith, but at the end of the day, it's only be happening because Griffith chose it. And with every other apostle as well. Maybe fate is set up a particular way, but we can still choose to say no. So now we get to our magical items. First, Guts and Casca are given a talisman patent over top of their brands that will, according to Shurike, not attract demonic beings to them for at least a couple of days. Great news, as it means Guts might actually be able to get a full night's rest. The group also rubs something called Femme Fatale Ointment on them, which will help them better perceive ethereal bodies, spirits that exist in the astral world. Shirke then shows them her fetishes. Oh yeah, you knew what I'm talking about. No, no, sadly no, it's, it's the second definition of fetish. An inanimate object worshipped for its supposed magical powers or because it's considered to be inhabited by a spirit. First for Serpico, he is given a hooded cloak and sword. But as he can easily see ethereal bodies now, he notices that the cloak is covered with what looks like small winged creatures. They are wind elementals, called sylphs. An elemental, as you might think, is one of four. Wind, fire, earth, and water. Elementals are spirits that fill the astral world, and these ones attached to Serpico's new cloak have power of wind. This will allow him to flow gracefully, glide, sidestep attacks, and push them away as if with a breeze. He's also given a sword made from a feather of an eagle. Good thing it wasn't a hawk, I guess. And this too has the power from the wind elementals and can create wind currents like a whirlwind in your hand. And yes, it can cut as well. 
Isidro is handed a dagger that is embedded with fire elementals called salamanders, similarly giving him the power of flame in his weapon as the blade itself was crafted magically from molten lava. Everyone seems pretty nervous for Isidro being in control of such a thing, and rightfully so. She also gives him a bag of concentrated berries that will supposedly scatter the trolls if thrown at them. Since Farnese and Casca aren't fighters, they are given silver chain shirts that again have talisman-like properties to ward off evil. And Farnese is given a silver knife as well, with no specific magical properties. She also mentions how more faith and communication with the astral creatures attached to their weapons will increase the potential of their power. It's like if you play Dungeons & Dragons a lot, a lot of the times you get a magical item but you have to attune to it first before it'll work. Shirke then goes to give Guts an axe, but before we learn what the magical properties or elemental is attached to that, Guts refuses opting to use the same sword he's been using since starting his apostle hunt. As the group is readying to leave, we are given more explanation of Flora's house and our current location, that we are currently in a lair of the Astroworld. This is where the house is located and because of which it would be normally never found by a regular person. But because of the brands Guts and Casca have, they already exist in the interstice, which is a shallow overlap of the physical and astral world. And Flora's domain is about one layer deeper than that. Also in this layer, time moves differently than it does in the physical world. Something alluded to back in the story of Peacock, but I won't get into all that again until it really comes into play. I like that Shirake does ask why Casca doesn't stay behind with Flora since her current state could prove a problem for Guts, but Guts informs them that bad things happen when he leaves her side, so he, she's going to stay with him. And that's just adorable. Farnese is going as well, thinking she may not be useful, but Guts reassures her that she will be if she looks after Casca. Again, adorable. And then there's this old guy Morgan who's just standing around waiting to go back to his troll infested village with these weirdos. So Flora sees them off and goes back inside where someone else is standing off screen as it were. She asks if he's satisfied and if she's fulfilled the favor that he's asked of her. Revealing this person is in the astral world and wanted her to help Guts. And from the shadows we get a close up of Skull Knight's face. My boy we haven't seen since the collapse at the Tower of Conviction. Also further confirming that Skull Knight primarily exists in the Astro World, and that's why he's not around all the time, usually just at important moments. Also to me, confirming Skull Knight is mostly good, as Flora and Shurike are good characters as well, and he's connected to them. But Flora questions if Skull Knight feels sympathy for Guts and company, or if he's just using them to his own benefit. We of course get a cryptic answer that could mean either. Basically he states that if he can't do it himself, which I infer is defeat the God Hand, then Guts may also be a factor in the laws of causality. Which is kind of what he already said to Guts, where Guts is like a fish that can breach the surface of the water, aka something that can defy fate to a degree. Which it seems Skull Knight considers himself as well. Whatever his ultimate plan to help Guts is, we don't get that now. Instead we see our party, fully equipped, united, and heading to Enoch Village for a very important side quest. And that will do it for now for the Berserk Exposition Extravaganza. Again, a lot of information was given here, and I figured I'd use this episode to put it all into one chunk before going any further. And don't worry, because the next time we're going to get trolls, trolls, and more trolls. Welcome back, everyone, to the Berserk Manga Analysis Series, where I go through the masterpiece that is Kentaro Miura's Berserk, and talk about, analyze, critique, and share my opinions and theories as we make our way through the series. This is all for fun and for good conversation about my favorite manga and fictional series of all time. Honestly, I never expected Berserk to become my favorite. I'm not even a huge fan of the medieval or fantasy genre as a whole. I mean, there are ones that I really like, but it's not my preferred genre. But this particular world, and more in particular, its characters, pulled me in and captivated me in a way that I hadn't been for years. The story of Guts and his journey connected with me on a very primal level, along with this cold, uncaring world that he lives in. His relationship with Casca and every bit of admiration and passion that he feels for her. The story of Griffith and how a man went from nothing to a god, but at the expense of the very men that helped bring him to that point. How someone can recover and press forward after unspeakable trauma, not to mention a big sore that goes swish swish and clang clang. And I bring all this up now because, well, going from the anime to the manga and having all these thoughts and feelings about these characters and the themes that I picked up on, I just really wanted to talk about them. In my real world life, I didn't have anybody that delved into the series to the same extent that I did. Some would call it hyperfixation, which is part of an anxiety disorder, but I like to call it just being a big fan of Berserk. 
I watched the anime movies with a buddy of mine and we both really loved them, but I was the only one diving into the manga. And when it comes to Berserk, it's really hard to explain in a condensed way why I love the story so much. It really takes a lot of conversation to not just have someone see all the gore and nudity and write it off completely as just a male power fantasy with no substance. And with Berserk, nothing could be further from the truth as no man would ever want to trade places with our protagonist, Guts. Guts is an extremely flawed character for one, but also it's a testament to fans of the series that with all we have going on, like a potential apocalyptic event, the thing fans care most about is the reunion between Guts and Casca. But anyway, I mention all this right now because I'm uploading this on October 18th. And that's the day I uploaded my very first Berserk manga analysis video one year ago where I had no idea what I was really doing, I wasn't writing the video out beforehand, and I didn't do any editing, really. I just wanted to talk about Berserk. But regardless, that started my series, and I was determined to keep going with it. Since I couldn't deep dive into Berserk with anyone in my real personal life, I figured I'd put my thoughts of it up on YouTube, and maybe some other people would connect with it. And it kinda happened. When I uploaded that first Berserk video, I had about 350 subscribers on this channel. Now, I have almost 900, and I know that this series is the primary reason for the increase. So first and foremost, thanks for liking them enough to stick around and actually subscribe and want to watch more, and secondly, thanks for giving me the motivation and to keep making them for an entire year. This is the 41st video in the series. Wow. Well, I don't want to keep you guys waiting any longer, so let's get right into it. Somewhere in the Enoch village, we get a brief little taste of the troll infestation in a farmhouse. Vicious, furry little ape-like creatures that just kill, eat, and rape. Eat. Yeah, there's a lot of that. Also, they run in packs. And as the astral world is slowly pouring out into the physical one, this is a new kind of threat for humanity to face. Not to worry, though. Morgan has returned to the town with his Dungeons and Dragons group here to help. No, actually, I've heard people say that this is basically the D&D &D portion of Berserk. And the standard thing to do in D&D &D is, you know, enter a town, find out the problem, usually a monster to slay, and you go do that. And here we have our Guts and Company group basically fulfilling that role. You have Guts as your barbarian for brute strength. Serpico is probably your ranger, using strategy and the environment to his advantage. Shurike is obviously your wizard, using magic and carrying much of wisdom. I guess Isidro is like a bard, maybe, I, I don't know. And Farnese could be a cleric, open to the divine and magic. And we have our elves, Puck and Avalara, as healers, which, by the way, the villagers are able to see them. Puck and Avalara are flying near Farnese and Casca, so the villagers naturally assume that those two women are the witches that Morgan was supposed to bring back to help. But shy little Shiriki, remember this is her first mission ever, and probably first encounter into the public of humanity. She pops out admitting that it's actually her, and the villagers scoff at the idea of a child helping them from this threat. And that's completely understandable. Remember, most things in Berserk, as far as the average person are concerned, are quite grounded. The trolls are one thing, but easier to accept, because they're just kind of like a big animal that's attacking. But the idea of a small little girl defeating them with magic? Well, this isn't a magic girl anime series. To make matters worse, a priest in the village appears on the scene, spouting that not only is it offensive to have a little girl dressed like a witch, but that this group would be useless and pretty much just looks like a band, a band of traveling performers. And yeah, I gotta say Guts' group probably does look a little silly here. Guts on his own looks very intimidating, but surrounded by kids and elves and Casca being out of her mind, it brings down the fear factor a bit. But as we've seen in the Conviction arc, the Holy See religion has a strong hold over most of the land, even in small villages like this one. Farnese contemplates letting the priest know of her connection as a former Holy Iron Chain Knight and the daughter of the prestigious family that she comes from, but Serpico asked her not to as it could lead to the Holy City looking for them. They did kind of just disband from everything and run away. But that, and the priest even mentioning the Holy City, where Farnese and Serpico are from, is definite foreshadowing for things to come. Casca draws notice to herself by stumbling into an open coffin that was being prepared for a funeral. People are, of course, offended and notice the girl has something wrong with her. 
And some quick thinking by Guts has him state that Casca is a devout pilgrim trying to regain her health and that the church is obligated to show charity to such a thing. And of course, this priest that just made a big deal about his religion and what's right and what's wrong would have to oblige, thus giving them a place to stay in the village and then prepare for their next move. In their room, Shirky explains a bit of magic to the group, that by taking a piece of her hair and wrapping it around their fingers, they can enter into what's basically telepathy between each other. The word used here in Berserk is odd. In the most basic sense I can think of, it's basically your spiritual energy, your key, your chakra, whatever you want to call it. Most anime tend to have an energy system that relates to your life or spirit. Odd is just what it's called in the Berserk universe. So basically the hair is attached, their odd is linked, and Shirke is able to communicate with everyone even if they're in different areas. Everyone is okay with this except Isidro, who doesn't feel like Shirke should be leading them as a group. It's really just on his own insecurity leaking out. As he's been trying to be tough and get stronger, and now some little girl, even younger than him, that they just met is leading the charge, and even Guts is cool with that. So Isidro runs out having a teenager moment, and Puck goes with him to provide some commentary. Down by the river, Isidro and Puck are met with Morgan, and Morgan brings up the idea of dreams, something so embedded in the story of Berserk, and how his dream has always been to see the witch Flora again. As a child, he tried to find the witch to help his mother's illness. Lo and behold, he somehow stumbled into a bit of the astroworld and found Flora's tree mansion. Morgan also mentions that she did give him some medicine for his mother, but when he returned, his mother had aged quite a bit, even though the medicine did help. This leads us again to the idea that time moves differently in different layers of the astral world, and makes you wonder how much time passed in the physical world while Guts and everyone were visiting with Flora. And I would assume each layer of the astral world has its own process of time, so it's probably different everywhere you would go. Anyways, as far as Morgan's story is concerned, he feels like he waited his whole life to see Flora again, and Isidro simply thinks that he wasted his life waiting for it. Whereas Isidro sees himself following his dreams in the here and now. While it's true to achieve your dreams, you have to take action and work for them. But we've also seen how a dream can take someone over completely to the point where you lose oneself in the achievement of that dream. What's truly needed is balance. But try explaining that to a 13-year-old desperate to be a fighter. And Guts is even here to overhear most of the conversation. And as Guts was someone forced into combat from a young age, Isidro is simply looking for combat. He just sees the glory and the adrenaline that comes with it, but not the true hardships and tragedy in which Guts has experienced it all. Isidro has so much more to learn than just swordsmanship, but a lot of those lessons can only come from experiencing pain. Then Guts wanders over to Shiriki, who is inspecting a church but being picked on by local village boys. Shiriki explains to Guts how this church, along with many others, were built on top of what used to be shrines to spirits and sacred places. That the Holy See's influence has completely defiled and replaced the old ways of belief and energy. And as deep as I could go with this rabbit hole, I believe I've talked about religion to an extreme amount in the Conviction arc, but even so, it's furthering the idea that truth and religion have always been used as a crux for political power and war. It's always been in the forefront to help convince and sway people to whoever's cause is currently the most prominent. People forget and then never pass down how to get in touch with their own energy, or just embrace and appreciate Earth and all the magic that it has to offer. In Berserk, that's kind of a literal sense, but you could also see that as like a spiritual metaphor. Instead, we are force-fed the ideas of religion and heaven and hell and manipulated by fear of punishment or promise of reward. And religion can be turned into millions of different directions depending on who's in power. And as we've seen with Mazgus and the like, true, full, devout belief in that system can turn people into blind, panic-filled sheep and make the most unjust behavior seem like only the only way to salvation. Shirke sees this and starts to think that people here aren't even worth saving. This is her real first outing into the real physical world. We don't know anything about Shiriki, where she was born, or how she wound up with Flora, but what we do know is that she's been with her for a very long time and isn't used to how people behave in society. Then Guts offers up a worthy response. If you don't want to save them, then don't. Don't do it just because Flora told you. If you feel this way, be true to yourself. Guts isn't being evil or malicious when he says this. He's not actively hoping for the deaths of all these villagers. But what he's saying is, it's not her responsibility to save them. 
Flora asked her to, but she could be free and make up her own mind. Remember Guts and the Black Swordsman arc hating weakness and people that couldn't fight for themselves? And sure, he's made major character development since then, but imagine all the shit that he's been through. His top priority right now is to get Casca to the Elf Island so she'll be safe, and this is just all a detour for him. He's seen the darkest sides of humanity and has become detached from it. Shurke, on the other hand, is experiencing it for the first time. The fear, the distrust, the mob mentality, the stronghold of the Holy See. But she's just been instructed to save them regardless. So she sees Guts' words as ill-mattered and wrong, but it's something to contemplate. For Fernice and Serpico, they are still indoors and Fernice is furthering her part in all this by tending to Casca, tying the hair around her finger as well, even though Casca can't speak. Serpico feels like they shouldn't even be here, but sees how Farnese is finding pleasure in taking care of someone with Casca, and senses true happiness coming from Farnese, so he lets them be. But then there's a shift in the winds, and it seems like the trolls are once again coming down to attack, this time in numbers up to a hundred. So Shurike sends out a telepathic message for all of them to gather, and it works, as the entire party is able to hear her. Serpico, Farnese, and Casca run down a village street, meeting up with Isidro and Puck. A group of trolls appear, and it's Serpico's moment to test out his magical items that he had gotten from Shirake. First, his sword made from a feather containing wind elementals. After a couple of tries, it works just as she described, sending forward a whirlwind and ripping the trolls into pieces, even sending a spear right back to another troll mid-air. The villagers are astonished, of course, as is Serpico himself. Isidro throws some of his concentrated berries, and it does, as well, scatter the trolls as it was described to do. The problem is, the trolls are basically like a horde of zombies would be. Not too hard to kill one-on-one, -on -one, but the problem is just how many attack at once. Serpico and Isidro can't defeat them all where they're at and decide to book it. Casca, of course, falls behind, and it's Farnese that goes back to get her, even willing to wrap herself around Casca to protect her. Serpico is dumbfounded that he's never seen Farnese lay down her life for somebody like that before. Farnese is finding purpose. She has felt useless since leaving the Holy See and joining Guts, and Guts told her to protect Casca, so that's what she's doing. She's determined to have a place in this group, and a reason to be with them. Oh, and then the best part. So everyone is running into the church for sanctuary. Guts, Shirake, and Avalara are all standing outside of it. And the priest tells Guts that no man is a match for these things. And with perfect timing, the trolls arrive, and Guts, with one swing, kills about half a dozen or more of them. The townsfolk collectively shit their pants, and Guts goes to work, barely breaking a sweat, hacking the trolls into pieces. Shirke makes her way to the top of the church for the best possible vantage point, and she wonders that if it's Guts existing in a constant interstice that makes his mind able to affect matter more, thus giving more power to his sword. She spouts down to the villagers that she plans to make a barrier around the church to protect them, but the priest of the village isn't having any of this heresy. He rejects the idea of magic, even witnessing the fighters right in front of his eyes, actively saving them from the trolls. He goes to the roof to confront Shirake, blinded by his own faith, that anything to do with magic is a slight against God, and that all that it will take to save them is faith in God. Similar to Mazga, stating that faith in God will get you through torture. It's a cop-out that will ultimately lead to the villagers' death. Farnese, once being part of this, and rounding up heretics to be burned, relates and sees right through this priest. She sadly even relates it to herself, and how many people she put to death because of faith. She sees herself in this man, to the point of feeling herself to be a hypocrite to even try to refute him. But it's Casca that gives her her encouragement. Not by words, but communication simplistically beyond that. It's as if Casca understands, and the thing is, I kind of believe she does. She doesn't understand the verbal debate that's happening, but she understands Farnese's emotions as opposed to the priests. She understands Farnese has something she needs to do and needs encouragement. I could be wrong here, but I feel that Casca in her current state still has intelligence more in tune with like an animal, a primal understanding of what Farnese is feeling without needing to know the specifics. Gus looks up to see them having the confrontation on the roof and tells Serpico and Isidro to go inside and help them as he handles the trolled horde. Serpico uses his cloak for the first time to jump and glide over a gathering of people to get in front of them to face the trolls that have made their way inside. Isidro tries to fight them as well, but slips up, winding up on the ground. Then the old man Morgan, who is there, throws himself on top of Isidro, taking a hit from a troll's mace. Morgan's fate is unclear at this point, but it does inspire the other villagers to jump in and to begin fighting back as well, instead of just standing there in fear. 
We see some trolls have even climbed up to the roof to give Farnese even more to deal with. Shirke is in a trance-like state that we'll get to in a moment. And the priest is up there to stop her, and now the trolls are on the scene as well. Farnese really steps up to the plate here, pulling out her dagger, ready to defend Casca to the bitter end. We then see Shurike in the astral world. She has done as described before. She has tapped into her astral self and made a luminous body in order to travel the astral world. She searches the vast, seemingly endless landscape, spouting magical chants and asking for help from what she calls the Four Kings, North, South, East, and West, Water, Flame, Earth, and Winds. Whatever this means isn't described just yet, but whatever or whoever she asks for help in the astral world are these four kings. But with her asking, something has appeared to work in her favor. For just then, back in the physical world, a bright light begins to encompass the church. Now, unfortunately, nobody in Guts' party has any Miak to fight these trolls. Trolls! Trolls! Save the kids! Trolls! So instead, Shirake has entered the astral world, and through a magical ritual, she has called upon four kings to help set up a protective barrier around the church. And she was successful. As a bright light swirls within and around the church, and any trolls that were inside, or the ones on the roof, are burned into ashes. And it would seem like it doesn't have an effect on the more pure-like astral creatures like Puck, who begins to feel a power increase of himself. The priest on top of the church that was confronting Shurike and Farnese again calls heresy and won't believe in this power that he sees right before his eyes. When Shurike comes out of her trance and her consciousness is back here in the physical world, she speaks with the priest in what I find to be a very profound moment. She says that the four beings she asked for help in the astral world are the same four guardian angels that are mentioned in the Holy See doctrines and scriptures. The only difference being that the Holy See religion has taken the ancient teachings of these beings' existence and have manipulated it to better suit their own purposes in its own religious narrative. She says the Holy See uses different words to describe them, but they are actually referring to the same supernatural beings. And to split hairs and call them different things based on different religions and to let that divide people is utter nonsense. And this rings true to real life as well. I think about the religions we have in modern times, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, being basically the big three of, in most of the world anyway, all spring from basic Abrahamic lore or mythology. They all have similar aspects but choose to call them different things and worship in different ways. There could be a more fundamental truth beneath it all, but most would choose just to follow their own specific methods rather than seeing the connecting threads. A lot of it essentially tells the same story and shares the same ideas, but we swap out the names and places of gods, messiahs, and holy lands. Now, I don't want to delve any deeper into the real-life applications of what Shirke is saying here. I'll leave that for you to speculate on your own. But I, like I said, I find it to be incredibly profound and truthful. Also, relating to Berserk, what could be the implications of there being four guardian angels that actually exist in the astral world and what's been happening in the story so far? We know that deep belief in something can influence your own mind to the point where you physically cannot see astral beings. We also know there is now positive astral beings like these four guardians and evil astral beings like the trolls. Or I guess you could say maybe they're neutral. But one's own belief in such things helps give them the power to even exist. So the Holy See's influence could be a giant conspiracy set forth by something to make humanity as a whole not believe in astral beings, thus losing their ability to get in touch with the positive forces that could provide such miracles as this protection spell. What if something that was created deep in the astral world that could, oh, I don't know, have the ability to influence the idea of man and history as we know it and set forth into motion the entire idea of the Holy See religion and take over a spiritual way of magic to weaken mankind as a whole and make it easier for them to influence and control so that one day they could send a savior to earth for people to rally behind and lead them into some inexplicable outcome. Not only that, but take a look again at the four guardian angels mentioned by Shirake that she also states are mentioned in the Holy See scriptures. And remember, before Griffith ascended, we had four god hand members. Could it not be conceivable that the people would easily confuse four guardians for the four god hand and not know the difference? After all, they are all beings from the astral world. Let me take you back to the scene in the Golden Age arc when Guts and the Band of the Hawk were on their way to rescue Griffith from the dungeon. On the way, they were led by Princess Charlotte, who informed them that the dungeon led down to the deep ruins of a former city that was formed by a man named King Geyseric, who was said to have brought all the nations together under one. Now first, it was said that he did this after a bunch of separate city-states were all at war and while a plague was happening and the population was failing. Does that not sound almost exactly like what is happening now? 
We've seen warring nations with Midland, Shooter, and now the Kushan Empire. We've seen that the plague is on the rise as well. And a king that appeared from nowhere to unite the people. Hmm. On top of that, Charlotte informed them that five angels came down to punish King Geyserich for living in such extravagance. And there was a confusion as Casca asked that she thought the legend said that there were four angels. We were led to think back in the Golden Age that the God Hands were the ones that were being referred to in the legend. But now it seems more likely that the, actually the four angels that Shirake speaks of are the same ones that Charlotte had mentioned that destroyed Geyserk City by lightning, by earthquake, and elemental means. What does that mean actually happened in that city 1,000 years ago? And it seems as though history is now repeating itself. Does this give more credibility that Skull Knight could have been a former God Hand member just as Griffith is now? If, if Geyserick is Skull Knight, which is still unconfirmed but seems relatively obvious, then why would Geyserick be attacked by the four elemental angels? I don't know. It's a lot to process. Also, back in the Golden Age scene, we do see dead bodies with the brand of sacrifice on their foreheads. But why on their foreheads specifically? When the band of the Hawk all got branded in the Eclipse, their brands were random, landing wherever they happened to. But anyway, I should probably just get back to the story. The point is, number one, the Holy See could have been deliberately created to weaken mankind's connection with the Astroworld. Number two, the four God Hand members before Griffith joined could easily be confused for four elemental kings by anyone who doesn't know the difference. And three, King Geyserich City was destroyed by the elemental kings, which means Skull Knight doesn't have as heroic a history as his present day self projects himself to be. Perhaps he had a change of heart along the way. If you want me to get more in-depth on Skull Knight and everything I think about what happened to him and King Geyserich and his empire, you can watch my Skull Knight video, Everything That We Know So Far, I posted a couple of days ago. I go a lot more in detail in that one, but I do cover spoilers up to the most current chapters. Anyway, here's a big ogre that shows up. A staple of the fantasy genre, usually depicted as a giant that will eat you. And Miura, of course, gives it a very phallic-looking head. It, too, has seeped out of the astral world into the physical. Luckily, since Shirake put up her barrier, it can't get near the church. But it can throw shit at the church, and since physical objects are not evil creatures from the astral world, they can still damage as a projectile. Shirake speaks telepathically to the group, saying that she needs them to buy time for her to cast another spell. And without hesitation, Guts just says, Understood, boss. And I love that moment. Just of Guts accepting what he needs to do and putting his faith and encouragement into Shirake like this, he trusts her. Shirke doesn't actually expect him to take on the ogre by himself, but this is her first time seeing Guts in action, and as Puck states, he's kind of used to this sort of thing. And Guts makes a fool of this ogre. Only problem is the ogre has the ability to reattach its limbs after they are cut off. And to make matters worse, shooting literal blasts of water from its mouth is this thing that looks like a cross between a frog and a horse. Yeah, remember when I said Berserk was doubling and tripling down on the fantasy genre in this arc? Well, here it is. And this is called a Kelpie. It comes from Scottish mythology and is described as a shape-shifting water spirit, but usually appears itself as a horse. It seemed to appear with the rain, and it's said that it will be at the height of its power because of this. Seeing this, Serpico actually decides to jump down and help Guts. He tells Shirake to prepare the spell and encourages Farnese to continue protecting Casca, as he knows it's important to her. Serpico jumps down from the top of the church with his magic cloak embedded with wind elementals to slow his fall, so he's able to land gracefully. Upon landing, stating to himself that he was unable to ever set Farnese free, but he sees that she is now becoming free, becoming her true self by her new involvement with this group, and finding a mission of her own. So we have our boys side by side ready to face the monsters. Serpico opts to fight the Kelpie so Guts can continue with the ogre. And Serpico's fight here is pretty great, actually. The fact that he's become so in tune with his magical item in such a short time just shows what a skilled warrior he is and his level of concentration on the battlefield. The Kelpie can control water and uses its abundance around them to engulf Serpico and try to drown him. But his cloak and sword handling is able to continue to push whirlwinds around him and around the Kelpie, getting several great blows in on the creature including a sword piercing from the bottom of its jaw out through its eye. But Serpico as well gets an injury being knocked back onto a troll mace. Still, he manages to get back up, and him and Guts both continue to hack away at their opponents. But back on the roof of the church, Shurike has re-entered the astral world, finding what the sacred place was that this church was built on top of, home of water elementals, and she is able to contact a water spirit and 
surrender her body to it. Now I guess this is not one of the four angels previously mentioned that deal with the elements, but just a spirit of the water. Whatever the case, Shirke is able to have this spirit basically channel its power through her, calling the river nearby to overflow, and the river heads towards the village specifically to rid it of evil. And so it does. Water rages and crashes into Enoch Village, engulfing the trolls, ogre, and kelpie, and flowing them away. But not before Guts and Serpico get their respective final blows, cutting off their monsters' heads. Now you may be thinking, isn't Shirake's magic here a little too OP? Well, yes and no. See, I think it definitely can be, but there's a price to be paid. See, because of the extent of the spell, Shirake becomes mesmerized and her mind and soul, or whatever you want to call it, is still in the Astro world at this time. She needs to be brought back to end the spell. And as she gets more experience, this may not happen, but still, being an apprentice, she could be trapped here and her body would remain in a paralyzed-like state. Her ethereal self seems to be as if it's merging with the elemental spirits, kind of like becoming a collective consciousness, which is what I'm always talking about. Evalora is actually useful here, and enjoy that because it's rare, and she tells Farnese to tap Shirake's staff in a way to snap her mind out of it so that she can return to her physical body. She does, and it's about to be successful, but with the water still raging below, Farnese bumps into Casca, knocking her off the roof, and with trying to save her, both girls wind up falling into the rapids. Guts barely holding on himself to not get washed away, desperately reaches out to the two of them, but misses. And in her last moments of being able to control the spell, Shirke sends a tree trunk down the current of the water for them to grab onto. But even so, Casca and Farnese are still washed away. After she is actually able to end the spell, well, at least the villagers are happy about being saved. Not sure how many homes would have been destroyed in that quick flood, but I suppose instead of getting eaten or raped by trolls, this is probably the better outcome. I always liked how Guts encourages Shurike that she did a great job, and to not be tense as she tries to locate the missing girls by sensing their odd. Guts the mentor here, first training Isidro and now giving Shurike a pep talk. It's just fantastic, I love it. What's not to love, though, is when she does pick up their presence, and she can see where the two of them are. Still on the log, but it's being carried away by a pack of trolls. After the battle with the trolls in Enoch Village is an extremely rare moment in Berserk where I actually feel a little bit of restored faith in humanity. The villagers seem completely forgiving about many of their homes being destroyed in the flood that Shirake caused, and instead, they praise and thank her for helping them, and a few even admire to be just like her. Shirake again explains that the power wasn't hers exactly, but from the four guardian angels that she channeled through her body, and that those angels are the same ones that are worshipped in the Holy See, just done in different ways. Once again, showing how different faiths and religions can have different languages to talk about the same things. And if we look past the differences in faiths that people kill each other over, we could maybe see that we are all trying to talk about the same things. Shirke even gives the local priest some praise, and he, as well, humbles himself in front of her, having opened his mind more due to this experience. And seriously, this is so rare for this story. All this love and acceptance is such a breath of fresh air, especially compared to the darker aspects of religion we went through in the Conviction arc. Then we are given another moment between Isidro and Morgan. Isidro feeling upset that he contributed practically nothing to this battle after seeing how amazing Guts and Serpico and Shurike performed. And Morgan hands him a small sword and admits that the real reason he wound up in the forest meeting Flora when he was a kid was because he ran away from everything here in the village. He's trying to encourage Isidro, in a way, to pursue his dream, to make sure he didn't run away just to run away, and that he started his quest for a purpose, to which Isidro is adamant that he has and gladly accepts the new weapon. He then goes to meet up with the others, and we see Serpico is out for the count, having fallen on a mace during his battle with the Kelpie. Being in the newly enchanted church should heal his wounds, but they don't really have time to wait, because Farnese and Casca have been abducted by trolls, and as we will see in a moment, this really calls for some urgency. The biggest moment here is Serpico trusting Guts to protect Farnese in his absence. Guts was someone Serpico just a few days ago in story time said that he wanted to kill, but this event serves to unify them, at least to a place of mutual respect as fighters, and Serpico knows Guts is capable enough. So Guts, Shirke, the elves, and Isidro, who is just happy to be invited along, all head out to find the girls. As the crew head off into the forest and caves outside the village, they notice that things start to look stranger and stranger as they go. We get a subtle hint that Miura is taking them to a whoa! Look at this. Oh. My. God. Suddenly, 
before their eyes as the most beautiful and powerful creature to ever grace the pages of any manga. Behold, our one true God, the Savior, the Lord, Schnaz. Schnaz could be the most powerful being in all of existence. Schnaz could even be above the God Hand. Perhaps the idea of Evil Chapter was rendered non-canon because Miura decided to have Schnaz be the ultimate god of the Berserk universe. Schnaz could defeat Guts with a single gaze. But luckily for them, Schnaz has better things to do, and he leaves the group B. That was a close one. But what Schnaz did indicate was that the group had once again made their way into a piece of the Astro World. Welcome to Klipoth. The word Klipoth is Jewish in origin and basically means a culmination of darkness and evil. In the story, it is the area of the astral world created by the deep subconscious fears of mankind, a place that draws in dark creatures like the trolls, ogres, and then some, and willed into existence thanks to a collective fear mankind has of such things. Though Shirake wonders how it could be manifesting here in the physical world and what that could mean. And it draws to the very beginning of this arc where it was stated that the world was beginning to change. The astral world is slowly leaking into the physical world and it all started once Griffith was reborn into this world. Regardless, the group can't stop here, so they head further into Klipoth to a small portal looking tunnel that takes them to the troll's den. Here Shirake is able to pick up on Casca and Farnese's odd and speaks to them telepathically. They are in a dark and scary looking part of the den filled with monstrous little creatures and dead bodies. Shirke assures them that their enchanted silver shirt should protect them, but Farnese is still fending off little monsters with her dagger, trying to make sure Casca is safe, fully taking the role of her protector. But then, they notice what's happening right next to them. Basically a goddamn troll orgy. All the female villagers they took, well, the trolls have decided to fulfill their primal desires and rape them. It's di as disgusting as you might think, but that's not the worst part. The worst part is that they can actually impregnate the human girls, but as Casca and Farnese see rape before their eyes, the infantile trolls literally rip their way out of their human host, out of the mother's stomach like an alien, and come out as a conjoined, mutilated abomination of all that is holy. Kentaro Miura, what the fuck? Well, the trolls notice the girls and close in on them next. Farnese again takes out her dagger and desperately swings it around trying to fight back. Thing is, she's doing it for Casca and not for herself, and she even states this, that she's been entrusted with Casca and can't let anything happen to her. Entrusted by guts and wants to impress him or make him proud, and it's pushing her past her own fear. Luckily, soon after, Guts appears on the scene, plunging multiple arrows into the trolls from his attachment on his false arm. And Farnese shows how happy she is, not just to be rescued, but just to see Guts. Unlike Casca, who is still fearful of him. What's shown also is a hint that Farnese may have more than just an admiration for Guts, but what I consider to be a full-on crush. And hell, I can't even blame her. Look at this man. Anyway, the crew all get together and help what girls are left alive and the children that were taken by the trolls and lead them out of the den. Guts decides to be the one to stay back and face the trolls so that they can escape. And Guts truly takes on a leadership role here with his new group, first making the sacrifice play to stay behind, but also giving both Farnese and Isidro words of encouragement and gratitude. Something truly needed to be heard by both of them. Farnese wanted to know she didn't screw up this time, and Isidro needed to know he's worthy of even being here. And Farnese notes how Casca, the kind of weak person she oppressed as the Holy Sea Knight, now may be the key to saving her and awakening who Farnese truly is inside. But as his group leaves to help the villagers out, Guts taps back into his black swordsman grin, that of bloodlust and pure joy of killing evil creatures. That aspect of him has not left, and having free reign to attack the trolls with no one else around gives him a perfect opportunity to unleash his own darkness. Not to mention, just look at this POV shot of Guts firing his arrows. It looks like it should be in a video game. Guts then pulls out his Dragon Slayer sword and goes to work, even noting that he hasn't felt this free in battle since his 100-man fight back in the Golden Age. Only this time, the 100 opponents are monsters who are even more worthy of killing. While Guts is doing that, his party makes their way back through the Klipoth mess and sense a giant force of energy running by them, but don't see anything. And then back in the den, now drenched with the blood of 100 or more trolls, Guts has a few scrapes and is deep into his rage, but then he feels a pulse of energy as well. His brand, despite being covered by a protective seal Shirake put on it, begins to bleed. Not only that, 
but something in Guts' satchel is moving, and it's the bala that he carries with him. The face on the bala just about lined up correctly, which we know is not good. When the face on the bala lines up right and screams out, it will take you to the god hand themselves. Then the troll guts and innards splattered all over the ground begin to form together and take a shape. First, into the evilest titties you will ever see in your life, and from those titties, the rest of the body of the God Hand member slan. Now, since the God Hand reside in a very deep part of the Astral World, in order to move up into the physical, they need to create a body from something. So, just as was shown briefly in the Conviction arc when a swarm of rats took the shape of the God Hand member Conrad, or Slan herself being seen in the form of fire during the Heretic Orgy in the Conviction arc as well, or even Griffith himself being born again to the physical world, so in order to be here and see Guts face to face, Slan has sent her essence to Klipoth and used the dead innards of trolls to create her corporeal body. As sexy as she may be, remember guys, she's made of literal guts here. Yeah, I know most of you don't care and would still tap it if she let you. Me too. Guts attempts to attack her immediately, but with one glare is stopped and falls into the pool of blood and troll innards. Slan picks him up and wraps him comfortably in her arms, and she taunts him to release all of his anger and negative energy. Which again I think leads into how evil beings in the God Hand become stronger to begin with. They manifest around negativity and collective desire. Part of the incarnation ceremony to bring Griffith back dealt with the mass collection of negativity from the fearful and damaged people as well as the lost souls of that area. They all called out for a savior. Slan mentions feeling Guts' presence when he was in a heightened state of rage, fear, and sadness. Telling him his soul is fitting for Klipoth, which she calls her domain. She then slashes his front and back, effectively cutting him and ripping off his black swordsman armor. And this is a big deal. I mean, the slash is a big deal, yeah, but we'll get to that later. But I'm talking about the armor. Guts has worn the black swordsman armor for so long now, and this is the final moment of it. As it's my favorite design for Guts, I'm really saddened to see it go. I know we're about to get to THE armor soon, but design-wise, the Black Swordsman armor was always my favorite and the GOAT, in my opinion. Slan also taunts Guts to use the Bela and to make a sacrifice just as Griffith did. Some interpret this to mean that the Bela is fated for Guts since Slan herself is telling Guts to use it, but I feel like this is more of a verbal torment slash insulting thing rather than literal. Also, a bailet will activate on its own when its fated one is in complete despair. It's not as if you can force the bailet to activate for you, it just will. At least that's how we've seen it work thus far. But interrupting their conversation is the one and the only Mr. Skull Knight. Slan then addresses him as Your Majesty, perhaps alluding more to the Skull Knight King Geyseric connection, but again, it could just be an insult as well. But then Skull Daddy comes back at her with the most badass diss in the entire manga. This is how you know what a boss Skull Knight is. He straight up calls a god hand to her face, a whore princess of the uterine sea. You have the right to remain <laughs> Slan then confirms that the physical and astral worlds are beginning to overlap now with the emergence of the fifth god hand, and then summons several ogres from the depths of Klipoth to attack the Skull Knight. He rips through them like butter, which is awesome, all while Slan talks about this place being like her womb and that she can birth as many of these monsters as she wants. And speaking of womb, Guts has now placed his arm cannon up against where her womb would literally be and blows a gigantic hole through that bitch's intestine-made body. Meanwhile, with the escaping party, Shirke decides she has to close the entrance to the troll den or else they will keep coming. This would mean Guts would need to make it out before she could complete the spell. As well, while she enters into the astral world to ask for the power to do so, she will also be in a trance-like state, basically leaving just Isidro to protect them in the meantime. So it's his time to overcome his fear and inadequacy and use Guts' training advice that he needs to come up with his own style that suits him as a fighter. Using his size and ability, and so now armed with two weapons, the enchanted fire dagger and the sword given to him by Morgan, he uses both to take down a big troll that's actually using a crossbow. It's a good moment for him. I still don't care for him as a character, but it's good storytelling for Miura to let it unfold like this and to have him develop his own technique. I appreciate it. Meanwhile, Shirake has again asked to borrow power from a spirit, but instead of water this time, it's of the earth. And she basically channels it to rot the trolls to death, which is pretty brutal. Back in the den, Slan marvels at Guts' attack, seemingly enjoying it. 
The Skull Knight gives Guts encouragement, assuring him that his sword does have the power to attack her and to not be fearful. As hinted before, we've heard Shirkus say that Guts' Dragon Slayer sword felt like it had some enchantment to it. But how? By striking down as many evil astral creatures as Guts has, and with Guts' own faith in his weapon and belief that it can cut down these evil beings, has literally willed into existence the extra power into the sword. Just as evil beings of Klipoth exist being willed into it by the dark thoughts of mankind, and how I believe that Griffith's power grows from the belief of his followers. That energy has literal strength and can direct focus and desire into force. So Guts runs her through with his sword, and again, she seemingly enjoys it, perhaps being excited or turned on by Guts' own determination to fight back, perhaps seeing him growing more and more as a worthy opponent, something a god hand would rarely have. She even gives Guts a kiss on the mouth before her body falls back apart into the dozens of troll innards it was made out of. Now, did Guts' attack force her spirit out of the vessel of innards, or did she leave on her own accord? It's up to us to speculate, but as usual, I'd say it's probably a bit of both. After she's driven away, the entire domain begins to sort of cave in upon itself, with everything, including the trolls and ogres, starting to melt into one another. A sort of side effect from the God Hand member forcing her way to another area of the astral world. But with it collapsing, Guts and Skull Knight are all that remain, and realizing the only opening to escape has now been closed off, well, Skull Daddy has the perfect plan. An untested one, but there's no time to second guess it now. He takes his sword and shoves the blade down his mouth, to which I find is absolutely hysterical that Guts tells him now is not the time for magic tricks. You know, that like, performing sword swallowers. Like, does Guts actually think Skull Knight's side profession is sword swallower? Like, it's just really, really funny. Maybe that's why he's not around all the time. So we have very subtly seen the Skull Knight collecting and swallowing Baylets as he's found them. I believe the first time was after the Rosine battle in the aftermath of the Misty Valley. So Skull Knight has been gestating these Baylets for a purpose, and when he pulls the sword back out of his mouth, the entire blade has the appearance of many Baylets all combined together with the hilt of the sword wrapped around like thorns. He calls this the Sword of Actuation, or as it's simplistically referred to as, the Baylet Sword. And this thing is pretty crazy. So, a single Baylet has the power to transport people to a deep layer of the astral world, in a way, taking you to another dimension. The sword basically has the ability to use the power of the Baylets and slice a hole into reality itself and enable you to travel between worlds or layers of worlds. In essence, it's a dimension-cutting sword. And I really hope some of you are Yu Yu Hakusho fans out there because Kuwabara was my favorite character and he received a very similar ability where his spirit sword became the Jigen To and he was able to slice through dimensions and territories and into the demon world. That's the first thing I thought of anyway when I read this. But Skull Knight even casually mentions the sword's intentions. To entomb the God Hand into the Vortex of Souls, the deepest layer of the astral world, the Abyss. If he could cut through the layers of the astral world with the sword and create a direct portal to the abyss and trap the god hand there to swirl with the vortex of souls for all eternity, the vortex of souls being like the hell or whatever you want to call it in the berserk universe. And we know that's where apostles get pulled into once they die, and it's seemingly a place from where there's no escape. But there's no real information how many times he can use the sword of actuation, or if it needs to recharge, or anything about the specifics. Here we just learn what its intentions are, and right now it needs to be used before Skull Knight and Guts are trapped in Clipoff. So with a swing, a tear in reality is formed, a portal, leading directly to the Vortex of Souls, and it begins pulling in all of the trolls and ogres. Seems to work just as Skull Knight expected. With a second strike, he and Guts are taken back into the physical world, just behind Guts' comrades. Guts tries to ask the Skull Knight why he was there in the first place, which is a really good question. Perhaps he just sensed the God Hand Slan rising and came to confront her, but we don't really get an answer, of course. And Skull Knight seems to disappear into the darkness, which I assume is because he's still an astral being, and since we're going back to a complete physical world in the daylight, he just kind of vanishes. That's my understanding of it anyway. But it appears now, thanks to Skull Knight's sword, Klipoth has been all sucked away from the physical world, and the forest has returned to normal. So the crew make their way back to the village, and upon doing so, Serpico is excited to see Farnese alive and well. And this is done without dialogue, and we get a quiet moment of Guts trailing behind everyone, but looking forward to see their joy. To see them smile and bicker and joke around, a light-hearted exhale after a hard battle. 
and Guts remembers his days in the band of the Hawk, his companions that he lost. We see Judo, Pippin, Corcus, Rickert, and how Casca and Griffith used to look. It's a somber moment, and it's been a bit since we've specifically seen Guts think about them. But then it cuts to Guts' new party once again, and Guts acknowledging to himself, even though he didn't plan it, and didn't even want it, he has stumbled into a new crew of companions beginning to form bonds just as strong as the classic Band of the Hawk, a group that he is now essentially the leader of, one who has just completed a dangerous mission with a job well done. Clearly this segment of the story was meant to bring the new characters closer together and expand Guts' character into a team player once again, but also that he is the glue that holds them together. He's as important to this new group now as Griffith was to the original Hawks. And this is only meant to be the beginning, I understand. But as Guts left the Hawks once to find a dream, he threw everything away that was truly important to him. Now with this new companion group forming, we can almost with 100% certainty say, if something just as special is here, Guts will never again walk away from it. Olaf, Berserker. Come on, man, Berserker. Come on, Berserker. Girls think sexy. Uh, uh, I love for you is ticking clock bell Zaka. Would you like to suck my cock bell Zaka? That's beautiful, man. And so the time has come. Let's set the stage, shall we? Guts and Company, sent on a mission by the Witch Flora to save Enoch Village from a troll invasion. Trolls seeping into the physical world as the barriers between the astral and physical grow weaker. In exchange for saving the village, they were promised a charm to be placed over their brand of sacrifice, so that Guts and Casca both have its effects weakened, and they bring less demonic energy towards them as they make their journey to Puck's elf homeland, Elfhelm. Meanwhile, Griffith has been rebuilding a new band of the Hawk, this time with many apostles as part of its infantry, and waging retaliation against the Kushan Empire, who have been trying to overtake all of Midland. As Guts and his party have completed their mission, they head back to Flora's tree mansion. There, before they arrive, Flora places a talisman on a piece of armor while speaking to someone she calls an old friend once more. And it is, of course, the Skull Knight, who very recently aided Guts in escaping Clipoth. He's already made his way back to Flora's. I think Skull Knight can kind of make his way through the astral world easily since Flora's mansion exists in the astral world. He just kind of zipped over there from Clipoth where he seemingly disappeared. Before them is some kind of armor, covered mostly in shadow at this point, but both of them speak about how they can't believe that they would need to drag this item out once more and how it harbors much danger. But necessary danger, as they both intend to give it to Guts and his party to aid them on their journey. The best piece of information is Flora mentioning the similarities between her and Skull Knight with Guts' party is karmic. Karma is actually defined from Hinduism and Buddhism as the sum of a person's actions in this and previous states of existence viewed as deciding their fates in future existences. But she amends this definition by saying that this time it's more of a spiral than a circle. The idea that yes, history will repeat itself, but each time it's a little bit different, and a little bit different, and a little bit different dealing with the idea of fate versus free will. There is a pattern that life in the universe will follow, but actions and decisions we make in that life changes it ever so slightly. And here it's that Flora takes comfort in that Guts' group will not end up the same way as her and the Skull Knight have. What that means is up for debate, Although Flora seems to have turned out okay, her past could be a rocky and questionable one, and whatever resulted in Skull Knight's current form and existence certainly wasn't the ideal regardless of how powerful he is. But then the two of them sense something dark coming into the barrier around Flora's home. Skull Knight jumps down onto his skull horse, implying that he will defend Flora even if she feels as though her time is short. Once more she calls him old friend, and I know deep down I don't really want it or need it, but this moment really makes me wish I would see a prequel manga of these two, at least just like one chapter. As Skull Knight stares down the oncoming enemies, it is revealed that they must have been sent from Griffith himself, as appearing behind them is the manly chest of the one and only motherfucking Zod! As Gus's group heads back to Flora's, they continue to praise Shuriki, but all of her thoughts are directed at herself negatively. She knows she didn't close off Clipoth to the physical world, that was Skull Knight's doing, and she recounts the extra damage she caused to the village in washing away the trolls. Nevertheless, everyone assures her that she did a great job, including Farnese grabbing her hand and saying how moved she was by it. It's a cute and relatable moment as Shurike shows off her low self-esteem and uncertainty in her abilities. She's the most knowledgeable and arguably the most powerful one among them, yet she constantly doubts herself. And interrupting that is Guts, who has been walking in the back of the group as he suddenly faints. 
double checking the wound, Shurike is able to see that it is not actually his physical body that is damaged as much as his ethereal self. As stated before, your ethereal body is basically like your soul, how you would exist in the astral world. When Shurike goes into the astral world, she takes control of her ethereal self, and apparently when Slan slashed Guts and Clip off, she slashed into his physical and ethereal body simultaneously. Whether this happened simply because she's a god hand and is that powerful, or if it happened because they were in the astral world at the time, I'm not sure. But this will steadily debilitate Guts, unless it is healed. But Guts gets back up, saying that he's just fine and continues to walk. The only one who really understands this kind of damage is Shirake, and she knows instantly that trolls wouldn't be strong enough to inflict that kind of damage. But thanks to their telepathic bond, Guts communicates only to Shirake, and tells her that he kicked the ass of someone pretending to be an angel. Shirake quickly puts it together and knows that Guts came face to face with a god hand, and she's shocked that Guts could even survive such an encounter. But this moment also got me thinking. Guts didn't tell anyone about his encounter with Slan and Skull Knight, and at this moment, most of Guts' party doesn't even know what the God Hand is. Farnese, Serpico, and Isidro have literally no idea about the God Hand, Griffith, or Guts' history in the Band of the Hawk at this point in the story. Hell, up until a few days ago, they didn't even know what the brand of sacrifice actually did. Puck is aware, having heard Guts tell the story to Rickard at the beginning of this arc, and Avalara might know who the God Hand are just from hanging around Shurike and Flora, but that's about it. And Casca, well, you know, she doesn't really count right now. But then Shurike senses a bad flow of odd coming from their destination, and she notices the barrier separating the mansion from the physical world is completely gone. As the group run closer, they see Flora's mansion engulfed in flames. As Shurike, Serpico, Isidro, and Puck rush to the mansion itself, Gut stays outside to see what group of soldiers are before him. They are all apostles, with very specific armor to go with each of their features, so Griffith must go all out for his followers, even now. But Guts takes the initiative, as always, and strikes at one of them despite his injuries and despite his weakened state from Slan's earlier attack. But the Apostle throws him off of him and then comes in for his own strike, only to be blocked by the Skull Knight who has already left a plethora of Apostle dead bodies in his wake. You know, we've seen Guts take down Apostles plenty of times now, but it's never without significant injury and without Puck's healing abilities. Guts would have been out for the count long before now if not for Puck. And this is the first time since the Eclipse that Guts is facing multiple Apostles at the same time. And Guts is at an extreme disadvantage with the previously mentioned wounds, and he has no armor! But Skull Knight is always in top form, and he burns the Apostles by saying that he has no desire to give his name to mere Apostles. Mere? Apostles are powerful as all get out, but Skull Knight can just talk down and slash through them like fodder. Some of the Apostles actually recognize Skull Knight. In fact, from the Eclipse Ceremony when he broke in and attacked Void. Then they recognize Guts as well, calling him their Master's Sacrifice. And it is all but confirmed that these Apostles are here because of Griffith when Zod steps forward. But Zod said that he's surprised to run into them, meaning they were not sent here to stop or defeat our protagonists. They were sent here for a different purpose. Remember, Griffith could have killed Guts back at the Hill of Swords, but chose not to. Guts and his party are inconsequential to Griffith and his plans now. So these Apostles are here for a different purpose that us as the reader are not aware of just yet. But then another famous Apostle steps forward, Grunbeld, who dwarfs even Zod with his massive size. He's just a massive, massive man. He states that coming here to kill Flora wasn't worthy enough of a warrior like him to show his skills. He seems to be similar in Zod that way. And instead, he wishes to challenge the Black Swordsman to combat in the name of the Band of the Hawk, which triggers and sends chills down Guts' spine. That Griffith, that son of a bitch, is using the same name that represented his former comrades in a new band filled with monsters. The very same monsters that killed and ate his original band. Then inside the burning mansion, Shurike cannot find Flora, but she says that she can't even focus to cast a spell. But Flora herself speaks to Shurike telepathically to tell her two important things. One is to get that armor to the Black Swordsman, and two, Flora says that it is her time to die, and that she accepts this, that it's her time. Shurike, of course, bursts out into tears as her teacher and only adult in her life, who I'm assuming practically raised her all, the, all along, is about to die. It's heartbreaking, especially when you remember Shurike is only like 12 years old. Despite how powerful she is, she's still just a child. And now, just as many other characters in the story of Berserk, she is being forced to grow up much faster than she should have to. She didn't even join Guts' group by choice, but by Flora's own wishes. It's not like she's out here determined for adventure like Isidro, or just looking for answers like Farnese. 
niece. She's been thrust into this unexpectedly, and the last thing she thought when she left with them is that she'd come back to her mistress dying in a fire surrounded by monsters and demons. Outside, just one swing from Grunbeld sends Guts flying backwards. Guts can only block with a sword, and he's armorless. Any strike he tries to give, Grunbeld easily blocks with his massive shield, knocking Guts down again and slamming him with his warhammer down on Guts' sword, blocking his chest. It cracks a few of Guts' ribs and reopens the physical wound on his chest given to him by Slan. Meanwhile, I love how this random apostle is like, okay, let's go get the witch, and Skull Knight just slices his head off like nothing. That's just great. But then Zod turns to him, vowing to fight him once more while the other apostles complete their mission. Now this is the third time that we are about to have Skull Knight and Zod clash in the series. The first time was outside the gateway to the Eclipse and we never got to see it. The second time was during the Incarnation Ceremony and we never got to see it. Now, third time's a charm. They're squaring up. Let's turn the page and see this epic battle. God damn it! More apostles bust inside the mansion, and Shuriken and Serpico manage to engulf one of them in flames before running from it. Which was smart. I don't think Serpico, is as skilled as he is, could beat an apostle at this point on his own. They head underground into Flora's treasure chamber to find the armor. We see it here for the first time, not in shadow, just dark and heavy looking, with a skull-like helmet on it. Mm-hmm. Overall, as cool as this armor turns out to be, I think design-wise, it is kind of bland and basic. It's just really heavy and black. I mean, I'm always going to miss the Black Swordsman armor. That was my favorite uh, look for Guts throughout the series, so yeah. But Grunbell just continues to assault Guts, stepping on him and saying that he's not even worthy to be his opponent on the battlefield. All of it is enraging because he's treating Guts like some, some kind of pathetic person, and we've seen everything Guts has to go through. How much Guts has struggled and fought and shown his strength and bravery throughout all this time, and now Grunbattle is just treating him like he's some kind of pathetic person that he can just throw to the wayside. But anyway, Grunbeld kicks Guts away and tries to finish him off from firing a cannonball out of his shield. It's blocked, however, by one of the Golem Guards. Basically, they're the gatekeepers for intruders for Fuller's mansion, and she has commanded them to protect her mansion. Easy to destroy, but unless you crush the small talisman inside of them, they'll just keep regenerating. So as Grunbeld smashes his way through the Golem, Shurike lets Guts know where to go, and he crawls to an outside entrance to the treasure room, meeting up with the others. He's torn up and they wonder what the point is of even putting armor on a man that can't even stand up straight. But in this great moment, Guts grabs Shurike's hand and without any dialogue and just a look, he's saying, it's okay. Whatever it is, he trusts her. He trusts Flora. He doesn't want her to put the responsibility all on herself. That she's done enough. He's like, let me take it from here. And this is just such a beautiful moment of Guts accepting his duty and his role in the group, but as well as just with a look showing Shurike just how important her contribution was. And that it's okay for her to, you know, metaphorically put her staff down now and let Guts handle it from here. It's just showing that he's becoming more and more of a team player and trusting and becoming one with his companions, something that he hasn't done in over two years now. It's just so great to see, and the fact that Miura can just translate all of that with just one image is just really beautiful. And so the three of them scramble to put on all the pieces of the armor around Guts' body, as another apostle is currently trying to bust down the door. And then, Guts stands up. We cut to Grunbeld looking for Guts outside and seeing an apostle running towards him in terror, who is then effectively slashed into pieces. And we see Guts in the dark armor with the skull helmet standing as if at full strength. Another apostle jumps towards him and is dismantled and disemboweled within seconds. This enchanted armor, whatever it is, has given Guts a gigantic boost of power. But what is it? Well, none other than Zod himself recognizes the armor. He asks Skull Knight if he plans to have Guts follow them down the same destructive path that he went, implying Skull Knight was the previous owner of the armor, explaining the Skull Helmet and that Zod at one point in time must have fought Skull Knight in this armor. From Guts' perspective, he notes that his pain has vanished. He no longer feels it. Instead, he feels a surging rage, a primal impulse. Something inside him is tapping into the darkest recesses of his mind and body, pulling to the surface that which he has been trying to suppress all this time. The Beast of Darkness has awakened. With that, the armor itself shifts and changes as if it was alive. The helmet will no longer take the shape of a skull, for it has a new owner now. And Guts' Beast of Darkness has always been represented by a wolf. 
The entire helmet of the armor now takes on the shape of just that. And I don't know if it's just me, but I was thinking about the wolf being representation of Guts like a uh, spirit animal. Like, do you remember Guts' childhood backstory of the Golden Age arc where he encountered a group of wolves under the full moon and he had to fend them all off himself? He was only like 11 at the time. Also paralleling his current battle, he was also heavily wounded with broken ribs back then. Before the wolves attack, Guts said that it's over. He was giving up and accepting his fate that he was to die. But as a wolf jumped him, he instinctively brought his sword up to defend himself. It was like something deep within him, even as a child, took over. This will to fight and survive no matter what. Perhaps that draws some connections to wolves, as it was the first enemy he faced completely on his own. That rage and that sense of fighting and battle all symbolized by wolves. The Beast of Darkness first appeared in the Conviction arc, and as I've stated many times, it's not a literal beast, spirit, or monster. The Beast of Darkness is Guts, a deep primal part of him, and one that houses the darkest aspects of his personality. All the dark thoughts that don't align with his heart, but still exist whatever due to trauma, or just to those sickening thoughts that we all have, and he was isolated and put into deadly and conflicting situations. The beast took over when he desired Casca's body, and forced a kiss on her, and bit her breast when she was scared and helpless to defend. It's what kept telling him to kill Casca because she's the only thing weighing him down right now, and distracting him from his bloodlust of killing Griffith and getting revenge. The beast has been subdued with the addition of Guts' new party members, but this armor now has somehow tapped into it the wolf, the spirit animal, and has eradicated Guts' pain in the process. Guts begins his retaliation on Grunbeld, with speed and power a dozen times over of what he displayed before. Grunbeld does manage to block him, but after a few strikes, Grunbeld's shield is shattered. Guts then puts his left arm forward, showing that his arm cannon is still in full effect underneath the new armor, but now shoots out of his palm like a friggin' energy blast. Isidro, Serpico, and the elves gasp with amazement of Guts' new power, but Shurike informs them about what this armor actually is. It is name-dropped as, yeah, the Berserker Armor. Here's the breakdown. The armor aligns itself with its user in a way that's always reminded me of like a symbiote from Spider-Man. It indeed taps into your inner rage and darkness and brings that to the surface, unleashing it, basically making you fight like a berserker. In doing so, it also eliminates all fear and pain from your mind. Its basic intentions is to let you fight at your maximum potential as long as possible until you die. Yes, it cuts off your ability to feel pain, but that doesn't mean you can't be injured or even die from your injuries. Guts' slash on his chest is still there and still bleeding out, but he cannot feel it. Guts would essentially keep fighting without slowing down or getting tired until he bleeds out completely and dies. Until then, he's good to go. It's even stated that the last user of the armor did in fact die this way. So that could give us some clues on how Skull Knight died, and maybe even more clues as to why he looks the way he does in his astral self. The armor goes even so far as piercing itself through your skin, wrapping around your broken bones, and bracing them back into place so that you can keep fighting at your maximum potential. Again, it's not healing you, but it's just holding you together like a cast. And so Grunveld feels he has no choice but to bust out his full apostle form, transforming himself into a giant four-legged dragging looking motherfucker made of crystals. Dragon Apostle, meet the Dragon Slayer. With several strikes, Grunveld breaks Guts' leg and arm, but with the armor, it twists and turns and shoves the bones back into place, and at this point, Guts' reason is gone. He is not even here to communicate with anyone or anything, but is acting purely on rage and instinct. Shurike wonders why give an item so destructive to Guts, but through more telepathy, Flora informs her because she believes in Shurike to be able to reach Guts and help him gain control of it. She has the utmost faith in her pupil, and even if Shurike doesn't believe in herself, she's going to try. Guts, who is just demolishing apostles left and right as they try to get closer and aid Grunbeld, they're just ants to him at this point. And we actually get a moment from Puck seeing how destructive Guts is, and relating it back to the experiences he had with him back in the Black Swordsman arc. Puck, after all, has been with Guts the longest on his journey, and has witnessed all of the dark moments that Guts had since meeting him. Shurke taps into Guts' mind and sees the image of the Beast of Darkness. She knows Guts' ego is trapped inside of it, and so she enters. She sees Griffith as he once was. She sees the band of the Hawk, and then she stumbles upon images of the Eclipse, and this beautifully dark two-page spread Miura has drawn. 
My God. She begins to get swept up in the trauma of it all, but manages to find an image of the talisman Flora had imprinted on the armor. It was meant to keep Guts's ego from completely collapsing inside the beast. She tries to communicate with him and remind him of who he is and why he is fighting, but Guts states that he doesn't care and that he just wants to kill. Shurke shows him images of what's happening, but it's not until she shows him Farnese and Casca still hiding in the woods that she gets a positive response. Remember that we have already seen the symbolism of Casca representing the flame that keeps his darkness away. Without her at all, he would have already succumbed to this without the armor. Reminding him that he is Casca's protector, it awakens his ego and Gut snaps out of his rage. He avoids another attack from Grunbeld and then rushes to Serpico and Isidro, killing an apostle and saving them, and then running even faster back into the forest, saving Farnese and Casca from yet another apostle by splitting it in two. He then stands in front of them, and the armor's helmet opens, revealing his face. Incredibly well drawn by Miura here, as we get so much from this image. One is that we obviously see all the damage and bleeding going on from the fight, but we also see Guts' look at Casca, and Farnese as well, with a sense of gratitude. A thank you for giving him a reason. Not a reason to fight, but a reason to be who he truly is, and not just be the Beast of Darkness. Thank you for keeping the darkness away, keeping him grounded, and keeping a reason. Just a reason. We also can see a piece of Guts' hair has turned white, a physical representation of the toll of the armor, which there is even more consequences not yet revealed. But Grunbeld is not defeated yet, and he barrels towards them, chasing Serpico, Isidro, and Shurike and the elves. But a wall of fire rises between him and the group, and takes the form of a younger Flora. As her last act in this world before dying, she uses her energy to engulf all the enemies in fire, and allow Shurike and the others to escape. To which again Shurike cries out for her, but Flora simply thanks Shurike, and assures her the time they spent together were some of the best times of Flora's long, long life, and that now is the time for her and this enchanted part of the forest to go away. Before her eyes, Shurike witnesses the end of her master in an explosion of fire, and Flora tells Shurike that they will meet again someday in her dreams. Shurike tries to run towards her, but Guts grabs her under his arm, and he and his group run far, far away from the once very special forest, followed by an adorable image of Flora and Shurike having tea together with their golem protectors. Oh, and they left the Skull Knight behind. Eh, I'm sure he can take care of himself. And boy, that was a lot of epic shit that happened in the short period of time in Berserk. And we're only halfway through this arc, believe it or not. The first half was to give us our setup and solidify Guts' new group and all the new magical items and power-ups. But even though where we end here is great, I do have a criticism. I really would have preferred it if Grunbeld died here. Not because I hate him as a character or anything. I'm not particularly fond of him either, but I feel like it would have given more of an impact to Flora's sacrifice and more of a stamp to the Berserker armor introduction. Because look, we had Griffith show up at the beginning of this arc with Zod. Guts fights Zod, and they both go away. We had Guts encounter Slan. They fight a bit, and then she goes away. And now we have Grunbeld. They fight a bit, and he goes away. The lack of finality to any of these encounters just irks me after a little bit. It's like, I'm not comparing Berserk to this in quality standpoints, but stay with me. It's like in Inuyasha, where they kept encountering the villain Naraku, but then he would just get away. And then they'd build up to it, they'd meet, and he'd get away. And it just felt like we were going in circles. And I'm not saying kill Griffith, or kill Zod, or even kill Slan, but someone like Grunbeld? You could totally kill him at this point in the story and get away with it and have it make an impact. Look, it's just a minor pet peeve, but I always am going to keep it real with you guys. And I gotta say, after three in a row of villains that show up and then the same villains go away, it moderately gets on my nerves. But the Berserker armor introduction is fantastic and will serve as a gigantic game changer in the story for both good and bad reasons. Guts' crew now all have their power-ups and a new powerful ally to accompany them to the Elf Island. But how will they get there? And what the hell has Griffith been up to all this time? So, after spending a lot of time with Guts and his new companions, we need to see what's going on in the rest of the world. Like, remember when the Kushan Empire was on its way to invade the royal capital of Midland after the king had died? Way back in the middle of the Conviction arc? 
Well, here we are midway through the Millennium Empire arc, and the royal city has been reduced to a desolate wasteland of corpses. Hundreds of dead bodies of the Midland people are impaled and strung up everywhere, showing us not only are the Kushan in full dominance here, but that their methods are much more disgusting and demon-like than anything we've seen before in the physical world of humans versus humans. We also see some key locations, such as the idol of the Holy See religion in a church, and the fountain where once upon a time Griffith and Princess Charlotte had a conversation that sparked a change in the entire Berserk story thanks to an eavesdropping guts. Poetic to show this though as it's a reminder of these characters we haven't seen for some time. And speaking of which, a team of Midland rebels assemble in the dark sewers of the city and we see some familiar faces. One man named Laban, who introduces himself as a leader of the Midland Arklow Knights, he made a few brief appearances in the Golden Age arc, mostly commenting to the king how impressed he was with Griffith and the Band of the Hawk. We also see with the resistance the former Minister Foss, a man who hated a commoner like Griffith getting such praise in the kingdom and who actively plotted his death. Until Griffith caught wind and threatened Foss's family for his obedience. Since then, Foss was like a puppy dog under Griffith's powerful commanding gaze. And man, I just, I love that moment where they're staring each other down in the hall and you can basically just feel the intensity and energy just radiating off of Griffith's eyes, fully putting Foss in his place with just a mere look. Foss plays an expository role here as he tells Laban and the others that Princess Charlotte is indeed still alive, something kept in the dark for some time. She was an important figure in the Golden Age arc, basically being the catalyst for Griffith's capture and the fall of the Band of the Hawk, inadvertently of course. She just wanted some lovin' from her Lord Griffithsu, and he took her to Pound Town. Then her father tried to sexually assault her, being jealous of Griffith getting to her first because she reminded the king of his wife so much that he had sexual feelings towards her. And on top of that, you have to think that a princess like her was incredibly sheltered and stifled, and honestly, I do have a lot of sympathy for her. She hasn't really done anything wrong this entire story. Sure, she's a little bratty and entitled, but she's a princess, come on. Anyway, we knew of her missing since the Kushan invasion, but Foss lets us know that she's being kept on the highest level of the Tower of Rebirth, the very same place that Griffith was kept when he was being tortured for an entire year, except he was kept in the lower, lower levels. The news of her being still alive is incredibly important, as with the leadership being done through royal bloodline, there are still ties to what Midland was, and perhaps it could be rebuilt, continuing that very bloodline. But as Foss has been stuck in Wyndham this whole time, he asked Laban if the rumors are true that he's heard that the hawk, Griffith, is back. Could he really be back? But before Laban can answer, the group is attacked by a crocodile-like monster. And not just a regular old crocodile, but one with more human-like features and holding a spear. As the crew make their escape, Foss informs them that he was being literal when he said that this was a demon city and that the Kushan have used some kind of sorcery to change animals into monsters to attack them. Which, as this arc delves more into magic, it's another unique kind of it that we are going to get introduced to. But the coolest one is this elephant. Just, just look at this. That's great. But then arrows from above put down the beasts, and as the rebels look up, they see Irvine, who we know is part of Griffith's new band of the Hawk, as well as the lancer named Locus. The two apostles in human form give some hope to the Midland rebels, as they mention that the fog will soon be lifted, and that the Hawk is on his way. And sensing the presence of these apostles somewhere else in the city, we are finally introduced to the leader of the Kushan Empire. Funny how it's taken this long to see who is in charge of all this madness going on. We see some familiar characters. Salat and his two bodybuilder Bakaraka buddies bowing before the one known as Ganishka, leader of the Kushans. He basically tells Salat to stick to being more covert and watch the movements of the hawk and his crew from a distance. Though Salat and his companions still plan to find a way to defeat the hawk themselves and are untrusting of Ganishka. And I will get to my thoughts on Ganishka in just a moment, and boy, I have plenty that you might not want to hear, but first, the Tower of Rebirth. Princess Charlotte is indeed alive and well, kept in a room, but no torture elements are here. She's dressed well and crocheting. There is also her maid helper, whose name is Anna, and I don't know if it's the first time she's actually name-dropped or not, but she was the same one by Charlotte's side back in the Golden Age arc when they went to go rescue Griffith. But... 
she's thrown out of the room immediately so that Ganishka could come in and have a talk with Charlotte. And by a talk, I mean, yeah, he wants to bang her. Though not just for a sick rapist tendencies, but so he can merge the bloodlines of the Midland and the Kushan. In old time fucked up societies and kingdoms, you can't ignore bloodlines. It's what rules the world, literally. And it's the best way to make people fall in line with the least amount of resistance. Ganishka is silhouetted in a big, black, dark drawing here, which does add a very scary ambiance despite us just being introduced to him. But as he goes for her, she screams out for Griffith to save her. And hearing that name... Lord Griffith! Why did you say that name? And looking at the images she's been crocheting, Ganishka realizes that Charlotte and Griffith have a history. Something he didn't know before, but now could use to his advantage. So Ganishka leaves her for now. And as he makes his way out of the tower, we get inner monologue, which basically reveals that Ganishka himself is actually an apostle, and that he rules the vastest territory in the world, and he only wants more. He knows who and what Griffith is due to the collective dream that was given to everybody during the conviction arc, a message that the Messiah is about to arrive and to follow under him. However, Ganishka refuses to give up his empire. He wants more power just for himself, and so we see perhaps the first time the idea of an apostle refusing to follow the God Hand's wishes. Apostles are free to do as they please, but they must be obedient to the God Hand themselves. Remember that one instance when Wilde was lashing out at the rules and Zod put him in his place? Well, Ganishka is much, much more powerful than someone like Wilde, and much more forward-thinking as well, and he plans to rebel against God himself if he has to. Okay, so I know I'm probably in a very, very small minority with this opinion, but I always got to keep it real and be 100% honest with you guys about my thoughts. One thing I never want to be is a blind fanboy, so even if I love something very dearly, that doesn't mean that it's exempt from some kind of criticism if I don't like the things that are happening or something going on. And I'm not saying that's the case, I'm just kind of prefacing this with a disclaimer there. But Ganishka, to me, is barely a character, and more so a plot device. And this right here, this is his entire character. He's an apostle that opposes the God Hand. That's it. We will learn virtually nothing about him until the very, very end of this arc, and by that point, it hardly matters. He has no real depth beyond just being a big evil guy that wants to be a ruler and opposes the God Hand. The concept is cool, an apostle opposing the God Hand, it's interesting, but Ganishka is just a concept. He's the bad guy with an evil laugh and a twisty mustache, almost literally. He will mostly be angry, trying to threaten, or be scared. That's his range of emotion as a character. He's extremely limited, and it took this long just to introduce him. You know why he's here? To give Griffith something to do. Griffith needs to reestablish himself to the people to become a hero. Ganishka is here, narratively, to serve Griffith's story, and that's about it. And that's totally fine. That's okay. I don't have a problem with that. I just think Ganishka himself is a very weak character. Not in strength, but in personality. But also, when it comes to strength, Griffith is a god hand now, so Ganishka doesn't even really pose a threat. He's just a means to an end, and isn't compelling enough for me to care about him. It's also disappointing because Berserk has had some of the more in-depth villains all around. Think about Rosine from the Conviction arc. She's got so much to her, and you really feel for her and understand her by the end. In fact, you have more sympathy for her than you do for Guts. And think about Mazgus, one of my favorite antagonists of the entire story. Mazgus, being only a human for most of the time that he was around, was far more terrifying and compelling than Ganishka is. We didn't agree what Mazgus was doing, but we saw where he was coming from and what his intentions were, and how much that fired basically what he did as a character. But anyways, I'll keep this rant short and sweet. Sorry, Ganishka fans. Outside, Salat and the other Bakaraka encounter Raxus, who easily dodges their attacks and leads their eyes to the gate where dozens of members of the Band of the Hawk are storming inside the capital. Raxus then bolts away, but Salat and the others chase after him. As the Band of the Hawk arrives, they easily dismantle the human Kushans, and so Ganishka tells his men to lead them to something he calls the Daka. And thank God for the Daka, a slew of demon soldiers, but not apostles, and we will get to what the Daka are in just a moment. But thank God the Kushan have some supernatural soldiers to fight back with, because seriously, an all humans versus all apostles war would be an absolute joke. And also, look how cute the Daka are. Don't you just want to have like a plush of one of these guys? 
Locus leads the troops and stands in front of both the Daka and Ganeshka up above, whom he simply asks why Ganeshka opposes the God Hand. To which Ganeshka gives his I'm evil and powerful speech, which will get him basically nowhere. Meanwhile, Salat follows Raxus into a building where the Daka are made. And okay, you thought the troll den was gross, right? Trolls raping and impregnating women and then they're born like chestburster aliens into a blob abominations. Yeah, you thought that was gross? Well, Miura was just teasing you. This is what will be referred to as the man-made Baelit. Ganeshka has set up a system where dozens upon dozens of apostles have been sewn together and wrapped up in chains and bound together through magic. The center of these meshed together apostles is filled with amniotic fluid, you know, the stuff babies float in, and their combined forced together power is basically like a link to the astral world and the power one would receive from there. The Kushan take pregnant women and submerge them into the fluid. From there, the evil energy of the astral world generated by all these apostles corrupts the fetus and it rips out of her as a baby Daka, which is then like pooped out or something and then thrown into a cage with others where it will eventually be taken and grow into a soldier for Ganeshka. Yeah, so I have no real words or thoughts about this. I can go with the logic here of the collective evil energy being like a generator of sorts. But just when you think Miura reaches the limits of his fucked up ideas, we get the Daka machine. Salah is of course disgusted by this, and it appears Raxus led him here on purpose so that he could see just what Ganishka was up to and reveal that Ganishka is in fact an apostle before leaving them. Since Raxus was once a former Bakaraka member, sometime before becoming an apostle, it feels as though he wanted to give the remaining members of his former clan a push to joining his side. The Band of the Hawk then begin to battle the Daka, and we see Locus transform for the first time into his full demon form. Basically a shiny, jagged thing. And the rest of the apostles follow suit behind him. Ganeshka also sends out his war beast, which are name dropped as the Pishaka, and it basically becomes a free-for-all of monsters. Something we haven't really seen yet in Berserk, and it's just a glorious piece of madness. From a distance, Irvine the Archer takes a shot at Ganishka, but it phases right through him, and we see his Apostle ability right here and now. Ganishka basically changes his body into smoke and lightning, thus explaining the mass fog surrounding the city in the first place. And Ganishka has no problem showing off how powerful he actually is, blasting and frying other Apostles with his electricity. But as he's showboating above him, we see the wing of wait for it... And back at the Tower of Rebirth, Charlotte's window springs open, and before her eyes, her hero and man of her dreams appears in front of her. Griffith is here. The last time she saw him, he was a skinny, broken shell of a man, and now he stands here looking as strong and powerful as ever. For someone like Charlotte, who has known nothing of demons or what went on into making Griffith appear the way that he does, simply adds to her high imagery of what she already viewed Griffith as. He's taken her love and admiration, and here now acting as the knight in shining armor rescuing the princess from the tower as she's held captive, it's straight out of a fairy tale. Basically, this moment solidifies who he is as a man to Charlotte, and her devotion will remain unshaken. Griffith speaks, calling back to when he entered her room from the window before, even relates to her being a story similar to Sleeping Beauty. Now, does Griffith actually care about Charlotte, or is this just a means to an end as she was before? Well, remember that before, it was pretty clear that Griffith was using her to get what he wanted and clearly taking advantage of her devotion to him. And now, Griffith the man is gone. This is Femto now, using the Griffith-like appearance as a mask. He's even more detached now than he was then. His humanity is gone, and what humanity he had as a human was only second to his ultimate dream and selfishness. Charlotte is being rescued for the sake of the story Griffith is telling the world. To rescue her, to be with her, and become king in the eyes of the world. Not by force, but by being a true, admirable hero. Charlotte grabs Anna and tells her to get on the bed. And then crashing from above, the bed is lifted right out of the tower, taking Charlotte and Anna away from this nightmare. As she is secured, Locus tells the Band of the Hawk to retreat. And Ganeshka wonders what the hell is happening, and he realizes his fog in the city could only sense everything on the ground, but not in the air. Charlotte was lifted away safely as he was distracted, and now he's down his most valuable asset and hostage. Could Griffith defeat Ganeshka right here and now? Yes, but no one would be here to see it. And Charlotte wouldn't have this amazing rescue story. 
Griffith is going about his plan to rule by basically following the rules of mankind. He's creating his own legend for the people to talk about for years to come. And I'm telling you that human connected consciousness matters when it comes to his power. The more Griffith is in the hearts and minds of the people, the stronger he will be. And here, Charlotte looks up once more to see him liberating her from the monster Ganeshka. And as she rides in the sky on her bed, she takes comfort in it. And yes, the bed is being carried by motherfucking Zod. <laughs> the ocean. We haven't seen this before. Well, Isidro has never seen it at all and dives right in. Our group has made a lot of progress on their journey. And in case anyone forgot what their actual objective is after the troll side quest, it's get Casca to the elf island where Puck is from so she'll be safe. So naturally, since it's an island, they'd have to make it to the ocean at some point. And one thing I do really love about this arc is the variety of locations that we get. It's a very world-building arc in more ways than one. And yeah, I know it's just an ocean, but that along with Flora's place in the forest, Enoch Village, and the upcoming Holy City, it just helps the world feel more full and functioning. And there's something inherently calming about the seashore, which is something both Story and the characters need right now. Guts placing Shurike's hat back on her head is also a small touching moment, solidifying him more into the leader father figure role, but also showing how far he's come since the beginning of the loner full of rage and segregating himself. Shurike mentions that he should take off the armor, and that the talisman put over their brands of sacrifice to subdue its power will eventually fade. But Guts makes mention that he's been resting from battle for a month now and doesn't want to delay them any longer. And I know this is a little comment, but I've got to dive into it because it leads me to something I've been confused about for a long time, and I'm trying to figure it out. And that is Berserk's timeline. Okay, so we know for a fact that at the end of the Golden Age arc, Guts was 19. Then we get a two-year time skip to the beginning of the Conviction arc, making him 21. Since then, there has been no decisive time skip for how long it's been for our characters. Sure, a lot has happened, but the entirety of the Conviction arc is only within a couple of days. The starting of the Millennium Empire arc, we have Guts traveling for a bit, Furnace and the others joining, and then the Troll event, which happens in about two days. So, how much time has passed in total, and how old is Guts now? See, the Berserk guidebook says that Guts is 24 years old at the current point in the manga, which is a little well past this, but no point where a massive time skip could have happened. So how does Guts go from being 21 to 24? Where do the three years take place? It honestly makes no sense to me. So if you want to assume that he was traveling alone with Casca for like a month, okay, and it's been another month since the end of the troll battle, and if you want to say the upcoming boat trip is a couple of months, yeah, sure, but that would still only bring him to being 22, or if you want to say he's on the cusp of a birthday, 23. I know this is like a little nitpicky kind of thing, but with no specific time skips given other than a month here and a month there, I don't understand how Guts could be any older than 22 at best. But anyway. As Shurike tries to reiterate the danger of keeping the armor on, Guts mostly ignores her to look on as his group in front of him plays in the ocean waves. In this beautiful image, we see something we and Guts haven't in so long. Casca smiling. Even earlier in this arc, Guts wondered when the last time she smiled was. And now, here it is. Her mind has been destroyed and brought her to a childlike state, but she's still capable of experiencing joy and happiness. Maybe not with Guts himself, but among the new group. And the calmness in which Guts feels is in direct opposition to the last two years of his life. Here there are no enemies, no monsters, just a sunset and the people that he cares for. I also love this panel of the group sitting together and eating. I feel every piece of this image, from Farnese helping Casca eat the hot soup, to Shurike and Avalara sitting quietly and worry about Guts and the new life that they are facing away from the forest, to Isidro and Puck bonding and talking about Puck's homeland, and to Guts giving Serpico a compliment about his ideas on Guts's equipment. In a story that's so filled with frenetic action, little moments like this are so important to help it feel once more grounded and real. Farnese then makes a request to Shurike. She wishes to learn magic. And the extent of how big of a deal this is for her character, not to mention how much more I love and appreciate her upon second read-through, Farnese devoted herself fully to the Holy See, but it was only because she had no identity for herself. She was making everyone around her happy, but not herself. Throwing that away, she had no sense of self-worth. 
And here in the new group through protecting Casca and seeing the wonder Shurike is able to perform, Farnese herself wants to open up as much as possible, to learn as much as possible. And the two major plot issues from her learning magic is one, Shurike is still technically a pupil herself, and the older a person is, the harder it is to learn as they have become more indoctrinated in the physical world. But even so, Shurike agrees, saying that she will do her best to teach Farnese the basics. Later, Shuriki looks over the shore and is soon greeted by Guts, and I love how both of them are trying to look out for each other. Shuriki thinking Guts is straining his body too much, and Guts telling Shuriki not to worry her mind so much. But she is dealing with the loss of her parental figure and the fact that she's out on her own for the first time. It takes a toll, and she confines in Guts in another great character moment, which is soon broken by Avalara, who assumes Shuriki has a crush on Guts, which embarrasses her and is just a super adorable and funny moment. If you haven't guessed, everything about the characters on this beach I think is excellent, and it is one of my favorite moments in the entire manga. But then, guess who shows up? The Skull Knight arrives! Looks like he got out of the burning forest just fine, and being the gentleman that he is, he never brings up the fact that they all escaped without him. He's here to mention a few things. One is more warnings about the Berserker armor. Besides the rage-inducing, bone-breaking, and bracing aspects, it will also slowly drain the user of their senses sight, touch, taste, and so on. Guts promises he won't lose control and let that happen, but we can see that he has uncertainty about what he is saying. Shurike then asks Skull Knight about his history with the armor and his relationship with Flora. He does admit to wearing the armor previously, back when he lived within the reason of time, which to me means he lived in the pure physical world as a human. Now he exists in the interstice and the astroworld. He even tells Guts not to take the armor lightly as long as he wishes to remain living like a human, which again, I think, adds into the Skull Knight's current appearance. He and Flora were friends, and he makes mention of this, and how it is similar to how Guts and Shurike are now. Time is not a circle, but a spiral, just as Flora said. It's the same scenario, but different. When questioned about why Griffith sent apostles to kill her and burn down the forest, Skull Knight simply says that he saw her as a threat. No one in the physical world can pose an obstacle to the Hawks' goals, but with those tied to the astral world and magic, maybe they could. Upon the idea of facing Griffith again, the Berserker armor trembles and wants to take Guts once more. He keeps it in check, but it's to remind us that the armor is like a living parasite connected directly to Guts' darker side. There is good news, though. Skull Knight isn't just here with ominous warnings, but learning that Guts and company are heading to Elfhelm, he makes mention that the Elf Island's ruler, the Flower Storm Monarch, whom may have the power to restore Casca's mind. This, of course, breaks Guts into a hopeful smile, something that he could never imagine happening, and the hope that he gets is a powerful one. Skull Knight leaves them be, but with another word of caution, that restoring Casca's mind might not mean that her wish is the same as Guts's wish. And what can we infer that Guts's wish is? To be with Casca again as a loving relationship to be a man and a woman together. But if Casca remembers everything, and I mean everything, would she want that as well? Speaking of Casca, she's been wandering the beach by herself and comes across a little naked boy who's just kind of standing there. When the group finds Casca, she's sitting with the child wrapping him up in her cloak, and the child shyly looks away from Guts, and the group decides to bring him back with them as to not just leave him out here alone. Then this next little panel is a bit of a conspiracy theory. I mean, everything with this boy is a conspiracy theory in itself, but as Guts looks up, we see a hilltop, and many have said that this little shape right here resembles that of Zod, with his horn, watching from a distance. Could that be possible? Yeah, it definitely could be. And there probably wouldn't be attention drawn to it if it was truly nothing. But why would Zod be watching and not making himself known? He's a warrior, not a covert ops kind of guy. Well, let's get into the Moonlight Boy stuff. What's the big elephant in the room here? or little guy demon baby in the room. So it's not very subtle that Casca is drawn to and extremely motherly to this boy. The boy also looks to be about two years of age, which would be the same age that her child would be if it had not been corrupted. Also, we haven't seen the demon child since it was swallowed to become the conduit for Griffith's new body, but that's just it. The demon baby was used and taken over by Griffith, so it would be gone, right? Well, until Griffith showed up on the Hill of Swords and felt affection in himself towards Casca, and when he left that battlefield, I assume it was because he felt that weakness within him. He and the Demon Child have combined into one, and aspects of the Demon Child still exist within that body. 
but now we have a pure human looking little boy as he plays adorable games with looking at and away from guts and climbing on his shoulder. We get glimpses of what could have been, especially as the child falls and both guts and Casca catch him at the same time. It's a family that could have been. That was broken from the start, and even now, Casca snatches the child away from Guts, still fearful of him. And not to mention the added awkwardness from both Shurike and especially Farnese, who clearly has grown a crush on Guts, and is remembering Guts and Casca were, or are, an item. Or at least, his heart is somewhere else. But where did this child come from? Well, this isn't a spoiler, this is all just theory, and it's an obvious theory. One. The demon child was swallowed by the egg of the perfect world. Two, that body fused with Griffith, and they more than likely now share that body. And three, it's been known that astral world entities become more powerful in the physical world at night, and especially during a full moon, which it is right now. So there's the idea that during the full moon, the demon child regains its identity. Either that means that Griffith literally transforms into the demon child, or that they separate and the child does what it wants during the full moon before needing to return to Griffith's body. Well, it's more than likely that they separate since during the rescue of Charlotte just a couple of chapters ago, we see that Griffith is in plain view of the full moon, complete in his normal Griffith form. But maybe, just maybe, the separation means that Griffith is weakened, since we don't see Griffith perform any supernatural feats during that rescue scene. And maybe Zod is here watching to make sure that nothing happens to the boy's body, as something happening to it could affect Griffith's body. There's a lot that it could be. All we can say for certain is that this is the demon child, because it's way too obvious not to be. The hows and whys, I guess, will come with time. Until then, we have some Pashakas, more crocodiles enhanced with Kushan magic. They break into the group's cabin, and I love how Serpico has never seen a crocodile before and he calls it a dragon. <laughs> not yet. The group springs into action, each knowing their roles. Shurike plans to protection spell for the cabin, Guts ties his sword to his hand, reminiscent of when he did it at the Rosine fight, and I like that little callback. And Serpico puts on his magic cloak, and Isidra throws his bombs. As well, as shown, he's gotten better with his dual weapon style. One he has been developing himself, ever since following Guts' advice to create his own style. See? I could say nice things about Isidro. There you go. Guts does his usual, but all the while trying to hold back the armor, determined to fight on his own, using the bare minimum of its pain-deflecting abilities. The best part is when the crocodile tries to come inside before the spell is complete and makes direct eye contact with the child, and then the croc turns away on its own. Now what could be within the child's eyes that would strike fear into this creature? Energy of that of a god hand, maybe? But either way, Shurike is successful. Though since the crocs have physical bodies and they are physical world creatures, the barrier won't be as effective as they were against the trolls who are fully from the astral world. Instead, she says that there must be spellcasters nearby controlling these creatures. Serpico is the first one to find them, and it is a group of Kushans all sitting and chanting together, and Serpico wastes no time killing them all. And I always found this moment to be kind of brutal, since for a while they've been just fighting monsters, but Serpico just beheads a couple of humans right here. Never forget, he is a brutal bastard. It does seem to work as the crocs stop their tirade, but then something bigger and worse rises up from the ocean. Another controlled animal called a Makara, which I guess is originally a whale, but with it being corrupted by magic, it grows tusks and a long elephant-like nose, and I, I don't know, it's just supposed to be a giant monster, and that's all that matters. The magic user controlling this one, however, is somewhere out at sea, so the group can't get to him. It barrels towards them, first flinging Serpico away. Then Guts does his best to fight, even slicing away its eye, but it knocks Guts aside as well. As it goes for the group in the cabin, Guts can no longer hold back the armor. It decides it's time that it's used, and forces itself up and around Guts' head, clamping down into its canine-like helmet, and just as before, unleashes Guts' raw power and rage while eliminating his ability to feel pain. Guts goes to work on the creature, ripping it apart, then jumping inside of its mouth and tearing himself out through its back. Drenched in the creature's blood, Guts' ration fades away as he just wants to kill more and goes for the crocodiles, who remember right now are just basically regular crocodiles, but this is all an effect of the armor. It will unleash your inner rage and darkness, and a man like Guts, who has a near unlimited supply of those things, well, it's a dangerous thing. And the man can't even see straight. All he sees is enemies, and he wants to cut all of them down. He can't even tell the difference between the crocodiles 
and his friends. Guts then goes to attack his own group, completely blinded by the Berserker's armor's rage. Serpico prepares to defend them the best that he can, but Guts then sees an image of, yep, a little boy. And it's like an astral, ethereal version of themselves. It's like the same idea when Shurike enters the astral world, she creates an ethereal body for her to exist there. This is most certainly the demon child appearing before Guts, and upon touching him, immediately sends a calm through Guts' body and clears his vision. Who else besides one's own child could do that that easily? The metaphor is Guts' mind is beneath the surface of the ocean, and as legends always say, if you stare into the darkness of the sea at night, it will pull you in. In this case, the darkness is from one's own self. And the child cleared Guts' vision enough to where he can see Shirake entering his mind to save him just as she did before, to bring him back to his senses. It works as she pulls him up, and he returns to sanity with the helmet of the armor going back down. A beautiful moment follows as Guts breaks down in anger that he failed to keep the armor in check, and Shirake repeats a line that he told her earlier at night about being stuck in your old ways will make you old before your time. Guts being angry or regretful is what he would have done, but he is growing and ever-changing. That comment actually makes him smile, and having that backup makes him get past his own feelings of failure, and he stands with acceptance. It's a mutual feeling as the group agrees that without the armor, they may have been killed by the Makara. But that's where we're at. It's so useful, yet the consequences will keep stacking up. And in this image of Serpico, we see all too well that his fears might be coming true. That being around Guts will get Farnese killed. And though he and Guts have been bonding, let's not forget that he expressed wishes to kill Guts, if need be, not that long ago. Upon regathering themselves, they notice that the little boy is now gone. As Guts clearly remembers his assistance just now, but Casca is the most distressed looking one, as she looks as though she lost something truly important. Perhaps as the night ends, it's time for the child to go back and refuse with Griffith. We don't really know, but we see the child on the same hilltop as the supposed Zod was, looking down at the group, and let's face it, he's looking at his parents. What is the extent of the boy's intelligence? Can he speak but chooses not to? He spoke in Guts' mind, at the very least. And just as he was in his ugly baby form before, he was always following Guts and keeping Casca safe. It might not get the chance now other than during the full moon, but perhaps he is just continuing what he has always done, and it is as simple as that. The final question is why did the Kushan attack them? Well, we cut to the magic user that was controlling the whale sitting on a boat. It wasn't just them, but the Kushan have been sending enchanted animals all around to take control at night. Apparently they were successful on all the other shores, except for this one. And we meet a new character, a Kushan magic user who sensed the defeat of those animals, but doesn't understand how any humans could have defeated them. As if Guts and company are just any humans. Okay, so as our main group traveling along the beach line comes over a hill, we are introduced to probably the most amount of people in one place at one time than we've ever seen in the manga before. And just as I said in a previous video, one thing I really love about this arc is just the world building and the variety of locations that are presented. We are about to enter the holy city of Vertanus, and we are shown it's not just our small group of travelers that are looking to head inside. Serpico provides us with a ton of exposition as to who everyone is, but the gist of it being that they are all from different nations that fall under the same jurisdiction of the Holy See. As it would appear, as powerful or independent as various kingdoms may be, they all fall under the same blanket of the current prominent religion. Serpico points out two names that are familiar with us, one obviously being Midland, whom Guts and the Band of the Hawk fought for during the Golden Age arc, and Shooter, the nation that Midland directly fought against during the 100 Years' War, a war that would never have ended if not for Guts, Griffith, and the rest of the original Band of the Hawk. And I like how it lingers on Guts feeling familiar feelings while being around all of the soldiers. Before nightly battles with demons and monsters, it was just man versus man. This is how Guts grew up, and for better or worse, is what shaped him into the man he is today. As they enter the city, each character has a different reaction to being in such a place. Isidro is full of wonder and excitement, while Shirake feels very uncomfortable being around so many people. Serpico continues to give exposition about how the city is like a trading ground between nations, but as of recently, it's more just like a giant canteen. And the elves are just excited since this is a holy city, most people here are heavily religious and thus can't perceive them, so the elves can kind of fly about and do whatever the hell that they want to do. The best part is when they see a leader of a mercenary band looking for recruits, and Guts explains how looking at the leader will give you the best sense on whether the group is worth joining or not, how strength, wisdom, and charisma all play a part. And like clockwork, those descriptive words trigger Serpico to speak of one such leader he heard of once. 
you guessed it, Griffith. Now, let's take a reminder here that of Guts' total party, only Puck and Shurike know who Griffith is in relation to Guts, and only Puck knows the entire story with the Eclipse and everything involved. Serpico, Farnese, and Isidro still have no idea and only know who Guts is as the Black Swordsman. It's even funnier when the Isidro has even heard stories about the captain of the Hawks Raiders killing a thousand men, which of course was Guts and it was a hundred men, not a thousand, but Guts doesn't bother to correct him or admit anything about his involvement, even saying that he can't even remember the name of the mercenary band that he was a part of. I imagine speaking about anything from his past out loud would be incredibly difficult for him, but this isn't the time or place to share it either. The other thing to mention about this is the continuing theory about how I think that stories and rumors help perpetuate power in the Berserk universe. Think about it. These characters, having never met Griffith, are still continuing the collective idea of what Griffith is by seeing them in their heads as someone powerful and charismatic. If collective thought or desires are what are used to propel someone to power, then someone like Griffith was primed for a god hand position even before it happened. Now that he's returned, more rumors are spreading about the potential band of the Hawk Return, currently fighting against the Kushan Empire. What is happening is Griffith has transcended being a man by becoming a legend, a King Arthur type, a Jesus. But anyways, let's move on. Let's not forget also that Shirake is dressed like a witch in a holy city. You know, dressed like the kind of people that they would burn at the stake or send to a torture chamber. Well, as some guards notice her, she performs a Jedi mind trick that helps them not notice, but it just seems to draw more attention to her. She's nervous, full of anxiety, the center of attention in a place where she feels uncomfortable already, and then Isidro begins to berate her on to changing her clothes into something normal. Her hat then gets knocked off and run over by a carriage, which causes her to run away from everybody in tears. I do really feel for her here, as you gotta remember that she lived in the forest her whole life. Her only adult figure just died, and she's like 12 or 13 years old. She has always felt safe and at one with Earth and the physical and spiritual, but this city is full of hustle and bustle and judgment and noise, and it's just too overwhelming. As she runs off, Gut says not to follow her, give her some space, plus they still have the thought transference, so if she gets into trouble, she can just contact them through telepathy. It's just Guts being the daddy figure. You gotta love it. Wandering off on her own, Shurike is able to perceive a spirit lingering about. I imagine with her connection to the astral world, anything living in an interstice such as a spirit unable to fully pass on, she would be able to see it. I just go with it. I know some people feel like Shurike is too powerful at times, and I get that, but as of now in the story, I'm still on board. The spirit leads her to an area where many men have been hung, and hearkening back to the conviction arc, when we know spirits are killed under torture and false pretenses of heresy are usually the most restless. She can sense the torturous lives they'd lived as slaves and what have you, and can feel the intensity of their restless souls, wishing that they could pass fully on to the afterlife. Two soldiers approach Shirake, and from them she learns that all these men were Kushan who were forced to work in Britannus, but with the Kushan Empire invading and declaring war, they were all killed simply due to their ethnicity and relation to that war. They were used as symbolism to declare the holy city and all its nations resisting the Kushan invasion. They committed no crimes. They were just killed. Even though we have seen horrible things the Kushan have done, and we have met their leader Ganishka, who we know is an apostle, we sometimes forget about the regular people who are forced to do the fighting or who are just trying to live their regular lives. Because of decisions the leaders make, it's always the one on the ground that suffer the most. Something I wish I could say is unique to Berserk, but it's the truth of war and the real human world. And we wonder how an idea of evil could even be created. If God reflects mankind and mankind embraces evil, it all makes sense. Life is a spiral, just as Flora says. Anyway, Shurike casts a spell to make the guards help her take down the bodies and then burn them. She then continues on to the dock, seeing the sheer size and grandeur of the warships, thinking about how many trees were torn down just to create a weapon of war and power. How many people can't leave nature alone and just learn to live with it. Instead, we must tear it down for a temporary attempt to control others. It's so sad, and honestly, I get emotional thinking about it. I mean, fucking humanity, right guys? Okay, so I'll admit that this Isidro moment is pretty funny. He's off on his own trying to find Shurike and drew her face on a pumpkin trying to see if anyone can recognize her. That's just great.
And another great moment is when a young knight overhears that Isidro is looking for a witch and questions him about it. And this young knight is actually a character called Mule. We met him briefly earlier in this arc, and he was with the Midland army that witnessed Griffith's power firsthand and then devoted himself to Griffith's cause. And the comparison between him and Isidro was great because you had this young proper knight following the Antichrist, basically, while you have this brash Isidro who is a follower of Guts. Though neither know this yet, and it leads to an even better parallel. And that is, as Shirake sits on the dock, a young girl named Sonia approaches her. Sonia again being part of Griffith's crew, and though not a witch, she does have a connection to the spiritual and can perceive bits of the future as well as speak telepathically to whomever she wishes. She is Griffith's medium. I love this comparison because they both are finding a new way of life within their respective groups and believe in their strong leader. Sonia mentions that she can see a Valera on Shurike's shoulder and was able to see the Kushan souls disappearing after Shurike had them burned. As they sit down and talk, Sonia describes herself and her story through bird analogies. Uh, what it basically boils down to is she mentions a hawk coming to save her and her feeling complete by this. But then the hawk rescued a princess, aka Charlotte, and now Sonia feels like a third wheel. That she and the hawk were something special and that the princess is ruining it. The two girls continue to bond, and Shurke admits that she feels a strong connection to her leader as well. Whether it's a crush or not, Guts is the first adult male figure in her life that has given her attention and has comforted her, so it's no surprise that she would feel an affection to him. Behind the girls, a group of Kushan children begin running out onto the docks in fear, chased by some adult men who claim to be slave traders. It appears that even the holy city doesn't want to hang children, but will sell them out of the city. Shurke and Sonia face them down, asking them to stop. One suggestion spell puts one in his tracks, which excites Sonia as she hasn't quite seen magic like this before. And then from behind them, Isidro finally catches up to them and starts pelting the men with rocks. One draws a sword, as does Isidro, the same sword given to him by Morgan from Enoch Village. He uses it well to cut down one of the men, only to soon have the realization that he's never done this before to an actual human person. They've been fighting trolls and such for so long now, as Isidro has been acquiring his skills, but he decides to have his moment and tell Shirake not to use any magic as he faces the adults himself. And you know, he does a pretty good job here. Sonia even picks up on their telepathy and even encourages Isidro to beat them. And now we get even more. Mule shows up as well and begins to help Isidro in this battle. The major difference here being that Mule shows no hesitation whatsoever in killing humans. After all, the kid has been in a legitimate war, and also being in the new band of the Hawk, probably he's desensitized to most things. And so we have a bunch of kids that manage to take down a whole group of adults. Wait, is this a shonen manga now? Well, I guess for this portion of it, it is. And then, son of a bitch, we get this guy. Probably the only character in the manga that makes me miss Zondark. I mean, hell, I'd even take Bazuzo in this case. So yeah, this is, uh, this is a pirate like the most generic, obvious pirate in the history of pirates, and he really likes to be called Captain. And he's missing a right eye. Like, who are you trying to be? Guts? I mean, come on. Well, he's the leader of these men, and Mule jumps right into the fray, attacking him. They jump off the dock onto a small boat, but the pirate knocks him away Mule's sword. Isidro then jumps down for backup and fares pretty well in the fight, but then... And, and I just don't even know what Miura was smoking here, but uh, sleeping on the boat was a knight, who wakes up and knocks the pirate into the water. And this knight, though not name-dropped, is obviously supposed to be Azan. Azan, of course, was part of the Holy Iron Chain Knights in the Conviction Arc. In fact, when we last saw him, he was instructed by Farnese to go to the Holy City and tell her father of her resignation. So I'm assuming that happened, that's why he's here, and then maybe he was stripped of his authority as well for either not staying with Farnese or allowing her to walk away. Or he just resigned himself, since he was distraught over how the Devoted reacted during the Conviction Arc event. They dropped the gate in his face while he was fighting for his safety, so that's a good reason, I suppose. Well, whatever the case, he's now sleeping on a random boat without removing his armor, and he faces down the rest of the pirates, shouting about what it means to be a true knight. Uh, the man is definitely going through some kind of midlife crisis, and I'm not here to judge him for it, but like this whole scene just went so wild, and I honestly don't even know what to think of it as a whole. But anyway, Shurke, Sonia, Isidro, and Mule do manage to get the Kushan children outside the city, and Sonia tells Mule to just take them with them, and that their leader won't mind. Sonia then asks Shurike to come along with them, that in their group, the unnamed Band of the Hawk, that there is no judgment on where you came from, the color of your skin, or what you believe in. Unlike in Vertanus, the holy city, where you must follow one faith alone and are hung for trivial reasons. And to be fair, Griffith has shown to give everyone an equal chance in the new Band of the Hawk. 
I'm not defending him or anything. I'm just saying that specifically, he opens it up to anybody who's willing to join. In the distance, Shurike sees Guts waiting for her against a wall. Guts with no judgment as well. He will let Shurike do as she chooses. He's here for protection if she needs it, but he's going to let her make her own choices. It's Daddy Guts. Shurike seeing him says that she plans to stay with her own group, but wishes to see Sonya again someday. Sonya sees Guts in the distance as well, but she also has no idea of his connection with Griffith. And we also have Isidro and Mule arguing and fighting with one another. It's played up for humor here, but most likely it's foreshadowing of an eventual true fight. As Sonia and Mule take their leave, Sonia tells Shurike that she should leave Vertanus as soon as she can, and then sends a flash to Shurike's mind of Vertanus on fire. Sonia, a medium, not one of magic, but can see parts of the future. She here legitimately cares for Shurike and calls her a friend. She wants her to be safe from this future event, but before we get to linger on it, the pairs go their separate ways. Later that night, the group reconvenes at a canteen where they were able to find a room for the night. The place is packed and full of drunks, and I love that the one tries to hit on Casca and Guts just kicks him in the face over the table. <laughs> then, Farnese brings a newly dressed Shurike to the table, discarding her witch robes as to not stand out as much. I mean, no one stands out as much as Guts, but at least nothing about his attire is going to draw heresy conversations. They all compliment her on how she looks, even though Shurike is incredibly uncomfortable about this. Then more drunks come to hit on the girls, and in doing so, one spills beer onto Shurike's new clothes. Immediately, Gut stands and punches the drunk bastard in the face. This starts a small bar brawl, and during this commotion of people arriving in negativity, Shurike states that despite it all, she can still smile. Surrounded by people she trusts and admires. And honestly, I think this is the true message of Berserk broken down to its bare bones. In a horrible world filled with horrible people and horrible events, if we find the right comrades, it is still possible to smile. Campsite for the new Band of the Hawk, Princess Charlotte is seen for the first time since her rescue, and the first time we see her in casual looking clothing as an average person. She's being a good girl and baking Griffith some sweets, of which I, I don't know exactly what it's supposed to be, but she says that she thinks Griffith would like some of this. But I think Griffith already got some of that. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> You'll know what I'm saying. Griffith is right here as well, but Charlotte doesn't want to bother him. He's a man on a conquest, after all. But Sonia has returned from Britannus and doesn't have that kind of restraint. She runs right up to Griffith, giddy as any fangirl could be. Griffith, of course, treats everyone in his band with calm respect, just as he did in his human days, greeting Mule and asking about their adventure. Charlotte, shy as ever, tries to get a word in, but Sonia just wraps herself around Griffith. It's like Charlotte is that cute, shy girl next door, and Sonia is that half-naked Instagram model just begging for attention, and Griffith is that famous celebrity who doesn't really care about either of them, but Griffith has missions to accomplish where Charlotte is his greatest asset, so he gives her direct attention. In a weird kind of way, it's a parallel to Guts and Casca. Sonia, like Casca, wishing to be Griffith's sword, and Charlotte, like Guts, as she's the one that he deems most important right now. Mule has to literally pull Sonia away, telling her to let Griffith and Charlotte have some time together. I also love how Sonia, after praising how delicious the sweets were that Charlotte made in front of her, shoves hers in Mule's mouth like she doesn't even care about it. And that's just a perfect display of that passive-aggressive shade that girls throw at each other. You know what I'm talking about. When girls hate each other, they usually act so friendly face-to-face, -face, throwing in those little subtle insults and as soon as they part ways, start talking bad about each other. Men are a little bit different. We just fight it out. We're good after we punch each other a little. Sonia then walks away into the woods and comes upon the Apostle Irvine, Griffith's archer, playing what I believe is a lute, but I'm not really sure, alone in a forest next to a bonfire. She sits with him and asks if he's always by himself. And I really like this moment because even though Irvine is an apostle, he's not some ravenous beast. He's tactical and calm, saying that he's always been a hunter and it's best to hunt alone. In the mountains as well, which is where some of the most calming, reflective scenery is, if you ever need to be alone and think. Sonia reluctantly relates to him, saying that she's always been alone too, but not as comfortable with it. Talking about Charlotte, she says she wasn't the only one. Sonia has this special ability to hear thoughts and speak telepathically, but she doesn't feel special, at least not until she's with Griffith. He gave her a purpose and made her feel at home, as he's done with so many others. But being who she is, there's really only so close that she's allowed to get. She starts to fall asleep and dream about a kite and an owl, the two birds that symbolize both herself and Shurike, perhaps foreshadowing that maybe with Shurike, she had a place too. A friendship, at least. Whatever the case, for now, it's just a dream. 
We then cut to the next day, and Shurike is giving Farnese a lesson in magic use. What I love about this is Shurike specifically saying it's not about saying magic words or drawing a symbol, it's about connecting your consciousness to that of the astral. Through imagining and offering supplication, meaning a request or like a prayer, and there's so many different cultures that have interpreted this experience. Even meditating, asking for healing from the source, translated into the Berserk story as asking for assistance from astral beings, or even the four elemental kings as Shurke did during the troll battle. Shurke uses an apple to give Farnese an object to imagine in her mind to make it tangible like something you could actually interact with, until Casca swipes it away and takes a bite, which is just adorable. Also, after this analysis video, I think I'm going to lock myself in my room for a few days and learn some magic. I'll see you guys after that. Serpico and Isidro come back into the room, stating that they've been looking all day for a boat that they can commandeer, but have had no luck. We can't get to Elfhelm if we can't even leave the dock. Then Fernice says to leave getting a boat to her, and only Serpico seems to have any idea what she means by this. Then Fernice grabs her sword, that of the Holy Iron Chain Knights that she hasn't used in quite a while, and leaves. We cut to an exuberant looking mansion, and inside we are introduced to two new characters for the story. Though we've heard bits and pieces about the famous and rich nature of Farnese's family, this is the first time we are about to get a real taste of it. Mr. Federico Vandemian is the wealthiest noble in Berserk's story, giving plenty of funding to the Holy See Church, and thus why he was able to give Farnese her position in the Holy Iron Chain Knights. He's seen arguing with one of his sons, Farnese's brother, Magnifico, and Magnifico just seems like a spoiled, whiny brat wanting more power for himself because apparently the other brothers, Giorgio and Poliziano, god these names, anyways, all have higher positions of establishment than Magnifico does. But we get the gist that Magnifico is just the weakest of the family, and he's sent away from Mr. Vandemian to enter Farnese and Serpico right behind her, of course. Serpico, being an actual son of Mr. Vandemian as well, though it's been kept secret since his birth, and not even Farnese knows this at this point. And in the face of her father, we see Farnese retract into herself. That fear and insecurity that has been plentiful with her character, that she was just working on, even with the magic training, all gets swept away in the face of her father. He immediately scolds her for going into hiding after the defeat at the Tower of Conviction. He says he doesn't blame her for the defeat itself, but for not returning to the city immediately. And because of doing that, she has sullied the name of the family. This brings her to tears. And remember, this is the father who was never around when she was a child. The father who was too important. Farnese grew into a fucked up, unbalanced person because she was looking for that adult validation. Only finding it in the heretic burnings and the rest was history. She does manage to barely stutter out that she would like a ship, but her father just turns his back on this request and walks away from her. Back at the inn, it's shown just how important Farnese is to the group in her absence. Shurke is trying to give Casca a bath, but can't control her to keep her still. She's like an adult-sized toddler, basically. And so far, Farnese has been the only one Casca has truly attached to and listens to in her current state. And then, yeah, okay, so... We have the scene. Casca pulls Shurike's towel off, and Shurike finds herself naked in front of Guts, who is sleeping. Yes, it's drawn, but there's nothing really sexual about this at all. The thing is, you have a very young character naked for two panels. Some people will immediately take this into saying that it's lolly fan service. But I think you need to take into account the cultural differences of how we view the human body, first of all, and that it's played for humor in that the point is that Shurike is young and that she's embarrassed to be in front of someone like Guts like this, whom she looks up to and admires and even has a little crush on. Also, Guts is asleep during this event, so he doesn't see this or react to it in any way. I just wanted to state that I don't think it's a really big deal. I know it's fun to troll and take things out of context and take them too far, especially when it comes to Berserk. And with all the crazy shit Berserk does show, this is nothing. Anyways, moving on from it. As Farnese bathes and gets dressed, she assumes everyone is doing okay without her, which as we just saw is definitely not the case. She also gets dressed by maids and into the most feminine outfit we've seen her in in some time, but still requests from one of the maids that she wants to hold on to her silver dagger. She meets with her brother Magnifico outside, who basically confides in her, trying to relate that their father is an asshole together, and that the horrible things she did, like burning down the mansion as a child, or failing the Holy Iron Chain Knights, wasn't her fault. But really, it's just digging the knife in deeper of Farnese's feelings that she's useless. When asking why Farnese is here, she tells him the truth and how she'd like to get a ship for her and her friends, and that sparks an idea in Magnifico, and he states that it may be possible. 
back in the room, Isidro and Puck stage a crab fight, which I think might be animal cruelty, but I'm, I'm just going to ignore it for right now. Uh, sure, Kay is also getting mad at them for not helping out, and it's absolutely adorable. And if you think about it, with Farnese and Serpico away, and Guts passed out, and Casca being, well, in the state she's in right now, you really only have two kids and two elves to handle everything. Also, some of you might be waiting for a fight to break out and have some action, and I get that, but rereading this, I'm just loving all these little slice of life moments. Guts does wake up, stating that he still has a fever, but will stay awake and feed himself. And I also love how Shirke wants to take care of him and feed him. Say, ah, and then she spills the soup on Guts as soon as Serpico re-enters the room. It it's just so good. What's not good, though, is the news Serpico comes with. He gives them a document saying that they will be able to get a ship thanks to the Vandamian family, but that he and Farnese will not be joining them. He even hands back Farnese's silver shirt and the dagger, which is just a punch in the gut if there ever was one. And we know deep down this is what Serpico always wanted, for Farnese to be safe and away from Guts, whom he feared would get her killed one day. As Serpico begins to walk away, Guts stands and confronts him on top of the stairs, in a way that's not abrasive, but as a simple request. Tell us why she's not coming back with us. But Serpico declines. Guts then asks about their rematch, and Serpico turns that down as well, and leaves without any explanation. The group is, of course, confused and frustrated, and Shurike can't even reach for niece telepathically, meaning she must have removed the hair that was given to her. And Guts immediately makes a group decision. Unlike how he would have been when Farnese and Serpico first joined, he says that they need to figure this out. Even though they have a free ride with the boat, they could leave right now. But Farnese has become important to him. They are his new Band of the Hawk, and he's not leaving them behind. He sends Puck and Avalara to follow Serpico to see what's going on. And look at this, Puck is becoming useful for a moment. Yeah, don't worry, a Puck rant is definitely coming in the near future. Farnese awaits as Magnifico re-enters with a friend of his, introducing himself as officer of the Eth Navy, Meet Roderick. Psh, Roderick. Just look at this smug, rich aristocrat bastard. There's no possible way that he turns out to be an awesome character. None. Not even the slightest. No way at all. He even mentions the rumors of Farnese being a devil child, but it's then shown that all the roses that are surrounding them in this room were actually a gift from Roderick. He gets all smooth and pickup artist-like and tells Farnese that she is like a white lily among all the other roses of the noble women. She stands out, but it's something that he likes and that she's not like the others. When have you heard this one before, ladies? I mean, come on. It's clear that this is a setup by Magnifico. Arranged and high esteem marriages were what politics were all about. If a Vandemian married a navy captain with the prestige that Roderick has, well, that would be a big deal, especially if Magnifico were the one to take credit for being the matchmaker. The elves report back with this information, and Guts figures it was probably the agreement that in exchange for the arranged marriage, they would get their ship. But just as Casca tosses the document for the ship into the fire, setting the next events into motion, Guts declares that they can't accept this deal of losing Farnese. Just as Farnese sits by herself contemplating the decision, and Serpico comes up to her, she admits that she felt whole with the group, but felt like she offered nothing in return. Which is so sad because we've just seen Guts' immediate reaction to losing her. But then we get the final member of Farnese's family introduced, her mother. She questions Farnese about her marriage decision, as well asks if there is any man that she had feelings for, and we get a quick shot of Guts in her mind. We then get a nice moment of Farnese's mother admitting that she believes Farnese's father fears his own daughter in that she is uncontrollable. A man of his position and power puts people into positions like a puppet master. He's the backbone of what keeps kingdoms and churches running, the man behind the scenes, and Farnese was always something that he could not understand or control, nor did he ever attempt to, though. And it's not as if Mr. Vandemian is a bad person, more so he's just neglectful and a slave of his own profession. Beginning of this segment talking about loneliness that was felt by Sonia and Irvine, Farnese was still very much alone growing up. She had servants and maids, yes, but she had no one to become attached to. That's why she grew into such a screwed up young adult. But with Guts's group, it was different. Farnese then mentions a ball taking place tonight where many of the nations and country's noblemen will be attending. It's where Magnifico plans to make the big announcement in front of everyone, so that he can look good in front of Daddy, of course. So, as she is treated with the delicate care as a noble, Farnese boards a coach taking her to the location as she reflects on everything that has just happened. Meanwhile, Guts, the elves, Isidro, Shirake, and Casca wander nearby looking for somehow a way to walk right in and bring Farnese back. But with anything in Berserk, this will not be an easy task. Look at this image. Just look at this goddamn image. Kantaro Miura. Here's something I adore about Berserk. 
We can have the most demonic, disgusting imagery like the clip off with the troll den and everything like that. And then we are shown the upper levels of society, the rich or the 1%, if you will. And the contrast is just amazing. And I love how both beauty and darkness exist within the story. And we are shown both of them so amazingly drawn by Miura. This scene also really makes me reminisce about the ball scene in the Golden Age arc with Casca in her dress. Oh man, good times. Ruined! Magnifico and Roderick are talking amongst themselves. Magnifico shit-talking his two brothers, Giorgio and Poliziano. I think I said those right. And their status both being above his own. They then witness some bickering between nobles of the fallen Midland capital and Shooter. They're once enemies during the 100 Years' War. From what I gather, all the nations are gathered here to unify in a retaliation against the Kushan Empire. But with no royal capital, no king, it's going to be chaos as to who will reclaim ultimate power. This guy named Owen shows up and calms them down a bit, trying to stop them from embarrassing Midland any further. And this character was actually shown very briefly in the Golden Age arc. He's a buddy of Lord Laban's, and the two of them were talking about Griffith and his strategies before the Battle of Doldry. See? There he is. Still with that stupid ass haircut. Magnifico and Roderick continue to talk about politics, and what I find interesting here is that the two of them actually talk about the repressive nature of how things are, and how Roderick in particular believes the rulers of the future world will need to expand and explore new lands beyond the sea. Now I know Berserk is never stated to actually take place in Europe, but it's a medieval story and that's kind of the basis of what's implied, and Roderick being a ship captain, and yeah, we're going to get to the boat stuff soon, don't worry. But I like this idea of exploring the world and opening things up to something new. Hell, maybe they'll find Vinland and be farmers. But then Farnese arrives, and okay, if I can't have Casca in a dress again, I'll accept this. Roderick halts his conversation to greet Farnese and asks her for a dance. Psh, yeah, there's no way he really likes her, right? He's totally not going to be a good character. He's a dick. Farnese's mom, who is still unnamed for some reason, calls Magnifico out on setting them up. Not in a bad way, but just as in a mother knowing the way her son thinks and pointing out that he's not as clever as he thinks he is. And also a warning that Farnese will not be at peace within the schemes of men. Outside, Shirke uses the old Jedi mind trick to mask their odd from the guards as they are able to walk right past. But as they approach, they notice a fog starting to seep into the city, and it feels similar to when they were on the beach before the Bashaka attacked. The guards scream from behind them, and our group turns around to see some sort of creature in the distance, only for it to run away. All this makes Guts think is, okay, we should probably hurry up with our business here. And I love how he's just so used to this shit by now that that's his go-to reaction. Shurike then suddenly gets a thought transference message from Serpico. He must have still held on to the hair granting him that ability. He tells her to lead the group to the rear entrance, and upon entering, something feels off. They are surrounded by pillars represented by real historical architecture, and Serpico steps forward with his sword drawn, telling them he will not allow them to see Farnese. He also directly refers to Guts, letting him know that he is willing to settle their score right here and now. Guts, without trying to talk him down or question this, just accepts. And I love that reaction. Guts recognizes that one, Serpico has always disliked him. So from day one, Serpico recognized the danger of Guts' life and what it could mean for Farnese if she stayed around and slowly he has watched Farnese grow more and more attached to Guts. Now, Serpico is Farnese's half-brother, so it's not a jealousy of another man, it's just literally the fear of her untimely death, dealing with monsters and demons, and even Guts himself. Two, Guts is a hardened warrior, and even though he and Serpico are very different and dislike each other most of the time, he respects Serpico as a fellow swordsman. A challenge like this is a sense of honor behind it. Serpico is not being evil or malicious, it's an honest duel with two men that have two different goals and ideals. Guts wants to talk to Farnese, and Serpico wants Farnese safe and secure. And these are not men who talk things out. Honestly, this was the exact correct time for them to fight. But, as we've seen before and admitted by Serpico plenty of times, he cannot win against Guts head-on. Guts is simply too overwhelmingly powerful. But just like last time on the edge of the cliff, Serpico has lured Guts into an area where it's impossible for him to swing his large sword without hitting one of the pillars. Guts needs range, and so he's going to have to either not swing or literally break multiple pillars in order to hit Serpico. Serpico, who is much quicker than Guts, at least when the Berserker armor is not in play. Serpico takes a huge risk, but it pays off as the first pillar was thick enough to stop Guts' sword. Serpico then counters and manages to brush Guts' cheek. So Guts whips the Dragon Slayer through the pillar, and Serpico continues to evade it. 
The strategy of this fight continues to be beautifully described. Serpico knowing his own sword can't pierce Guts' armor, so he waits for Guts to thrust, a better option than swinging in this location, and then attacks Guts' fingers. But Guts sees this coming and switches his grip so that Serpico hits his prosthetic hand instead. We then get a great image of Guts, seemingly holding back the Berserker armor's desire to take hold, meaning that not only is Guts harnessing some more control, but also that Serpico is enough of a threat that the armor wants to activate. But if it did, Serpico would be dead. And as much as Guts is treating this as a proper duel, I do not believe for a moment that Guts is actually willing to kill Serpico here, unless he absolutely had to. We also see some glimpses into Serpico's mindset, his ultimate fear. And then, even though he's been able to evade, Guts managed to destroy several pillars in the area. One more thrust, and Serpico manages to evade it again, but now rocks start to rain down above them. Guts uses the width of his giant sword to direct the rubble, and at last, Serpico is hit, buried in stone. Guts waits as the others run over horrified at his actions, and Serpico moves the stones off and sits up, simply asking Guts if he was able to read his movements just there. And Guts replies that no, the falling debris was just a lucky moment that he took advantage of. Serpico continues to sit, accepting his loss. And like a warrior, like a man, he owns it. Not cursing Guts' name, not bowing revenge, but knowing that the two went into this with two different intents and that one of them would be the victor. And I love it so much. And you know who didn't have that reaction? Griffith. Yeah. The pure honor amongst men here just gives me those manly tears. You know what I'm talking about? It really does. And it amazes Isidro, too. A boy whose original goal was to be a strong swordsman. To see two top-tier men do things like this, and Guts assuring him that neither went easy on one another, the only thing unused were supernatural elements. No berserker armor, and Serpico didn't have his wind cloak. Though Serpico wonders if he just simply didn't have the ability to push Guts far enough in order to use the berserker armor, but we as the audience know that for just a moment, he did. So Serpico asks what Guts plans to do when he sees Farnese, and Guts just says that he doesn't know, he just knows that he needs to see her. Shirke then lets Serpico know about the monster that they saw outside and that they need to hurry. Nice to not let him know that before the fight, that there's a giant monster outside, but yeah. But I guess, yeah, it really wouldn't have changed much. Serpico says he will guide them to Farnese, and then adorably, Shirke offers him his enchanted items back, the cloak and the feather sword. The cloak moves on its own, jumping back to Serpico, seemingly missing its owner, and even... A mostly emotionless man like Serpico gives a look like, aw oh, jeez, you guys. Back at the event, Federico Vandemion, Farnese's father, arrives and everyone looks to him to make an announcement. Basically, he is funding this entire war. Nations are kind of left to the point where this unification is needed and will be backed by the family that funds even the Holy See Church. But then Magnifico speaks up, ready to make his ultimate announcement of the engagement that he set up between Roderick and Farnese. I also love how a lot of the people don't even know who he is. <laughs> They're like, oh yeah, right, he's the other son. And he states to introduce his sister Farnese, and she's gone. Off looking through the crowd for Serpico, and it's pretty damn awkward and uncomfortable for Magnifico to say the least. If only some divine intervention could come down and save him from this embarrassment. How about the windows breaking open, fog rolling in, darkening the room, and only when someone grabs a candle do they see a demonic tiger ripping people apart and eating their insides. Yeah, I would say that's pretty much would do it to take the pressure off you. Good job, Magnifico. Yeah, so immediately a panic is ensued. All of these rich people start frantically running about. I mean, none of them have ever really seen a tiger before, let alone one enchanted with magic. It can only mean that the Kushan Empire is right on its way to the Holy City, and this is their way of saying hello. As the tiger approaches, wait, Roderick draws his sword. He's not running? He's telling people to stay back? Hmm. Okay, well, while Farnese recognizes this as something similar to when she faced uh, the creatures on the beach from before, and sees a silver candle holder, and it's such a sweet moment for her, her showing just how much she's learned, how her perception has increased, and unlike her depressive feelings of not being useful at the beginning of this arc, here she is just showing how important she is, and how far she's come from that frightened, insecure leader of the Holy Iron Chain Knights. In front of her entire family, she shows she's more skilled and brave than all of them combined. The tiger does eventually manage to knock her to the ground, but then, as if she's picked up by the wind itself, she sees Serpico, 
back to help her once more using his enchanted items as it has been properly attuned to just him, just as it's meant to be. Looking behind Serpico, Farnese sees the rest of her friends, here to back her up, and Guts drawing his sword ready to fight the beast, to the shock and awe of all the rich people watching. Guts splits the tiger in half with one swing and the audience applauds and wonders which nation's army that he fights for. It's been a long time since Guts has been in the eyes and spotlight of those with high rapport. But then, like a dozen more tigers show up. So Guts suggests that they all leave, but Farnese tells them that her whole family is here and that they need to help them. Guts just sighs and is like, ugh, okay. And Casca rushing up and grabbing Farnese's arm, showing that she missed her so much, is just too cute. So Guts readies up to fight the tigers as Serpico leaves to find the spellcasters controlling them, just as he did on the beach. But Guts isn't the only one. Isidro begins throwing his bombs, and Shurke shares that she has some enchanted thorn vine in order to have a quick defense against physical beings, as she hands Farnese a ring that will allow her to control them as well. I know this is kind of an ass pole since we didn't actually see Shurke make the item or enchant the item herself, but what's important here isn't the item, it's what it means for Farnese. Her friends don't come at her with anger or anything for her leaving them, they just continue where they left off, treating her as one of them, and Shurke even being like, here, you're ready for this level of magic, you got this. It's an overwhelming sense of just belonging. After so many wrong places, Farnese has confirmation that she's in the right one for her right now. Just then, a tiger is about to attack Guts, and Roderick intervenes? Wait, Roderick just protected Guts. Holy shit, wait a second, Roderick is still fighting? You guys, wait, Roderick is a badass. He states to Guts that he will fight for his beloved, Farnese. Like, wait, he actually really cares about her? And then Farnese uses the vines and lets Roderick know that he needs to use silver to bring down the beasts. It's already like a couple combo using strategy together and ah, uh, damn it, I ship it, okay? Meanwhile, Serpico is able to take down the spellcasters and so the tigers stop their assault. As Guts puts back his sword, he looks to Farnese and simply asks her, without any judgment, just something he needed to ask her face to face, is this her last stop? Does she truly not want to continue with them anymore? And if she says yes, I fully believe that Guts would have let her go. Not because he wanted to, but because it would be what's best for her. And Farnese takes a moment to reflect on this. And she states that she needed to come back here, to the place where she began, to where their journey started. That she missed it but ultimately, it's not where she belongs. And I think a lot of us come to this place in our lives. Life changes at such a quickening pace, and nostalgia can be the ultimate bitch. Sometimes looking back isn't enough. Sometimes we need to go back, but only to fully realize that we didn't need to go back. By coming back to where we came from, we may realize that nothing there has changed. What has changed is us. And there is a place for us out there. Somewhere on our travels, we will find it. Well, welcome back, everybody, to the 50th episode of the Berserk Manga Analysis. Happy birthday. Look at that. So, apparently, I have made 50 videos going over my thoughts and feelings on the entire story of Berserk, and we are only on volume 30. So, that's like three-fourths of the way complete of what's been released so far. But thanks for sticking with me, and whatever episode was your first that you watched, go ahead and comment that down below if you remember. I'd be really curious to know. Besides that, just thanks for sticking with me this far, and without any further delay, let's get back into the party that had been recently interrupted by Crashers of the Enchanted Tiger variety. So all the one percenters did see the magical beasts, and also saw Farnese, one of their own, fight against them using magic and despite saving them, they immediately become suspicious and fearful of her and her party. What's that age-old saying that you always fear what you don't understand? And you would think under the extreme conditions like this, people would unite together? <laughs> yeah, right. Have you seen Humanity and the recent outbreak? Toilet paper? Something like that? I don't know. They can also all see the elves that are there, and these are supposed to be all followers of the Holy See, so I guess being attacked by magical tigers opened up their eyes enough to be able to see elves. But as they get more aggressive, Farnese's father steps up, and they all remain silent to hear him out. He tells everyone the animals were sent from the Kushan, which is right, but that they were also not demonic in any way, and that Farnese didn't really use magic. He tells them that their drinks were drugged, and caused them to hallucinate and exaggerate what they were seeing. And I really like this because you can take this as 
maybe this is what he actually believes, but I would like to think that maybe, just maybe, impressed by his daughter Farnese, this is his way of protecting her. It doesn't make up for him never being around her entire childhood, but it's something. But just as he gets applause from everyone, the smoke in the room converges into the image of Emperor Ganishka himself, the Kushan leader and apostle. He declares a proclamation of war, letting them know that the tigers were only the beginning before the smoke dissipates. As well, the harbor of the city then ignites on fire. Pashaka crocodiles, more tigers, and coming off the boats are hundreds of Daka, all here to invade the city. A city in flames, just as Sonya had warned Shirake of. As well, Guts has never seen and possibly doesn't even know about Ganishka at all, so he wonders if he is involved with Griffith, not even knowing that they've both been battling each other this entire time. Also, with the harbor on fire, there goes any hope of our main group obtaining a ship. Oh wait, what's that? Roderick steps up and offers to give them a ride on his ship, which is a gigantic warship, and also he's even heard of their destination, Skelling Island? He even takes Magnifico aside and explains to him how he still wants to be Farnese's fiance, and this is basically an attempt for him to impress her. He looks at Guts, who is clearly, let's call it, the alpha of the group, and Roderick, with no fear, looks Guts face to face, taps him on the chest, and introduces himself properly. Keep in mind that Guts just split multiple demonic tigers in half with a gigantic sword, and Roderick steps up to him fearless. So the plan is now, follow Roderick to the ship. And you guys, Roderick is a motherfucking boss! I haven't loved a secondary character this much since Jerome. And man, I really miss Jerome, but Roderick is probably better for all of us. Magnifico also wants to come with them since he's too embarrassed to stay around with his father. Federico Vandemion, who immediately takes the role of like a general or organizer as everyone rushes to him for help and an explanation. Farnese looks back to him as they leave and I think with a little bit more respect and understanding of what he has to do and his responsibility to all the people. As well, Farnese's mother, who still doesn't have a name for some reason, watches her daughter leave with a smile on her face knowing that she has found her true place place after all of these years. One thing I love is Farnese asking them to stop real quick so that she can change out of the dress. It's a little thing that makes a lot of sense as it isn't the most functional thing to be wearing while trying to escape. Also, as she changes, it gives time for this moment to happen. Gut stands guard for her and is recognized by Owen, a former member of the Midland Army, before it was taken over. He calls Guts out and says that he knows for sure that he was the captain of the Raiders of the Band of the Hawk. Guts turns his back, saying that all of that is ancient history now, obviously hurt, and as always when the words Band of the Hawk are brought up, it triggers him deeply. Owen continues, though, and asks where Griffith is now. I'm sure Owen has heard of the rumors of Griffith's return and winning battles with the Kushan, and I'm sure he's just assuming that Guts is still with Griffith and part of the Band of the Hawks, if those rumors are true. Guts just has to walk away. I feel so bad for him in this moment. He wants to speak his thoughts, how he wishes he knew where Griffith was, but not to be saved. But what does he wish now? He can't bring himself to think about it. He knows they have to make it to the ship. He's been putting off vengeance to get Casca to safety, after all. The group asks who Owen was, but Guts says that he mistook him for someone else. And the crew walks away, leaving Owen probably a bit confused, to say the least. We then cut a bit away from the city, and we are introduced to the Holy See's Pontiff. In other words, the Pope. A man to represent the highest authority of the Holy See religion. He was supposed to go to Vertanus to be part of all the festivities. However, he is very old and sickly, so his journey is taking some time. Pope! It's a time to get up and put on your hat. It's a stupid hat. He's guarded by many and lays in his tent reflecting on his life. And what we get seems to be pretty depressing. He admits to living a luxurious life from birth and that he never had any true passion for anything, never feeling intense emotions of any kind, and was almost always comfortable. Becoming the pontiff was something that he fell naturally into, and this life of holiness kept him away still from any extreme emotion. Safety and comfortability into old age, and now close to his death, he feels as though he has regrets. Something to be said for always playing it safe. You don't want to end up like this guy. Then, in his dream, similarly to the mass collective dream sent out before, where the entire world had a vision of a white hawk preparing for Griffith's arrival, the pontiff has a similar dream and awakes to the sound of two children outside his tent. He tells his guards to let them in, and it's Sonia and Mule reciting a line that relates to the dream. 
He puts this together as fate or destiny showing him the way, that in the final days of his life he may find that intense purpose he always devoided up until now. They then get the news that Vertanus is under attack by the Kushan, and the Pontiff overrules everyone and tells them he has had a divine revelation, and that they will follow these children to the truth. Imagine now, Griffith has sent out these two in order to gain the support and authority of the absolute highest order of the Holy See. Control the people. He has the royalty with Charlotte. He has the history of the Band of the Hawk and their exploits, and now he has the religion. And I still theorize that the Holy See was part of the plan set into motion hundreds of years ago, a dominant control that can't be argued with and isn't allowed to be questioned. What better way for everyone to get on board with Lord Grifisu? Back in Vertanis, the Daka are annihilating the knights trying to fight them, but Guts and company jump into action, Guts cutting down several with one swipe, and oh look, Puck is doing something for a second. His puck spark. I'm honestly a little shocked that Miura actually remembered that he could do something like this. You know, where he can like temporarily blind people for a little bit. Sorry, I had to throw a little bit of shade. Check out my puck rant video if you want. Link is in the description. Farnese also continues to use the thorn snakes as well. And Roderick is super impressed, even commenting to Minifico about it. And I, I love it. I ship these two so hard. Dispensing with the Daka isn't enough though. As a Makara comes bursting through a wall. And then behind them, more Daka actually riding the enchanted tigers, which is a pretty fun image. Guts tells the others to face them as he takes down the Makara, letting Shurike know to help him if the armor takes over too much. Everyone jumps into the fray, except for Manifico, who is just useless, and will continue to be useless for the rest of the manga. <sighs> Guts faces the Makara, trying desperately to keep the armor at bay from taking him completely, and though he gets knocked through a wall and basically stabs the shit out of its skull while it's tossing him around, Guts does manage to kill it while still in control. The group then make it to the dock, only to see hundreds of Daka coming off a massive ship. After all Guts just went through, he decides that he now has no choice but to use the armor fully. But Shurike pleads with him to let her try something first. She notices the massive amount of flame starting around them and figures that she may be able to call upon a fire spirit to channel its power. As she begins the spell, Guts steps forward facing hundreds of the Daka in order to buy her time as her body stays docile during the spell. And as Shurike invokes the spell and enters the astral world, she begins getting swept up in the darkness of this fire. Because it was fire set with the intent to harm others and burn down a city, as well as the swirling souls of the recently deceased that have been burned down in this madness. But what keeps her grounded and saves her from becoming lost in the swarm is remembering what Guts said about her. The words, our girl, something to make her smile. It's similar to Guts becoming lost and grounding himself with the thoughts of Casca, those close human connections that can center us. As they wait for Shirke to do her thing, Guts stands on the piles of dead Daka corpses, slaying up more and more. And as he kills, his bloodlust fires up, as does his rage. And this image of the Beast of Darkness creeping up his back has some beautiful symbolism in all of it. Guts is being pushed. He's the 100 Man Slayer, he's the 100 Troll Slayer, and now the 100 Daka Slayer. But then above Shirake, a wheel of flame appears. She has harnessed the flame spirit and it channels itself through her and the flame wheel spins out and basically tramples all of the Daka in their way, running them down into ashes. Now once again, I can understand the argument that maybe Shirke is too powerful. Yes, there's the danger of her getting lost in the astral world or her body being attacked while she's in there, but being as she's a main character, the chances of those happening are dim. It's not like the consequences of Guts's body and senses being damaged when he invokes the full potential of the Berserker armor. But this is also why Shirake is so valuable. Not just being a likable and fun character, she's extremely important to the group as far as these kind of situations go. If she were ever separated from them, or God forbid, taken out, it would be a devastating blow. And I really don't want that to happen, but looking at the evidence, if you want to take a real hit to the group where it hurts, Shurike would be the one to target. Until that time, she will continue to do her witchy magic and take out hundreds of enemies at once to the shock and awe of all around her. As she comes back into consciousness, as the spirit finishes what it was requested of, she asks about everyone's safety, and Guts assures her that yes, thanks to her, everyone is fine, and that she did a great job. So after Shurike channeled such a powerful magical attack, her body is exhausted and our daddy Guts gives her a piggyback ride. It's probably the most adorable thing that I've ever seen. 
And can you imagine Black Swordsman Art Guts doing this? Just absolutely incredible. Cute times don't last long, though, as the group is soon surrounded by several Makara this time, and with Shurike too weak to invoke another spell, which I want to say first that I like because we talked last time about magic making her a little bit too OP, so the idea that she would be physically weakened afterwards is a good consequence that they'll get rid of here in a few minutes, but that leaves Guts no choice at the moment. If they want to get past these monsters, he needs to use the Berserker armor. Only now we are left with the possibility that due to Shurikade's weakened state, if Guts loses his sanity, as he had before, she won't be able to enter his mind and ground him. So the helmet clamps down and Guts bum rushes through, well, the guts of a Makara. Serpico returns to his concerned knowledge that Guts may turn on them in this state, and this is also the first time that Roderick and Manifico are seeing the Berserker armor in action. And we get a few great panels of Guts doing his thing, but my favorite image is this one with the flowing cloak, and it always kind of reminded me out of something like Spawn, and how his cape would always look when he was kind of sitting on the cross. I don't know, it's just some really great imagery. But even though we just had the buildup of the fact that Shurike couldn't help, here she is inside of Guts' consciousness anyway. Uh, okay, just go with it, I guess. At least at the beginning point, she doesn't have any influence and is more so just seeing through Guts' eyes and showing us how the armor skews his vision into showing everything like a mass blob of evil entities to face down. It's kind of similar to how things look during the fall of the Tower of Conviction, if you ask me, how all the restless souls of the dead were collecting into this black wave engulfing everything. Guts lands on a ship, a Kushan ship, with some pretty exaggerated architecture to say the least, and on this ship, literally floating in midair, is in fact a human character, the old man who we saw briefly after Guts and company defeated the Pashaka on the beach before they entered the city of Vertanis. He was shocked then that his Pashaka could be defeated by humans, and he's shocked again, but I like how it's more of an intrigue from him than anything similar to fear. He introduces himself as, oh god, here we go, Para Marisha Sen Ani Daiba. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but we're just going to call him Daiba. He's fascinated about the other culture's magic and wants to know more about it. He uses very Eastern terminology from philosophy and religions like Hinduism towards his character, which I think is a really cool touch. For example, he says Guts wraps himself in the Prana of Durga. Prana is used a lot in Hinduism and whatnot to describe life energy or breath energy, so it's yet another word for ode, which is what Shurke and Flora would call the same thing. Your chi, your ki, life energy, whatever you want to call it. And then Durga is a Hindu warrior goddess, and from what I understand, it can refer to unleashing wrath in a protective motherly way against evil and wickedness. So Guts wrapping himself in the prana of Durga is like he's represented by protective energy striking down enemies, which is basically the entire point of his character right now, so it very much makes sense. Daiba also challenges Guts, calling him Shartariya, I, I don't know how to pronounce that at all, but it's another Hindu term dealing with being a warrior. So obviously, despite being on the side of the Kushan, Daiba holds respect for his enemies here, which is really cool to see, and already makes him way more of an interesting character than Ganishka himself, in my opinion. Ganishka just being big and evil and power hungry, but Daiba having more of a, let's call it, personality to him. Daiba then creates a tornado seemingly with no effort whatsoever, with Guts trying to evade it. Shurike tries to awaken Guts to communicate with him and have him gain some conscious control over the armor rather than fighting ravenously. She tells him to open his eyes, which is kind of rude, don't you think, since he only has one eye? But Guts uses his sword, uh, he uses like the, the girth of his sword, I, I really don't like using that word, but uh, to lighten his fall from the tornado, which winds up making Daiba just create more tornadoes, all while he is just floating in midair and meditating clearly showing that his magic is very different from Shurke's, which is pretty cool as well because seeing as how we had one idea of how magic worked, seemingly it was the only way that magic worked, entering the astral world and borrowing power from a spirit, but the Kushan style of magic deals more with, like I said, Eastern philosophies and manipulating life energy itself. It makes both theories of thought valid whether you want to invoke power from the spiritual or from the natural. As a mask from the ship comes toppling down towards the other characters, who, let's face it, are pretty much useless when Guts is doing his thing, Guts jumps down and blocks it, effectively saving all of them from being crushed. And Roderick commends Guts on his power and skill, giving the man an honest compliment because we all know Roderick is a motherfucking boss.
But even if Serpico is still skeptical of Guts' loyalty in the armor, he did just save them. And then Guts turns around to showcase the helmet of the armor looking much different and speaking to them, effectively proving that Guts, with the help of Shurike, has gained control over the armor over his Beast of Darkness. Now, I gotta say something that might piss a few of you off, but I absolutely hate the look of this form of the armor. I think it looks really silly, it's off-putting, and it's kind of like a discount Batman mask. I don't want Guts to be Batman. Oof, and you know, I would honestly much rather Guts have the mask down or not on at all and see Guts' face. This doesn't even look like armor, it looks like a superhero mask, and I don't want to see Guts as a superhero. But keep in mind, I'm only talking about the design itself, not the concept. So let's look at the concept. Okay, I think many people get me wrong when I say that Guts needs to overcome his Beast of Darkness. The Beast of Darkness is a representation of Guts's inner trauma, rage, and negativity. Now, Guts does get a massive power boost by feeding into that darkness. And the Berserker armor brings those thoughts and feelings to the surface. It channels the Beast of Darkness, but at the expense of Guts's own sanity. Now, even though Guts does get a power boost from the Beast of Darkness, that does not mean that he needs the Beast of Darkness to access that power. The Beast of Darkness isn't a real thing. It's just Guts. It's a different part of who he is as a person. So any power that the Beast gives him is his own power regardless. So when I say that he needs to get rid of the Beast of Darkness, that doesn't mean that Guts would lose any power by doing so. That power would still be rechanneled and come from a positive place rather than from a negative one. And in concept, I think that's what's happening with the armor change. Gut still has access to all the armor's power and benefits. It's still drawing the same strength from within him, from what he would get from the Beast of Darkness, but with his consciousness in control and not going in a bloodthirsty instinct kind of way. He is controlling that power however he wants. Does that make more sense? It's like if you get really angry and pissed off and you are pumped up, you might be able to lift more than you could at just your base potential. But that power is in you regardless. So if you could find a way to channel it through something other than negativity, it would still be within you to do. Like this moment following, where Guts thinks about how much he wants to kill Daiba, his helmet clamps down, and then he pulls himself back. It's the same power, but with two different intents. One is to kill, and one is to protect. It's further grounded by Shurike's next quote, where she says, Anger, fury, they draw out the armor's power, but you must never yield everything over to them. Guts also asks Serpico to join him in the battle, and I like this as, yeah, I want to see Serpico fight and not just stand around, but for Guts, it's that he trusts him as someone to fight alongside him, to have his back. And as he and Guts try to get around the tornadoes, Isidro throws one of his bombs and actually hits Daiba. And I gotta hand it to the little bastard, he was the first one to get an actual hit in. But this just annoys Daiba and causes him to call forth a kundalini. So in Berserk, a kundalini is a really powerful pishaka, which is one of the enchanted animals, and it's a sea snake that's engulfed with water, basically making a giant water snake. One that can't be cut down because, well, it's made of water. Kundalini is actually a really complex term, and again, used a lot in Hinduism and spirituality, and has to do with the energy that runs through our spines and the human body, and having a kundalini awakening relates to accessing a higher level of spirituality or vibration. But through some research on the terminology, it appears that kundalini represents a noun that can be used for snake in the sense of a snake being coiled up, so perhaps ready to strike. Guts goes for the actual snake body inside the water body, kind of like aiming for the weak point of a boss in a video game or something, whereas Serpico is trying to go straight for Daiba himself and almost manages to get him. Then all that talk about Shurke being too weak to enact another spell, well, Guts is like, hey, try it anyway, and lo and behold, it works. Eh. I mean, it is a little annoying, but then again, we do want the fighting the snake thing not to go on forever because there are bigger fish to fry here, so I get it, I'll go with it. She enacts the, the flame wheel once again, or the concept of it at least, but this time, 
using it to heat up Guts' sword and propel him kind of like a fireball through the Kundalini, hitting its target and destroying the giant snake. Daiba then begins falling to the ground, but calls something called a Garuda in midair, and this giant Rodan-looking bird swoops in and catches him. And I'm assuming the Daiba is also a Pashaka similar to the one he just called, but as of what kind of bird or what magic is involved with this thing, I don't really know, and it's not really explained here, so we'll just kind of go with it once again. But he doesn't get a pretty escape, as appearing in the sky is a lightning and mist form of Ganishka himself, the leader of the Kushan Empire. And in cliche evil villain fashion, he is displeased with Daiba's failure and zaps him with lightning. Like, really dude? Daiba is insanely powerful and your ultimate enemy is a god hand, but you're going to zap him with lightning because he failed a little bit? I always got annoyed with villains like this, like they have no regard for the bigger picture and it's just an attempt to show how mean and evil they are. You can get away with it a little bit sometimes like when Darth Vader keeps choking out admirals because there's an endless supply of admirals that you can keep promoting. But Daiba is a very unique individual and it's not like he has an army of magicians just like him ready to go. Daiba does remain alive, yes, but still, I think it's a little too much to do to someone that seems to be that valuable to you, especially during this time where you're trying to fight a god hand. Anyway, Ganishka then asks Guts if he's with the Hawk, since Ganishka has no idea who Guts even is. He's just some dude that's been killing his invading creatures. His first bolt of lightning is deflected by Serpico's Sylph Sword, but Ganishka has an endless supply of lightning, so it won't be a valid deflection for very long. Guts does get hit with it, and it appears to harm him, even while he's wearing the Berserker armor, which is supposed to suppress all feelings of pain. It's actually such a powerful blast that it actually knocks Shurike out of Guts' consciousness, and she returns to her own physical body. Guts uses his sword as a lightning rod once to block the next bolt, but considering Ganishka states that his lightning can eviscerate apostles, that still says a lot for the power of the armor that Guts is wearing. He asks if Guts is one of the Hawk's captains, which is triggering since he once was, but Guts stands telling him that he is 100% human and not to count him in with one of those monsters. Oh, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this famous fan translation where Guts says that he's not one of those faggot-ass monsters. And just for the life of me, I could never picture Guts seriously using the word faggot in any context, but that exists out there. Ganishka then realizes Guts is branded, and in that, he asks Guts if he wants to join him in his conquest against Griffith. But Guts gives the most Guts answer ever and says that he does not give a shit about a feud between two monsters, proving once again that Guts is a representation of strength and what it means to be human. This is what's so inspiring about him as a character. After all of everything that he's experienced, he is distinctly himself and refuses to be anything but. And Roderick is super impressed, so I think we all should be. As Ganishka prepares for another attack, though, the Daka on the docks nearby are being ripped apart by a new force entering the city. That of the one and only motherfucking Zod! Zod is leading a charge of apostles from the new band of the Hawk into Vertanus to combat Ganishka's monsters, some of which are directly redrawn from the Eclipse, showing that Griffith has most of the apostles in the world on his side. A bunch of flying apostles head towards Ganishka, but sends out dozens of lightning strikes, crashing them all into the ground. Zod then perches on top of a building like the badass that he is, and everyone looks up to see him. Farnese recognizing him from Albion, an interesting touch since she stayed back during the battle at Flora's mansion, so she wouldn't have seen Zod there, and this would be the first time she's seen him since the Tower of Conviction, so that's a nice attention to detail and continuity. I like it, Miura. Zod gets hit with lightning too, but he takes it like a champ, and continuously flies through Ganishka, but since he's made of mist and smoke, it does no damage to him, and he can't get Ganishka to dissipate. Eventually, Zod is hit enough times that he, even he, the mighty Zod, falls from the sky. And he lands right on top of Guts. Nani? That's really gotta hurt. So after Zod's legendary entrance, on top of Guts. Nani? 
We get a little flashback of the new Band of the Hawk before they departed on their various missions. And we see Grunbelt here. And I want to say we see him for the first time since Flora's Mansion, thus completely confirming that he's still alive. Which, I said before, I feel is a missed opportunity to give Flora's death and that moment that she had a little bit more meaning when she helped our cast escape. But, anyways, Sonia is here and she speaks with Zod. She shares some information given to her by whatever medium powers that she possesses. And she says that Zod would need to make a choice between making the one he's drawn to his enemy again, or use him as a weapon. She doesn't elaborate, and Zod just kind of takes it as, well, that's how prophecies are. And I really like that we get, though a very brief, some characterization for Zod. I wouldn't say it's development per se, but it's good to remind us that despite Zod's desire for battle, he's not a mindless monster. In fact, he may be one of the wisest characters living in the physical world, having seen so much, experienced so many life or death moments, and discarding all that doesn't fall within what matters to him. But back in the present, Zod bursts out of the water with guts on his back. Guts realizing that he is in a perfect position to sever Zod's head. Imagine this perfect scenario for him. And then he is distracted by a flash of Ganishka's lightning. Oh yeah, that giant mist motherfucker, he's still here. Mist which Shuriken informs Guts that Ganishka conjures from water and wind elementals that surround his ethereal body with them. And it's cool how that's thrown in since it makes more sense how no damage is being done to Ganishka because it's not even him. It's him controlling the very elementals in that area. It's like when Shurike enters the astral world and conjures the power of elementals to use. Ganishka is essentially doing the same thing here, but his physical body doesn't even need to be here. He can send his ethereal self out to do the dirty work, so any physical weapons or beings will pass right through him with no damage done to Ganishka himself. To harm him, you would literally have to be able to cause injury on an astral level. Well, oddly enough, we have learned that Guts' sword, the Dragon Slayer, has been seeped with enough blood of astral creatures, you know, apostles, trolls, the Daka, and more, that it has enhanced the weapon itself to harm on an astral level. It's like when Guts was trapped in Cliphoth with Slam. She slashed his body, but also harmed his ethereal self, his astral form, his soul, whatever you want to call it. Well, Guts believes that he can cause that same kind of damage with his sword, and he's willing to try it. And also, here we get the prophecy of what Sonya told Zod. Does he battle with Guts, or use Guts to aid him? And the very best part about it is that Zod is the one in the vulnerable position here. Zod cannot beat Ganishka, and Zod could be killed by Guts here. So does Zod give in to his pride and refuse help from his enemy, or does he team up? And as Shurike pinpoints where Ganishka's actual ethereal body is in the mist, Guts pierces through that bitch with the aid of his new transportation vehicle, the motherfucking Zod! It's a glorious moment, with a glorious two-page spread by Miura. Guts did it, his sword wounded Ganishka's ethereal self so much that his vessel of wind and water elementals disappears, and he wakes up far away with a new scar on his face. Similar, like I said, to Guts' body scar from Slan. He was wounded from the astral world into the physical. The smoke and fog throughout the city also dissipate when this happens. Daiba, who is still alive, says that the remaining Daka and Pashaka will commit suicide as not to be captured. Man, the Daka seriously have the worst luck. Imagine being birthed from a violated woman in a weird vat of tied up apostles, forced to go into battle, but you wind up battling guts who just cuts through you like butter, and then if you somehow manage to live through it all, now you have to commit suicide. That, that's just some shitty luck. Anyway, Zod and Guts crash landed once again, and Zod arises looking as godly as ever. Meanwhile, Guts is kind of feeling the pain of the day setting in. Zod tells Guts to stand up if he wants to fight, and Guts does. That beast of a man, after being tossed around, beat up, struck by lightning, and everything else, somehow manages to stand. But Zod tells him that they will have their duel another time. Zod realizing that if they were to fight right now, Guts would be easy prey. And that's not what Zod wants. Zod knows Guts has it in him to be his equal, but after so much fighting already, it wouldn't be a worthy match. 
Another apostle shows up telling Zod he should just kill Gut since he's their enemy, but showing the difference between Zod and most apostles, Zod shuts him up quick, once again stating that they're not here to indulge. It's the same thing he said when he was outside of the Eclipse, the only apostle seen to actively refuse to partake in the experience. In fact, besides using his teeth to rip people apart in battle, we have never actually seen Zod eat a human being, which seems to be what most all other apostles care about. It boils down to, Zod does have honor. Whoever he was before becoming an apostle, Zod has maintained a sense of what's right and wrong when it comes to battle. Choosing not to kill Guts while he's in a vulnerable state, and to wait until Guts is at full strength, isn't a man who wants to slay his enemies, it's a man who respects them. The only difference is this. Seeing that Zod is here, Guts asks if Griffith is too. And if Guts planned to attack Griffith, well then, Zod admits that the army of apostles would tear him apart. Even if Zod still refused, even he could not fend off hundreds of apostles for the sake of Guts. But then Serpico jumps between Guts and Zod. And I hope nobody thinks that this is Serpico attempting to challenge Zod to a fight. He's protecting Guts here from doing anything that would get him killed. Reminding Guts that he said earlier that he doesn't care about feuds between monsters. This being the case, and helping to ground Guts as he looks at his comrades, and Takaska especially, Guts stands down and tells Zod to leave. Zod obliges. Now, some people have theorized that this moment, and this clear understanding that there is some respect between these two warriors, could indicate that Guts and Zod would team up again someday. I don't know if that will be the case, but it does certainly show that depending on the circumstance, if there was a common goal, they do make a destructive team. Guts collapses immediately after from exhaustion and pain. The team rush to him and carry him to a small boat in order to get to Roderick's ship. Roderick himself notes how heavy the armor is and is amazed that Guts had the stamina that he did while wearing it. Oh, also Azan is in the boat, uh, the guy that was in the Holy Iron Chain Knights with Fernice and Serpico, but now has had a midlife crisis and doesn't take off his helmet. I, I, I don't know, it's not really important yet, so we can ignore it for right now. Anyway, as the group rows to Roderick's ship, Guts is drifting in and out of consciousness. But as he looks to the hilltop from the ocean, he can just barely make out the image of a man on a horse. It's Griffith. He's arrived just as Guts and company are leaving, watching them go calmly and quietly as Guts drifts back to sleep. Again, some would say, why doesn't Griffith attack them? They aren't his priority. Guts is Griffith's enemy, but to Griffith, Guts doesn't pose a threat. He is here to battle Ganeshka. Guts being here in the first place was just a happenstance of causality, I guess you could say. But there also is the idea that maybe Griffith refuses to get close to the group because of Casca. On the hilltop of swords, Griffith saved Casca from the falling debris, perhaps due to the demon child being part of his physical vessel. That being the case, being near Casca could be a weakness for him. Best not to even try to test it. The next day, we get glimpses of the state of things from the other characters. The nobleman Owen exits the city, seeing all of the Daka bodies that now look like humans upon their death. Also, all of the Makara have turned back into whales, along with all the other animal Bashakas. Salat and his Bakiraka bodybuilders watch silently from a distance, currently refraining from being on either side. Farnese's father, Lord Vandemian, is informed that the Kushan Second Strike is on the way. From the looks of it, it's their entire army, and Miura just goes apeshit on these drawings and double-page spreads, showing the vastness of this army. All humans this time, as the Daka are no more, but it is a sight to behold. Ganishka is even with them, being driven on top of several of the war elephants. He's hoping to take over the city of Vertanis with his overwhelming force of numbers. Arrows start raining down, elephants start trampling people, and soldiers are charging forward. It would seem to go as planned. Until, inevitably, the new band of the Hawk begin to arrive. First Irvine the Archer taking out heads. Raxus, the former Kushan, turned apostle, spooking the elephants back towards their own army. And then coming from seemingly nowhere, like using a portal, and not quite a portal, but we'll get to that later. Griffith arrives with the entire band of the Hawk, human and apostle alike. This moment reminds me of an upscale version of the Battle of Doldry from the Golden Age arc. Here is Griffith doing his thing, being a leader and orchestrating a perfect attack, just as he always had when he was a human. 
The Kushan are startled, confused, and don't know where the army this large could have possibly been hiding. Well, it's not revealed to us just yet, but we do get images of the other big names. Locus is here, Grunveld, and motherfucking Zod! <laughs> is back for round two, slashing his way through the Kushan army. All happens within the witnessing eyes of the people. We see it through Mr. Vandemian, through Owen, and Salat, but it's all happening in front of everybody that's important. This is why Griffith has waited. It wasn't about defeating Ganishka. It was about defeating him in front of the people, having a glorious return, letting them know that this is the Band of the Hawk, being their hero, a savior, the Hawk of Light. Ganishka's ride has stopped, and before a soldier can yell to his emperor to escape, he is beheaded. Griffith is here, in front of him, face to face at last. Ganishka trembles, but the most fascinating part is that Griffith being here in front of him, or should I say Femto, being here, makes Ganishka feel calm. In the order of the demonic, the god hand is truly a messianic figure. Everyone who is in the presence of such power and status feels it. Ganishka is no different. But he tries to fight it. He wants to remain in his anger and fulfill his own ego. He pulls upon the part of him that doesn't want to submit to that order. Salat has also made his way in, watching all of this go down from a distance, only recently finding out that Ganishka was an apostle, and now seeing this. And seeing him transform into his mist-like form before Griffith. And I gotta say, as much as we hate Griffith, I can't help but think he's a little bit of a boss here as he just continues to walk forward towards Ganishka like it's nothing. Griffith has his men destroy the carriage that they're in, so Ganishka is exposed to the outside world. And at that moment, a huge gust of wind sweeps over him, something Griffith no doubt had also planned. If the wind is too strong for the mist to stay in one place, then Ganishka can't maintain his form without being blown away. He has no choice but to transform back into his human form. And what an insult that would be for an apostle, forced to change back. Griffith is putting him in his place. Ganishka unwillingly has wound up on his hands and knees, making it look as though he is bowing to Griffith. The emperor in front of his entire army, bowing to another man. That would be powerful imagery to all who are there to witness it. But Griffith gives Ganishka another chance. He tells him that he will agree to have their final battle in the royal capital of Midland a very poetic setting for many reasons, and there's definitely another reason why Griffith wants to have it there that's not yet revealed. And since Ganishka has been humiliated enough for one day, he accepts. He takes what's left of his army and they begin to retreat. Everything has gone according to the plan that Griffith had set up from the start. What will happen next was the point of having this war to begin with. As the Kushans leave and everyone watches with awe, they begin to ask, what army was this? Who caused them to retreat? Who saved us? Who do we have to thank for this heroism? And as these questions are being asked and the victory cheers are being yelled, Griffith stands before all of them, removing his helmet and showing them that the Hawk is here. It's a moment of triumph as the entire Kushan army retreats in the wake of just a few hundred soldiers. As the people of Britannus try to understand just how this could have happened, they begin to recognize the symbol on the soldiers' flags, a symbol that is recognizable as that of the Band of the Hawk, a legendary mercenary band that helped Midland win the 100-year war against Tudor just a few years ago. Griffith here, without his helmet and riding slowly towards the crowd on his horse, in this moment, this is the moment that he's been waiting for and the moment all of the spectators have been waiting for as well. Griffith revealing himself at the proper moment. After the Kushan have incited enough fear into the minds of the people, after he has built up his reputation, and after those knowledgeable enough who would already recognize his affiliation. Federico Vandemian, who we know better as being Farnese's father, being also the highest status noble of Britannus, begins to walk forward to talk with Griffith. Griffith declares himself the commander of the Liberation Army and the Army of Midland. This causes a stir and some commotion, as you would imagine, as many are clearly thankful for Griffith's efforts, but they are still subject to the rules of mankind, and someone just can't come in and declare themselves the ruler of anything, despite how skilled they may be. 
A few former members of Midland's army are here in the crowd, and they argue that only those of noble lineage have the right to say such a thing. Then Locus, one of the apostles in his human form, throws some shade their way, telling them that part of the Midland army's duties is to defend the kingdom to the last man. And where, as they have been here, safe retreating into Britannus, Griffith's Band of the Hawk has been fighting on the front lines the entire time, this giving them more of a right to call themselves Midland's army than the actual nobles here. Once more, to help settle things and shocking everyone, Princess Charlotte arrives on the scene. She was thought to have been missing or captured by the Kushan, as she was, but thanks to Griffith, she was rescued and is now here as technically the highest authority there is in the world of politics. Also, I still stand by the fact that Charlotte did nothing wrong, and everything she does here is based on her feelings for Griffith, which are not her fault. With the power, status, and magnetism Griffith has, any woman would fall for him, especially one he singled out to actually give his attentiveness to. She's a pawn in his games, but she's still just a girl in love with her savior. She even looks to Griffith for encouragement to speak in front of all the people, and his smile is all that she needs. And with her authority, Princess Charlotte declares him the supreme commander of the Midland Army and as her fiancé. It's actually the character of Owen, who's been hanging around during the last few events that we've seen, who admits that he sees the justification for this, as he and the other Midland nobles who escaped have just been hiding, and that fighting on the front lines, rescuing the princess, and having the back catalog of single-handedly winning a war for Midland has put Griffith into the most ideal position as leader. And it's hard to argue with any of that, despite him being of common birth. The one little fact that seems to have no weight in light of the current circumstances. Federico, on the other hand, brings up the point that this war doesn't belong to just Midland, but is also that of a holy war, and affects all nations under the Holy See religion. The religion so willfully followed, it allowed men like Mazgus to exist, that it would detach us from the spiritual and make people literally blind to magical creatures, the Holy See, an authority even greater than that of the royal politics. Surely Griffith would still be subject to whatever decrees the Church of the Holy See would deem were right. Until the Pontiff himself shows up as the next part of Griffith's team. Pulling up in a carriage, the Pope of the Holy See himself. This decrepit old man that was nearing the end of his life, having a vision of a white hawk, and then being swept up by Mule and Sonia, whom Griffith set out to recruit him. The Pontiff greets everyone and then, to the shock and awe of the entire crowd, he deliberately falls flat on his face, prostrating himself to Griffith. Now, this is a practice that we've seen before in Berserk. The reason Mazgus' face looked like it did, flat and robotic, also representation of his personality, is because he prostrated to God every single day without fail, willingly making himself weak before the power and grace of a higher being. It's a way to show servitude and admission of your own weakness in the presence of something that's greater than you. To show your own loyalty to that higher purpose. For the pontiff, the fucking pope, the highest authority of God on earth, in the minds of humanity at least, for him to do this, to Griffith, proves that Griffith has the most dangerous authority there is. Divine authority. If people believe there is a holiness to something, they can justify anything in order to follow and uphold that ideal. This is how Mazgus got to his level and why he was so terrifying. Mazgus believed everything that he did had divine righteousness on his side. Despite all the cruel and horrifying things that he did, he did it with the purpose that he was doing the right thing and truly believed in that fact. If Griffith now is seen as having the same divine authority as the text of the Holy See itself, but will then have even more since he's a walking, talking, breathing person, people will willingly do anything for him no matter the order. Would you betray God and risk the punishment? This is how you trap the people. If you want to contribute Griffith being like the Antichrist, fooling humanity that he is the savior when he's not, that's a good analogy, but therein lies the issue. It's not the people's fault. They have become manipulated thanks to the ideas and rules of the physical world, kingdoms and religions. This is all stuff that we allow to rule us. We give it power. And this is what I believe is happening with Griffith. The people are willingly giving over their power to him by putting their faith in him and in the systems that rule them. 
Guts is completely an individual outside of this nonsense, but most people will never have the strength to struggle. It's much easier to just be a good little boy or girl and follow what the world is telling you is right and wrong. The pontiff here, before he had his dream of revelation of the hawk, was questioning his entire life and all of the choices that he made in the name of the Holy See. On his deathbed, he still didn't know if he lived the right kind of life by following it. And then Griffith shows up and confirms his entire ideology by showing him the Hawk of Light is real and here to save everybody. He explains his revelation to everyone, confirming that Griffith is the Hawk of Light. And remember in the middle of the Conviction Arc, there was a dream that was sent out to everyone from the depths of the world of idea, that collective consciousness that we all share. The fact that we are all connected as part of life and the universe. Everyone had a dream of a white hawk coming to save them. The dream was meant to lay even more of that groundwork. It was like Griffith performing an inception on all mankind. As the pontiff tells everyone, they all remember the dream. And if everyone had the same dream, how can this be denied? It was holy and sacred. It meant something important. It was when the world began to change. Just before the Kushan invasion, and just before the astral world began to slowly overlap into the physical. The domino that started the chain reaction that led us here. With that, there is no more room for denial. The people stare in awe of the Savior and praise his name that the Hawk of Light is here at last. Meanwhile, far away from the city of Rutanus on the ocean, Roderick's warship has set sail with our main group of characters and Roderick's entire ship crew. They're all heading towards Skelling Island, which holds Puck's homeland, Elfhelm. Isidro does some training with Azan, who has wound up here because he was sleeping on a boat that Guts and the others escaped on. Even though Serpico obviously recognizes him from when they were both part of the Holy Iron Chain Knights, Azan refuses to admit who he is or even take off his helmet, due to his own embarrassment of being dismissed from the Holy Sea Knights. If only he could see what's going on in Vertanus right now, he has no idea how lucky he is. Roderick's crew comments on the group of travelers on the ship, but Roderick, being the motherfucking boss that he is, tells them not to worry and to treat the guests well, especially Farnese, whom he actually has an affection for because Roderick is a goddamn gentleman. Inside the ship, Shurike is giving Farnese more lessons in the way of magic, particularly how to enter and navigate the astral world. She has her lay down and detach from the physical. To be in her mind and let herself create sort of a replica of her physical body in the astral world. It's like giving your soul a shape. This is creating a luminous body. With a luminous body, one is able to freely explore the astral world with a consciousness attached. Instead of just being a floating spirit, your ego has complete control of the body. I like how Fernice has a moment to talk here after her rescue because there wasn't much time for her to do so with all of the action happening and we didn't get to see how she was feeling. She admits here to her feeling useless and wanting to run away and to run back to what was comfortable. But it wasn't that it was comfortable in a positive way, it was just what she was used to. And this world of magic, of guts and monsters, was scary and she felt as though she didn't have a place in it. But after they all came to get her, she felt more of a sense of purpose. Just the same, Shurike spent most of her life thus far in a forest far away from humanity at large and viewing humanity mostly as savages. And let's be real, we mostly are. But again, through this group that Guts somehow brought together, Shurike has found the value in human connections and now has become a teacher to someone else, showing Farnese the ways of magic and bonding in ways that both of them never thought were possible. Guts is on the ship looking down at Costco when suddenly his vision goes blurry. And this page scared the shit out of me when I first read it. One, because I have really bad eyesight and get scared at the thought of being blind someday. And two, because as Guts used the Berserker armor in Britannus, its residual effects come back to haunt him. It's already been mentioned that his taste buds have been diminished, and now his eyesight is momentarily disrupted. His senses are slowly getting weaker. And as he gives in to his beast of darkness, he slowly becomes less of a human, so to speak, looking at the very senses that make us have a life worth living going away. Roderick walks up to Guts like the badass he is, and they have a bro moment. Roderick then asking Guts what Casca is to him. Remember, Roderick doesn't really know anything about Guts other than he's an amazing fighter. 
Hell, Farnese, Serpico, and Isidro still don't even know Guts' history with Griffith or anything about the Band of the Hawk or the Eclipse. Guts goes to answer Roderick, but with him cut back to Farnese re-entering her body. Her luminous form was hovering above them, and she didn't want to hear Guts' answer. It's one thing to know the truth, that Guts loves Casca, but to actually hear it from his lips, it really puts the nail in the coffin. If Farnese has her crush on Guts, hearing that from him would just hurt her. Even though she has an awesome guy like Roderick here, but I, I get it. The next scene that happens is Casca wanders up on the mast of the ship where she could easily fall off. Guts instinctively rushes over to help her, but she, being afraid of him ever since he attacked her that one time, flinches and retreats back, causing herself to fall. Guts, without thinking, reaches out his left hand to grab her, his left hand that is no longer a hand, but metal in the shape of a hand. A hand that cannot grab unless magnetized like to the hilt of a sword. She falls into the ocean, and then Guts dives after her. Now, I want to say that Spired made an amazing video on this scene alone, and I recommend that you all go and check that out. The link will be in the description below. Tell them Ryan sent you, but I'll still cover the gist of what I get out of this scene, despite Spire doing a way better job at explaining it than I ever could. Guts recounts how every time Casca is near water, something like this has happened. Falling during the battle with Shooter, and Casca letting herself fall near the waterfall just before her and Guts can find in each other and made love. Guts manages to get Casca onto a lifeboat that Roderick immediately rode out to them because he's a boss like that, but then Guts falls back into the water and begins to sink. Weak from his previous battles, heavy due to his metal arm, and exhausted from it all. Reminded of all the bad memories. It would be so much easier just to sink, and when it comes down to the negativity and depression in our own lives, it's often like the darkness of the ocean pulling us down, wanting us to sink, and that it is easier. It's the easier choice to just let it take you. Guts awakes in a bed on the ship surrounded by his friends who rescued him. Actually, it was only Roderick who rescued him. God, what a motherfucking boss this guy is, let me tell you. They let him know that Casca is okay too, and they all leave the room except for Shurike, who needs to reapply the talisman over Guts' brand that dulls the brand's effects. Looking at his metal arm, now detached, an arm that was specifically made in order to help him fight, to destroy, built with the intent of violence, not protection. It couldn't do what mattered most, save Casca. Gut speaks probably the best and most profound quote in the entire series of Berserk when he says, Even if you force back what is lost, it won't be the way that it was. This means so much and is such an important lesson in life. For one, it does literally refer to his false arm, replacing what is lost and it not being the same. But even more so than that, it refers to the whole idea of wanting Casca back. Guts's old life is gone, and as much as he wants it back, too much has happened since then. The world has changed. He has changed. He is not the same person he was during those days. And Casca isn't either. And if Casca's mind can be restored, she will be a different person regardless. Guts won't be able to just go immediately back to that relationship like they were. There are a new set of circumstances and changes in who they are as people and thus many new obstacles to overcome. It's a brutal realization and one that Guts has been aware of, but again, it's different when you put things into words. Even look at this drawing. Look at the scars on Guts' body. Burns from Ganishka's lightning. The wound on his chest from Slan that also wounded his astral self. The white in his hair, his senses depleting. All wounds to represent all new experiences since his journey as the Black Swordsman began. To represent things are changed forever, no matter how much that you wish that they weren't. Shurike applies the talisman, remembering how her and Guts attached in the astral world, to help him win the battle against Daiba. And Shurike, as well as Farnese, feels uncomfortable with Guts' own admission of what Casca is to him. This is probably Shurike's first crush in her entire life, and she knows it would never amount to anything romantically, but she is happy that her and Guts shared something that is uniquely their own. It's painful for them, Farnese and Shurike, and we see this when Farnese tries to give Casca a bath. In Casca's regressed state, she is like a toddler, and it's frustrating for everyone taking care of her. I mean, you have an adult-sized little kid to constantly have to keep in check, 
and Farnese, Shurike, all of them, they all contribute and they all offer value and help fight and progress in Guts' mission, which is all for Casca, who can't do anything. And it's not Casca's fault, but the fact that they are all risking their lives, they are all progressing and they are all in this together, but there's this element that Guts values more than all of them. And none of them knew Casca back then. They don't know what she's like. They don't know what her and Guts went through. So it's painstaking that no matter what they do and how their affection grows, Guts will always value this person that can't do anything or even acknowledge what Guts does for her. As Farnese says it herself, it just isn't fair. Okay, so this next part is a little annoying, but also a little bit awesome. And it just showcases what I've been telling you guys. So three pirate ships on the ocean advance and start to sail up to Roderick's warship. This is the same annoying pirate from Vertanis that Isidro fought with. He is an annoying character then, and he's an annoying character now. And I regret to inform you, but he gets even worse as the story goes on. But for now, he thinks it might be a good idea to commandeer this ship and make some cash from it. Well, this pirate fucker didn't realize that this is the seahorse, Roderick, the motherfucking boss. Roderick don't give a fuck. We see that not only is he brave, willing to combat evil creatures, respectful of his new friends, actually in love with Farnese, but he has also actually earned his reputation by being a master of the high seas and an amazing ship captain. He is so confident as he commands his crew and sails around the pirates like it was nothing, evading cannon fire and even causing their own ships to crash into one another. He gets his warship around them and upwind before returning cannon fire and blasting them into pieces. The pirates are forced to withdraw, remembering the legendary ship captain, Roderick. Below the deck, Guts lays exhausted with a fever and seemingly having some bad dreams. Dreams involving his own inner beast of darkness, and the symbolism of chains holding it back, meaning that Guts has actively been trying to hold back his inner rage and darkness. Those voices in the back of his head that once told him to just kill Casca and stop worrying about this whole thing. That voice that just wants to kill. That only cares about revenge. Guts hasn't beaten it but has kept it restrained. But with all anger, frustration, and uncertainty, our beasts grow stronger. The beast preys on Guts' biggest fears, that his new crew, as they get closer to him, will also get closer to their own death, that being with him will cause their death, and that the beast of darkness wishes for this to happen, so it can be let loose. Get rid of all human attachment and run rampant with rage until you die. This is the goal of the beast. To be embraced and to be the only thing embraced, the beast mockingly tells Guts that he will obey him for now, that he will stay restrained until the moment is right, until Guts loses everything once again and the beast can finally be set free. Up on the top of the ship, the crew celebrates their victory over the pirates. It's cool to see even Serpico joining in on the celebrations. Off to the side, Roderick speaks with Magnifico. Oh yeah, he's still here. You know, Farnese's douchey brother. Well, knowing that they're going to an island where supposed elves lives, he wants to conquer it. Roderick just brushes him off and tells him to go ask Puck about it. To which Magnifico shrinks in his awkward fear and says that he'll make Puck king of the elves if he lets him take over the island. And nobody takes Magnifico seriously, not even Puck. Roderick then makes his way up to speak with Farnese. He gives her his jacket like a goddamn gentleman, and then Farnese tells him how she was floating above the ship practicing magic and how she dealt with the feelings of her uselessness. Roderick senses her crush on Guts, but gives her praise anyway, and even notes that she seems to be best at taking care of Casca. And if Casca is the most important thing to Guts, then that's a lot of faith and trust that he puts in Farnese. And of course, this is true. And it's the kind of benefit Roderick has of being an outsider. He sees the roles of the group way better than they themselves can. But then we get this image of Guts sitting on a ledge, staring out into the starry sky above the ocean. Not before showing images of his entire new group. Casca, Serpico, Isidro, Farnese, Shurike. All of these people that are at the mercy of his mission. That are closer to death by being closer to him. After everything that's happened before, Guts knows more than anyone what could happen to them in the end. 
And if that did happen, what becomes of Guts? He's already lost so much of what makes him human. And so he sits here knowing that things can never go back to the way that they were, knowing that all of his friends may die on his journey, and knowing that he himself may not fully be able to hold on and stay grounded when it matters. The future is wide open for him here, and this brief moment of peace can't even be truly appreciated. Not to mention Guts has no idea what is currently becoming of Griffith back on the mainland. He just hopes that his mission will amount to something after all of this. We cut back to the Kingdom of Midland, which at this point has been completely turned into a broken, decayed city of death and demons. The soon-to-be battleground of the final duel between Griffith and Ganishka. Though hope emerges as the remaining survivors hear whispers of the Hawk of Light and their victory over the Kushans and Britannus. None other than our favorite minor character, Lord Laban, informs the people that the Band of the Hawk truly is fighting for their liberation and that they have the missing Princess Charlotte safe and sound in their care. Hearing this news, even the former Minister Foss, who was once conspiring against Griffith, admits that he knew that Griffith could not be destroyed, that he would one day return to the kingdom and to all of the people who admired him. And it's this hope and admiration which, in my own personal headcanon, I believe fuels Griffith's power. As in, the next moment we are let known that the people have had another collective dream involving the Hawk of Light, that they would need to clear the city when the fog dissipates. And as a black shadow will loom over the city, the Hawk of Light will slice through it. It will be a true dawn of a new age. Just like before, humanity as a collection was able to have a similar dream due to the world of idea. A sense that we are all connected, we are all part of one whole. Getting abstract and maybe away from Berserk a little bit, but it's an idea to me that we are not in the universe, but we are are the universe. Everything works together in unison, and so as a concept that there is a collective innate desire in all of us isn't too far-fetched. A desire that caused into creation a godlike being to manipulate fate itself to give us the answers that we seek. We wanted a god, so we're going to get one. Just so happens the means of which and what he plans to do afterwards are far a bit darker than we anticipated. But then again, the very reason its dark intent shines through is only a reflection of what humanity is as a whole. We want peace and salvation, but humans often seek these things through violence and chaos. But anyway, besides getting slightly off track, the idea world is performing, let's just call it an inception on the human race, implanting an idea, a vision, of this hawk of light, laying the groundwork for fate yet to come. So that when it does come, it seems normal and natural, but even beyond that, it feels holy, divine, like Christ himself leading an army to save you from your oppression. The pontiff as well, the closest to God's divinity on earth as far as humans are concerned, that is, is convinced and has convinced those important enough that Griffith is the actual hawk of light talked about in the revelations and he believes that it is his destiny to marry griffith to charlotte and declare griffith as king a small conversation between mule and locust deals with the idea of politics of mankind and as in what nation midland shooter or wherever would want to claim that they aided the most amount of soldiers to griffith's cause and yada yada but locust assures that all that kind of talk all that division of mankind will soon be at an end, that there will be a new world after this battle. And I suppose on a surface level, this is a good thing. Think of all the barriers and boundaries people put up between our own species just because they were born somewhere else. So, disgusted and ashamed of his defeat in Vertanis, Ganishka is desperate for more power. Sure, this makes sense from a character standpoint, but it's still not too much of a difference from what Ganishka has always wanted since his introduction. He's just now a lot more distraught about wanting the power since being face to face with a god hand. The very likes of which brought him to his knees and he was unable to respond in any other way. A power class system enforced by sheer inherent understanding of one's place in it. Ganishka as an apostle does not stand a chance against a god hand. This is also why I think it's so dumb that people think Guts will use a bailet and become an apostle to fight Griffith. 
Yeah. Not only does that go against his character completely, since Guts values his humanity, but also if Ganishka, the most powerful apostle we've seen, can't do shit against Griffith as an apostle, then it's unlikely anyone else would either. But anyway, Ganishka has this apostle centipede thing that I like to call the DACA machine. Quick recap, it's dozens upon dozens of sewn up apostles filled with amniotic fluid, and once submerged, what's inside the fluid will become corrupted and distorted by the concentrated evil energy that that collection of apostles produces. This is how they create the DACA. Pregnant women are submerged and the fetus is corrupted by the demonic energy and then turned into a monster. Hell, it's not all that different from what Griffith Seaman did to Guts and Casca's baby. Remember when it looked like this? Ah, uh, yes, demonic corruption. And it might be gross to think about, but, um, you know, cum is the essence of life. So even though it was done in a horrifying way, from a narrative perspective, it actually makes a lot of sense in how the demon child became the astral entity that it was. As well, with using similar body fluid methods in the DACA machine, how it could perform a similar effect. Ganishka is thinking that if he places himself into the DACA machine, that he will undergo a similar experience. Take someone who has already been corrupted by demonic energy, and then do it again. Only the process of becoming an apostle, if it's anything like what we witnessed with Griffith turning into Femto, you essentially absorb or inherit the life force energy of what you sacrifice combined with embracing your own decision and desire. If the DACA machine, or the man-made Baylet here, works in a similar fashion, there would indeed need to be a sacrifice. But what happens is all of the mist that Kanishka creates as part of his already incredible power, whoever that mist was touching begins to be absorbed and sucked into the man-made Baylet. Also look at this image here. This is just... This is just great. Daiba is here watching all of this go down and admits that something like this, a reincarnated being forced itself to be reincarnated again, is a perversion. It's unnatural and will result in devastating consequences. Ganishka is indeed sinking into the astral world and creating a new form at the expense of sacrifices just as one would if they became an apostle. But forcing yourself through this process a means that is not natural, not an actual bailet, not having a viewing with the god hand, and just simply gaining power from your own will, this is a bit different. But then again, how much of one's own will matters when causality is at play. And just like that, Ganishka's fog is gone, brewing somewhere else. The fog dissipates just like the collective dream that predicted the unnatural use of that astral power. So, despite it being power given due to a man-made construction, it was still planned ahead of time by the powers beyond man's very understanding to continue this plan of fate that the God Hand has, or whatever is above the God Hand. But on the lowly level of humans, the fog being gone is a chance for them to do some good. Laban leads the charge, rushing to rescue the remaining Midland people, noticing the crazy reality that he is acting within what the dream told him, and he can't believe that it's actually true, or perhaps that a man like him is actually an integral part of it all, and I appreciate that about him. He finds the empty armor and clothing of the Kushans that were pulled into the man-made Baylet, and when he gets to a dungeon cell holding the Midland women, most likely that were going to be used to create more Daka, they remove their clothing to tie a barrier from the mist, just as the dreams told them to do. And Laban uses that smart old noggin of his and decides to dress himself, his crew, and all the women up in discarded Kushan clothing and armor to be able to safely lead them out of the city incognito style. You know what? Lord Laban is a motherfucking hero. When they get to the gates of the city, they have a little bit of difficulty with the Kushan guards. I suppose Ganishka's mist didn't reach this far out, which is why these guards were safe. But anyway, another Kushan walks up on a horseback and aids Laban and his others in getting through the gate. He says that his name is, and I know I'm going to butcher this, someone's going to correct me, Jareth or Yarif. I don't know how to pronounce it, but he's working undercover for the Band of the Hawk. It harkens back to when we were shown a campsite of the Band of the Hawk and how captive Kushan soldiers were given the opportunity to join them and even move up in rank if they showed their loyalty. This is a result of such conduct. Unlike the Kushan who, when capturing enemies, use them as like a human shield or force them into battle out of sheer fear, 
Griffith and the Hawks respected them as new members, and they were even given the same benefit as everyone else, a military strategy which just shows how useful it can be when put into a situation like this. He proves to be even more useful when outside the city they run into Salat and his Bakiraka, not just the bodybuilders this time, but others with more of a sleek and lean physique like Salat himself. Jareth speaks with them knowing the full history of the Bakaraka, and how they were captured war slaves and survived relying on their pure strength and skills. Noting that they even worked for the King of Midland once before, which Foss scoffs at, which is funny since that part was actually true. Jareth suggests that Salah and the Bakiraka join Griffith's cause as well, explaining that this war is not about gaining power or territory, it's about creating a new world the likes of humanity has never seen. A question that is it worth supporting a tyrant in order to be accepted as proper Kushan once again? Salat knowing better than anyone, having seen the truth of what Ganishka was, being there in the shadows during the confrontation with Griffith and Vertanis, and being shown the Daka machine by Raxus. All this adds up to Salat's decision to sit back and wait. To watch the war from afar, not picking a side, but to see if this new world actually comes true. And so Salat lets them pass. And on their travels, Laban's rescued group meets up with the band The Hawk and all of the nations who join to aid their cause. And we get the most epic bro fist ever from the reunited nobles of Midland. Dylan! You son of a bitch. Laban and Owen, the true heroes of Berserk. The real main characters. The manliest men one could ever aspire to be like. They look up and see Griffith appearing on the hilltop and all bask in his messianic light that he gives off. Even Foss falls to his knees in subservience. Back in Midland, Daiba, sole survivor of the absorbing mist, runs as the entire building in which the man-made Baelit resided in comes crumbling down. Ganishka has returned from the astral world into the physical and is exploding at the seams. We see a mass of what is now Ganishka growing larger and larger, his face multiplied all over the entity's body, and him only stating, I obtained it. Daiba exclaims that Ganishka has brought hell back with him. No, that he has become hell itself. And he's not far off with that explanation. While in the deepest bowels of the astral world, which we know as the Abyss, the place that houses the Vortex of Souls, which is kind of the berserk equivalent of Hell itself. Ganishka pulled in as much of that power as he possibly could. Him being back here in the physical, he has essentially brought a piece of Hell with him. Now Ganishka continues growing, creating an earthquake beneath his form, destroying buildings as he grows. The remaining Kushan soldiers look up in awe as this thing grows massively before them. From far in the distance, the Band of the Hawk and all of the humans that are with them see it. Most of them never knowing of the world beyond man, of the truth of anything in the Astral World, not knowing that Griffith is a god hand or what a god hand even is, not even knowing that most of the Band of the Hawk are apostles. Real live humans basing their context for life in the rules and world of man now see the most powerful and gigantic monster to ever exist in the physical world. Ganishka has become a motherfucking kaiju, Cthulhu-like monster, towering over the entire city of Midland, making the buildings and castles look like Lego bricks beneath his feet. We flash to Guts' group real quick. Things seem peaceful on this voyage. Azan trades with Isidro some more. Serpico stands on the crow's nest, bringing a nice breeze, which is attracted to the sylphs on his wind cloak. Shurike continues to train Farnese to use her luminous body. And Puck is fishing with some cheese. Hey, it's the most we've seen Puck do in a while. But I bet when we make it to Puck's homeland, the Elf Island, he'll get a lot of great new character development. Right? R right? Ugh. At this point, Laban and Owen are more important and impactful characters to the story than Puck is. Anyway, Puck grabs the bailet that Guts carries with him, the one that he has named Bechi, and notices it's twitching and the face is assembling in a nearly correct alignment, which we all know is not a good thing. And this same thing happened to the bailet once before, when Guts was in Clipoth right before Slan emerged. It's a sign that something big is going down, and even Shurike senses it. She feels that the world is about to be torn apart.
These next images showing Ganeshka's new form are absolutely incredible. That the world of mankind would go from 0 to 100 in seeing the monstrosities that the Astro World has to offer. Ganeshka now looks like a giant pillar with dozens of tentacle-like arms flailing in all directions. His head is in the clouds, and ironically, you could take that literally and metaphorically, as Ganeshka looks down to his feet, his people, the Kushan, are about the size of ants, and Ganeshka himself can barely comprehend what has happened to him. He is a form so abstract and away from reason and ego that his ego has all but disappeared. He is confused and unsure of where he is, what he is, and who he is. He sees the people looking like ants and begins to move one of his legs, having to actually think to himself, this is a foot, this is my foot, I will move it, crush. And he steps on dozens of his men with one stomp. The others scatter like bugs, terrified of being next. Where his foot lands, the dozens of Kushans explode into red mush, and from Ganishka's vantage point, it looks like a red flower blooming. He wants to see more flowers bloom, and with each step, he creates more. Again, confused and uncertain about what has even happened to him, his desire becomes simplicity itself. Crush them. Crush them all. He doesn't know Kushan from anyone or anything else. All this is viewed from a distance. Salat and the Bakiraka call this form of Ganeshka Shiva. In Hinduism, Shiva is part of a sort of trinity, as most religions have, Christianity included. As well, Berserk has the physical, astral, and idea worlds. Divine things often come in threes. Here, it is three deities that are worshipped as one, deities that have a cosmic function of creation, maintenance, and destruction. Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Shiva is the destroyer. I kind of like this random kid just shouting, yay, a monster. As someone who grew up watching Godzilla and other kaiju films, that's kind of how I feel watching this scene too. The pontiff then steps forward to calm everybody down, assuring them that it's okay, that this is the moment that the prophecies talked about. Once again, reinstating that ultimate faith in Griffith, a unified belief in him, which I believe adds to his power. The pontiff lets them all know that a miracle is about to happen, that the Hawk of Light will lead them into a victory and into a new world. Welcome back everyone. This is going to be the final Millennium Empire arc video in my analysis series, and as promised, I'm going to be covering the entirety of Volume 34 in this episode, and I'm going to be as detailed and in-depth as I possibly can be. I want to thank you all for joining me on this journey and supporting these videos. It really means a lot to me that you would take the time to check these out and my opinions and theories on this wonderful series. If this is the first video of mine that you've seen, feel free to check out the others as well if you enjoyed this one. I'm going to reiterate something I haven't in a while, that this entire series is meant to be my interpretation and understanding of the series. I'm not basing this on any other than my own analysis. To me, the beauty of art is how we can all find our own meanings and interpretations of it, and it doesn't have to just mean one thing. I'm not claiming to have absolute knowledge of the series, nor am I claiming to fully understand everything that goes on inside the mind of Kentaro Miura. I'm just like you, the sword again. His entire life as he knew it was gone. His reputation was tarnished. His dreams of obtaining his kingdom obliterated. Upon activating the bailiff, he was given a choice that in reality wasn't a choice at all. Continue living as a crippled, mangled, broken, depressed shell of who you once were, or sacrifice your mercenary band for godlike power and the continued achievement of getting your own kingdom. And not only would he rule over the physical, he will have divine prowess and rule the merged astral and physical worlds. Top that with the idea that Griffith, just as a man, had already sacrificed so much in the pursuit of his dream, that if he stopped now, then all the deaths of his men that have already died will have meant nothing in the grand scheme of things. Griffith becoming a king is the only way, in his mind, that he could bring any sort of meaning to their deaths, especially that of a young boy who died for him, one of the few deaths that truly affected him on the battlefield. As you see, this is a choice, but is it really? Is the destiny of mankind 
controlled by some transcendental entity or law. How perfect is it that this is where Griffith was at the time and the headspace that he was in when he had to make this choice? Griffith had no control even over his own will. Upon relinquishing his humanity and becoming the god hand Femto, Griffith enacted horrifying revenge against Guts for distracting him from his ambition and causing his downfall. Even though it was Griffith's fault for acting out, he refused to take the personal responsibility for it. And now he has ascended, or descended, depending on how you want to look at it, to a place where he never could take responsibility. The fact that Griffith acted out and raped Casca as his first act of a god hand, some say shows that Griffith still has humanity. But I would like to amend that a little bit by saying it's not that he still had his humanity, it's that he embraced the darkest side of himself. If Griffith had a Beast of Darkness, a representation of all our negativity and dark thoughts, Femto brought that to the surface upon his transformation. Griffith the man is gone. All that's left is an idea of Griffith. The idea to rule, the idea to be a king, and all of the spiteful, negative, egotistical narcissism that was amplified by the God Hand transformation. I often say that Griffith didn't see the Band of the Hawk as individuals like Guts did. He saw them as an extension of himself. He believed that they all wanted exactly what he wanted. He didn't take the time to realize they all had their own dreams and ambitions too. When Griffith arrives on the Hill of Swords, he mentions that it's like the Band of the Hawk reuniting for his goal. And he's not trying to be disrespectful in his remark here. He has a disconnect with what it means that these men died in such a horrific, tragic way. He doesn't comprehend them as individuals like Guts did. And Griffith came to see if there is any attachment left to Guts in the way that he felt before, putting him above his dream. And no, as Griffith states, he is free. That part of him is gone. Griffith doesn't kill Guts here because there is no reason to. He doesn't see Guts as a friend or as a threat. Guts desperately tries to regain any semblance of his own sanity. But the process to access this power broke his mind, his own ego. The fragile things that they are do not hold up when in the presence of or becoming something so awe-inspiring. Ganishka can't tell the soldiers beneath his feet or Daiba flying at his side. All he can see is the shining light in the distance, and instinctively, he goes towards it, being drawn subconsciously to Griffith, just as Griffith is drawn to him. This is the destined day that the world will change and the Millennium Empire will rise. Basically, despite his size and power, Griffith and the Hawks are thinking this about Ganishka. Then we have a rising from the muck that is dozens of squished soldiers from Ganishka's steps. Mont's course, motherfucking Zod! <laughs> ...needs to come from a full-fledged human. Sonia telling them that it doesn't matter, human or demon, and then actually charging into the fray herself is an inspiring sight that will serve as such. She, of course, is not a fighter, and this was foolish, but she is quickly swooped up and saved by Irvine. The two of them shared a moment by the campfire once, and you could look at this in two ways. One is that Irvine cares about her enough that he would put himself in danger to save her, but how much danger is he really in anyway? And two, it serves to inspire mankind as he, a demon, saves her in front of everyone, showing that they are here not just to fight, but to protect. It works as the humans rally behind the apostles now, and Griffith gives his speech on how they all need to work together. Human and demon soldiers side by side. And just as he gave brilliant strategy commands in the Golden Age battles, he does so again here, and the humans embrace this madness, working together to fight a problem that only came about due to the same means that they're fighting with. A deeper strategy of fate would be create a problem that only you can solve. But what is really happening here? War, chaos, violence, evil, the idea of evil. An idea created by the inherent overwhelming nature of humanity to get humans to accept evil in the name of good. What else could be the perfect plan for an idea of evil? To believe you are doing good when you are actually causing harm. What else was someone like Mazgus? 
Daiba, Ganeshka's once loyal magic user, sees this unity of humans and apostles as a terrifying development. Violence and evil embraced being disguised as unity and heroism. Even the pontiff of the Holy See, a man who was on death's door not too long ago as he was questioning his entire life and his faith. The Holy See that actively fought against any outside-of-the-box ideas or philosophies, keeping people through fear and faith in line with its own wishes. A religion most likely put in place by fate to push humanity away from the spiritual and to blind them of the unity of the universe. The pontiff here recognizes that what he sees goes against that of the religion's teaching. The fear of the unknown separates and segregates people, fear of disobeying what was written. But here, witnessing the chaos, the violence, the evil, again, create a problem that only you can solve. Create the Holy See. Have it envelop mankind for hundreds of years so that seeing an event like this will be so mind-blowing it will abolish the religion itself. Now there is no need for the Holy See. True divinity is before their eyes, so we will blind them from the elemental kings, the strength and the magic of the earth, of witches and magic and elves and everything positive. The Holy See took everything good and bad about the supernatural only to reintroduce humanity to only the bad. This is it, people. This is the truth of the world. It's apostles, right? All this madness is now the context for humanity and the supernatural. It's goodbye hope and hello chaos. The chapter called The Flight has literally no dialogue. We are just presented with brilliant imagery. We witness the battle and Griffith using his favorite vehicle, Nosferatu Zod, to fly himself to the very top of Ganishka's gigantic kaiju form. Also, Raxus is hitching a ride, perhaps without Griffith or Zod's knowledge. Raxus is an apostle, but a former Kushan himself, and said that he might turn on Griffith at some point. So perhaps he's just biding his time, or wants a front row seat for this historic moment. And what does Ganishka think about this mosquito landing on him? Oh, Ganishka. A little backstory for you comes just a little too late. I know I upset some people when I said I don't care for Ganishka as a character, as he is just a big evil guy that makes evil speeches and wants to do evil things. That's his whole character. As I said, I recognize his place in the story, and I think he's important for that reason, but I guess let me dive a little deeper into this backstory. Ganishka somehow recounts his childhood here. An heir to the throne poisoned as a child, yet survived. He killed his own brother as to be the next proper heir, avoided other assassination attempts, and had his father trampled to death. His entire life, despite coming from privilege, was battle and war, and he embraced himself in that energy, so much that even after having his own son, he neglected him. He was fearful of that positive energy. He didn't allow himself to feel love, believing that being cold and distant was what it took to be a great emperor. He completely embraced his own beast of darkness. But by doing this, he perpetuated that evil energy and was on course to suffer the same fate being poisoned by his own son who also wanted the throne. He could have broken the cycle, but instead the abused became the abuser, which is very common in life. It's much easier to hate than to love and much easier to destroy than to build. And so as he was dying from the betrayal, he grabbed a hold of his bailet and in despair and desire, the god hand was summoned and the rest was history. There was no turning back for Ganishka, and he used the combination of his status as emperor and the incredible power of apostlehood to conquer as much as he could of the world. All of which led him to this moment. To that inherent fear of somebody taking his place, the same fear he had as a man, that one day there would be a royalty to tear him down and rule in his place. It has always been his fear, but now halfway out of his mind, his ego fried and Griffith about to make his move, instead of fear, this time Ganishka feels a sense of relief. His darkness being illuminated by the godlike figure before him. And this next page, motherfucking Perhaps the most deathly beautiful and iconic image in all of Berserk. Bask in this incredible artwork. 
The Skull Knight arrives, slicing a tear in reality due to his powered up sword of actuation to appear right behind Femto. The Skull Knight, the declared enemy of the God Hand, in his sword, which has the power to cut through layers of the Astral World and open a portal straight to the Abyss and send whoever is nearby into the Vortex of Souls. Essentially, into Hell. Skull Daddy slashes at Femto as Zod tries desperately to get there in time. But then, in that moment, Skull Knight realized he fucked up. Or, in the words of Makoto Shishio, You had the opportunity of a lifetime in your hands, and you blew it. The powers and abilities of the God Hand members are still kept mysterious to us, the readers. The extent of their powers seem to be limitless, as Femto is able to stop the strike of the sword in mid-air. He is literally grabbing on to an intangible tear in dimensions as if it were an object. With that, the absolute hopelessness arises as the weapon Skull Knight had forged that seemed to be the ultimate key in defeating the God Hand is rendered useless or at least useless if they know what it does and where it will strike, but then again, could you ever catch a god hand off guard? And if that could do nothing, what hope does a man like Guts have? If the entirety of fate is on Femto's side, then things are as bleak as they possibly could be. Femto knew Skull Knight would be here, he knew he would try to stop him, and he knew about the power of the sword and he knows what will happen if he uses a dimension-cutting strike onto Ganishka, who is filled to the brim with powerful astral energy. With that, Femto strikes Ganishka with the sword swipe. Ganishka then explodes open and unleashes all of that power that he had gathered within himself. This is known as the Great Roar or Blast of the Astral World, and it's just that. The Astral World itself explodes into the physical. From this point of actuation, it acts like a flood and pours into the physical world, essentially causing the astral and physical worlds to become one. As the blast of light flashes over the people, you see their astral selves or their souls. They feel the shock of it. And it doesn't just stop here at the kingdom. The blast of light continues over the entire goddamn planet. Everyone and everything feels it. A brief panel of Guts and company on the boat as they feel the incredible power being unleashed, and there's even a shot from space. Yes, in a dark fantasy manga, we see outer space and the moon. So what does this all mean? Well, as we know, the astral world contains many lairs harboring different kinds of things. There is the dark parts of the astral world amplified by people's fears that contain trolls and ogres and things like that that we saw earlier in this arc. And we saw that the astral world was already slowly merging into the physical on its own with the introduction of a god hand into this world. So with Ganishka's death at the hands of Skull Knight's sword, this sped up the process. Now the physical and astral are one, and every creature that exists in legends and in the minds of humanity are now unleashed upon the world. Not bit by bit, but all at once. The trolls, ogres, unicorns, hydras, harpies, and a motherfucking dragon! Honestly, we better see this dragon do something in the manga. I, I, I really hope this is not the only panel that we will ever see this dragon. But it's all here now. No longer fantasies, no longer just desires or fears. Now it's all made into reality. Femto has created a world of Fantasia, a name meaning imagination itself. So what would be the purpose of this? Well, a few things if you ask me. I think that by doing this, it means Femto can rule over both the physical and astral world simultaneously, but it also means that mankind is in an extremely vulnerable position given that all their nightmares are now made true. They will have even more of a reason to follow Femto as he can save them and protect them from all of this madness. Also, does this mean that the other God Hand members can now exist within this reality? Well, it's kind of complicated and not exactly stated. We get a splash page dedicated to each member of the God Hand, Slan in the center of an image of sexuality, Conrad again made up of rats and disease, and perhaps the strangest drawing in all of Berserk, a recreation of the painter Bosch's painting in Miura style. It's pretty much the same as the regular painting, but adds Ubik sitting in the side of the hollowed out dude. 
I don't know, it's part of a hellscape that depicts animals like creatures torturing humans and a bunch of other bizarre imagery, and I won't pretend that I understand it because I know nothing about Bosch the Painter. And the final splash page is just a brain to symbolize, you know, void. But before, the God Hand could only vaguely interact in the physical, mostly by influencing others through imagery like Slan did in Fire, and Conrad briefly manifesting himself as rats during the plague. So the God Hand being beings deep in the astral world, they would need some sort of physical, corporeal form in order to be here. This is why there was such a big deal about incarnating a God Hand on Earth during the Conviction Arc. And Femto used the infant body to become his vessel, his flesh and blood containing his spiritual Femto self. At least that's how I now stands an entirely new, gigantic city. It's almost as if it was resurrected from the dead. The former Minister Foss recognizes that it's like the legendary kingdom of Geyseric that was destroyed and buried over a thousand years ago. Geyseric was, of course, a legendary ruler who united everyone under one banner. And as history repeats itself, Griffith is doing the same here. Many theories point to Skull Knight being the former King Geyseric, Skull Knight who is now MIA after his colossal fuck-up, who was either taken over or destroyed, but whatever the case, time being a spiral continues. Things are the same, but a little bit different. This time we have a confirmed god hand to be the ruler of this kingdom, known as Falconia. Griffith returns to his human form and leads the way, letting everybody inside the new kingdom, his new Millennium Empire. And though the official title of king has yet to be bestowed, it is clear as day that Griffith has achieved his dream. That this arc leaves us with that fact and that vision being achieved. But I wonder, in what sense of satisfaction does Griffith truly have here? After giving up his humanity to become a god hand, is there an emotional attachment to this victory? Or is he simply going through the motions? It's an interesting thing. I have been covering this arc for almost a year. I do want to let you know that I will be taking a little bit of a break from this analysis series. One reason being I want to focus on making some other videos, and these take the most amount of time to make. As well, it's summer again, and I want to be spending a lot more time outside in the wilderness away from humans rather than sitting on my computer editing. The Fantasia arc of Berserk is still ongoing, so once I start the analysis series for that arc, it won't be long before I'm caught up with the entire manga, and then we have to wait for Miura to finish whatever he's working on. But again, I do want to say thank you. It really means a lot to me that you would watch and interact, and I hope I gave you a decent recount and breakdown of this arc of Berserk. Feel free to check out my other videos if you haven't. Please like and comment on this one. Maybe consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't. Check out the Patreon and Discord links down below. And other than that, guys, 